What Makes Your Brain Happy and Why You Should Do the Opposite by David DeSalvo Narrated by David DeSalvo Introduction, Hacking the Cognitive Compass What a peculiar privilege has this little agitation of the brain which we call thought. David Hume, Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion There is always an easy solution to every human problem, neat, plausible, and wrong. H.L. Mencken, The Divine Afflatus Our brains are prediction and pattern detection machines that desire stability, clarity, and consistency, which is terrific, except when it's not. You enter the office on your first day of work. Nervous energy tingles through every limb, and you are as alert as a deer sipping from an alligator pond. This is not your first first day of work. You've started other jobs before, and these sensations aren't entirely new to you. But still, this job is new, and you're nearly as anxious about it as you were before your very first job years ago. There is, however, a major difference, though it isn't explicitly clear to you as you stroll down the central hallway of the office suite for the first time. But step by step, as you start looking into the office as you pass and absorb the surroundings, something begins happening that triggers a nascent thought. I'm going to be fine. Why does this thought break through the electric jitter swarm and announce itself? What is changing as you make your way down the hall and begin ingesting the sights and sounds around you? While it's hardly obvious, your brain is doing some heavy lifting on your behalf. Everything you see, smell, touch, and hear is being processed, analyzed, and decoded. Your brain is doing what it has evolved to do, and it's doing it exceptionally well. So well, in fact, that you are starting to experience an emotional response that counteracts your nervous response. Your brain is determining that you have been here before. Not literally, of course, but your brain is structured to make sense of stimuli and patterns in any environment you step into and it's finding patterns in this new environment that overlay well with others you have experienced. Your brain is arriving at a determination that these patterns are familiar enough that you will be able to make reliable predictions about what is coming next in this environment. As you begin meeting people in the office, more stimuli are processed, more patterns are detected, more is added to the webs of information your brain creates about everything you experience. The more the day goes on, the more at ease you become about most things in this new environment. And those things that have put you on guard have been flagged as potentially dangerous and requiring elevated attention. During the course of one day, your brain has mapped out a new micro-world that you will inhabit for as long as you have this job. It will be added to and subtracted from, shifted, adjusted, and contorted. But all of these movements will occur within a framework derived from recurring patterns that your brain has identified, coded, and categorized. Years of neuroscience research have led to the current understanding of the brain as a prediction machine an amazingly complex organ that processes information to determine what's coming next. Specifically, the brain specializes in pattern detection and recognition, anticipation of threats, and narrative, storytelling. The brain lives on a preferred diet of stability, certainty, and consistency, and perceives unpredictability, uncertainty, and instability as threats to its survival, which is, in effect, our survival. The problem is that our brain's evolved capacity for avoiding and defending against these threats a capacity that has allowed our species to survive and thrive, has a slew of byproducts, all tightly woven into our day-to-day thinking and behavior. This audiobook will discuss several of them, each of which, ironically, trip and ensnare us while making our threat-anticipating brains happy. The pages ahead include explorations as to why. We crave certainty and the feeling of being right. We rely on memory to buttress that feeling. We're prone to assigning meaning to coincidence and making causal links with scant information. We want to feel in control. We try to avoid loss. We regulate our moral behavior to feel balanced. We attempt to circumnavigate regret. We generalize when specificity would be more beneficial. If we could live our lives without bias, distortions, and delusions involved, the world would be truly idyllic. But we can't, though we're largely ignorant of this fact. We function much of the time with an air of mystification about why we do what we do and why we think as we think, not because we are dull-witted. Much the opposite. Only a brain advanced enough to engage in complex thought and self-reflection is susceptible to the fuzzy mystification that obscures from view how our minds really work. Before we go much farther, though, let's take a couple steps back and discuss where we have been, cognitively speaking, and where we are going. Hacking the Misunderstandings of Mind For any analysis of mind to be useful, it must defer to what we know about how our brains function. Admittedly, this knowledge is limited but it has grown enormously in the last few decades, providing an understanding that few thought possible a century ago. If you had, for example, told an early 20th century neurologist that technology would develop in the next 100 years that allows paraplegics to control robotic arms with their minds, you'd probably get a sneer if not a snicker. Science fiction novels and comic books featured similar technology, 
but serious scientists wouldn't have staked their careers in such things being possible. We now know they are more than possible. They are happening. Likewise, we have learned enough about the brain to know that the mind-body dualism of old is an outmoded explanation. It's still tempting for many to yank the workings of mind from their biological moorings, chiefly because the complexity of thought seems too large an enigma for our brains to contain. As one biology professor at my alma mater put it, how can billions of on-off switches result in something as complex as the mind? Cognitive science has not exhaustively answered those sorts of questions. But in the course of diving into the brain's mysteries, it has discovered that the questions themselves were never really on target. The on-off switch analogy, for instance, is the result of a category error. By starting with the belief that the brain is essentially a fleshy and compact electrical device, albeit a complicated one, it's impossible to arrive at an explanation for mind that passes anyone's laugh test. Cognitive science challenges our categories by breaking down the mental silos we build to make sense of things. Consider the temptation to pinpoint thoughts and emotions in well-defined parts of the brain. It's neater to believe that anger, for instance, launches from one central place than to accept that it doesn't live in any single place in the brain, but is rather the result of multiple brain regions cross-activating in less than tidy ways. This is an especially hard realization to accept when it comes to memory. Where does the memory of riding a roller coaster at Six Flags when you were 10 years old reside? Because our recollection of the event seems more or less complete, we want to believe that it must exist that way on a bookshelf in our heads. When we want to revisit the memory, we pull the book from the shelf and turn to the right page. We now know that memory doesn't work that way. And, in fact, your memory of the hairpin curve and the corkscrew loop doesn't really reside in any single place in your brain, nor is it in any way complete. These understandings are all quite messy, and the science underlying them doesn't satisfy our hunger for airtight answers. We jump back into categories to fill the voids because not having answers is unnerving, and so it should be. Since the very organ that defies explanation evolved to make sense of our environment, it's perfectly understandable that we become frustrated by the brain's silence about its own inner workings. And yet, the reality is that you and I can carry on this discussion precisely because the amazing organ in our heads yields this thing we've come to call mind. Or we could more accurately say that mind is not something produced by the brain, but that which the brain does. Said still another way, the brain's activity, and indeed the activity of our nervous system in total, is our mind. To quote neuroscientist Simon LeVay, the mind is just the brain doing its job. For the better part of a century, we have steadily moved away from the idea that the body, including the brain, and mind are separate entities, a belief popularized by what the 17th century French philosopher René Descartes labeled the mind-body problem, or dualism. Where dualism went wrong, to paraphrase the contemporary philosopher John Searle, was to start counting in the first place. But the reason for the counting, the bifurcating of brain and mind, is easy enough to see. For as long as humans have been able to think about it, we haven't liked the alternatives. If mind is what the brain does, then it can be reduced to biological processes. And no matter how complex these processes are, they are still the workings of flesh, blood, cellulose, and sinew. How can we, the magnificent, above-common-nature creatures we believe ourselves to be, be tethered so crudely to nothing more than what some neuroscientists call wetware, the biological corollary to computer hardware? That's the challenge to our self-understanding that cognitive science research presents us with, and it will only become stouter as more revelations about how the brain works come to light. Hacking for better answers. With dualism behind us, what's in front of us? The comfort of locating the mind apart from the wetware we carry around in our skulls is gone, so what exactly should replace it? The answer is central to the argument I'll be making throughout this book. We have entered a period of self-understanding only vaguely imaginable before the new wave of neuroscience and cognitive psychology research opened the door and began pushing us through. We are only at the beginning of this period, and caution is warranted about drawing hasty conclusions from a body of research still in its infancy. But we are definitely on a new path to self-understanding, and there is no returning to the backwater refuge of dualism. In this new period, when we speak of mind, we are speaking of what our brain does. When we speak of thought, we are speaking of the currency of mind, the very stuff of the brain's relentless activity. The dualistic division, figment though it was, has collapsed, and with it died a thousand misconceptions of mind. What this all points to is a fantastic opportunity, an opportunity to credibly figure out why we do what we do, and just as important, decipher how we can alter thought and behavior inconsistent with our best interests. If that statement strikes you as having an air of self-helpness about it, let me correct the perception in advance. I believe that the new wave of cognitive research actually undercuts a great deal of self-help advice and will continue to do so in the years ahead by showing just how vacuous, groundless, and fraudulent much of that advice really is. 
The fog of misunderstandings about the brain and mind has allowed self-help snake oil to flow with impunity for decades, fueled by billions of dollars from well-intentioned consumers looking for answers. Cognitive science cannot provide a complement of concrete answers to replace those of the self-help industry, nor should the disciplines within psychology attempt to do so. What neuroscience and psychology can do, however, is make us smarter evaluators of our thought and behavior by shedding much-needed light on difficult questions. By using sound research as a basis for rethinking our behavior, we will be on steadier ground than much of what the self-help industry could provide. We do not need more self-help. We need more science help. Hacking with hunches. I am a pragmatist. I have a penchant for what works and tend to critically scrutinize assertions that lean on a hunch. But I also understand and appreciate that sometimes a hunch is all we have. And though it's not the complete answer, it might eventually guide us to one. Research does not operate outside the world of hunches. The best researchers I have met are world-class hunch makers who sometimes craft the most creative and compelling research approaches from a hunch they had while eating breakfast. From a mere hunch, they sometimes arrive at a new understanding that a volume of previous research on the same topic somehow missed. My tour of such research leading up to this audiobook has demonstrated to me that, at times, it pays to have faith in hunches. Along with that faith, however, it doubly pays to check one's naivete more often than one might think necessary. Part of what animates the self-help juggernaut, and more recently the burgeoning industry built on hasty conclusions about neuroscience research, is a naive approach to solving problems. We want answers. We want to listen to people who claim to have answers. We want problems solved and settled so that we can feel good about the resolution. It hurts to realize that more often than not, we can't have what we want, or at least not as we envision it. But naivete is a formidable force with the power to trump healthy skepticism about what we are being told is the answer. If we are not careful, a sincere desire to figure things out can lead to a naive acceptance of well-heeled nonsense. As an example, we must be extremely careful about drawing ironclad conclusions from brain imaging studies. The neuroscience community is far from united about what the activation of various brain regions means in all cases. A deep well of issues must still be addressed before the images can speak to us with clear answers. For instance, why, from one study to the next, do different regions activate under the same testing conditions? That the brain is such an effective foil of study replication is a true problem for researchers, and so far no one has arrived at a foolproof way to solve it. Some have gone so far as to argue that we should use brain imaging in the courtroom as proof of guilt or innocence a truly frightening prospect for a technology that is far from perfect. Many other issues could be mentioned, but suffice it to say that the business of science is not to provide us with settled answers that we can comfortably rest our heads upon at night. Indeed, we are wise to expect more new questions than answers from any research campaign worth discussing. Having said that, the very process of scientific investigation, one study building on the next with confirmation or challenge, is hope-inspiring. What differentiates scientific assertions from the droves of poorly grounded self-help and pseudoscience assertions is this process. It demands far more of its executors because the process is, in a sense, bent on self-destruction. It doesn't trumpet the perfection of its outcomes. It calls out for challenges that could very well undermine the outcomes and start the process anew. That, in short, is where this book begins. Science is a tool, but is the best tool we have to address hard issues about ourselves and our world and I believe it is also the finest tool available to understand what is catalyzing our thoughts and motivating our behavior. If we are to credibly claim knowledge of why we think as we think and do as we do, then we must engage these questions at their core and accept the limitations inherent in this process of discovery. Hacking ahead. A few upfront disclosures are in order. First, throughout this audiobook, I will use an intentionally oversimplified metaphor of a happy brain. Brains, of course, cannot, strictly speaking, be happy or sad or angry, nor can they want, desire, claim, or commit. In the words of New York City-based clinical psychologist and psychoanalyst Todd Essig, brains don't want any more than lungs sing or knees set long jump records. Brains are part of what makes people want and how we want. There is always a situated, contextualized, and culturated person between the brain and wanting. What I wish to communicate with the metaphor of a happy brain is simply that under various conditions, our brains will tend toward a default position that places greatest value on avoiding loss, lessening risk, and averting harm. Our brains have evolved to do exactly that, and much of the time we can be thankful they did. However, these same protective tendencies, what I am calling the tendencies of a happy brain, can go too far and become obstacles instead of virtues. Our challenge is to know when to think and act contrary to our brain's native leanings. Second. This is not an audiobook about psychological pathologies. I am not a psychologist or psychiatrist and have no interest in playing virtual therapist via an audiobook or any other medium. 
I am also not a neuroscientist and would not claim to possess a grasp of neural dynamics that only a full investment in the discipline can provide. I am a science writer, especially interested in how our brains work, and I am driven by a passion to communicate what I learn to a broader audience. I am also a public education specialist who has spent years devising and implementing strategies to boost awareness and catalyze behavioral change among particular target audiences, some narrow, some massive. I am closely familiar with the gap between knowing and applying. Most of us can grasp the substance of a problem and even be provided with a means for overcoming it, yet we often still fail. It is this gap between awareness and action that set me on a path to write this book. I wanted to know why humans so often do things not in our best interest. More specifically, I wanted to understand what attributes of our brains underlie the self-undermining thoughts and actions that plague every person born on this planet. When I started this trek more than three years ago, I expected to focus mainly on cognitive bias the well-documented throng of mental errors that so often cause us to stumble. But after working through reams of research studies and discussions with experts in the fields of cognitive psychology and neuroscience, I discovered an even more essential piece to the cognitive puzzle, and it has everything to do with what makes our brains happy. My investigation also led to a further conclusion. Simply knowing how our brains flop is not very useful. Most books about brain errors never get beyond this point. But what good is knowing if we fall short of doing anything about it? We may know that we should take action to avoid temptation, for example, but applying that knowledge is a different matter entirely, and that too is part of our neural reality. This is the gap between awareness and action, and as a practical matter, it's just as crucial as figuring out what makes our brains tick. Finally, what you will find in the following chapters is a broad survey of topics. I have intentionally not dropped too low into the weeds with technical minutia, but rather have focused on what I believe are the larger issues relevant to the discussion. My goal is for this audiobook to be informative, but also useful. I hope you will find it to be both as we continue our discussion. Part 1. Certainty and the Seduction of Chance Chapter 1. Adventures in Certainty Doubt is not an agreeable condition, but certainty is an absurd one. Voltaire, from a letter to Frederick II of Prussia Mindful of Sharks On October 9, 1997, observers from the Point Reyes Bird Observatory witnessed a killer whale clashing with a great white shark near Farallon Island, 26 miles off the coast of San Francisco. The sight made for salacious nature news. Speculation about what would happen if these apex predators met has always piqued curiosity. But until that day, no one really knew for sure. Someone on the ship caught the confrontation on video, which later made its way onto the Internet and became an instant draw for millions of eyeballs worldwide. Turns out, it wasn't much of a fight. The orca had little trouble dispatching her menacing opponent, and then proceeded to dine on its liver, leaving the carcass for seagulls to pick clean. This outcome may have disappointed many who expected a bloody, jaw-to-jaw battle between these titans of the deep, but it tickled the fancy of academics to the point of giddiness. The reason for their interest had to do with why the two clashed in the first place, and exactly how the orca defeated the shark. Ordinarily, apex predators are happy to avoid each other for the simple reason that fighting a beast in your weight and ferocity class will probably result in injury. Injury means impaired ability to hunt, and that means game over. Knowing this, scientists were eager to know why two of the most successful predators on the planet would risk confrontation in the open seas. The answer shocked everyone. This was no chance street brawl. The orca was actually hunting the shark. To understand why, we have to take a step back to examine how killer whales learn their namesake trade. Like humans, orcas have culture. But unlike most human cultures, orca cultures revolve around one thing, hunting behavior. Some orcas hunt herring, others seal, others stingrays, and others sharks. The observers on the ship had witnessed an orca conducting the business of its shark hunting culture. The next discovery was how the orca so handily defeated the shark. In every orca culture, a hunting technique is learned through demonstration and imitation. That's a big part of what makes orcas such efficient predators. They learn the best tried-and-true hunting techniques from each other. When one orca tries a killing method that works well, others take notice and copy it. Scientists speculate that at some point, an orca discovered that if it rammed a shark hard enough from the side, the shark would flip over and become motionless, unable to defend itself and inflict injury. In effect, that pioneering orca induced tonic immobility in its adversary, a temporary state of paralysis many species of sharks fall into when turned on their backs. The human discovery of tonic immobility in sharks is relatively recent, making the orca's behavior all the more remarkable. This deadly shark hunting technique, capable of rendering a great white shark powerless, is the orca equivalent of a human meme, a unit of cultural ideas and practices transmitted from one mind to another. 
Susan Blackmore, author of The Meme Machine, puts a finer point on it by defining a meme simply as that which is imitated. The biological corollary to a meme is, of course, a gene, a unit of heredity transmitted from one organism to its offspring. Killer whales are, as a matter of heredity, powerful hunters, but we now know that their cultures strongly influence how they use their native abilities. An orca from a herring hunting culture is not likely to tackle a great white shark, just as an orca from a whale hunting culture would have no reason to start hunting stingrays. The key point is that orca cultures pass along memes that benefit their members via learning and perfecting crucial skills necessary for survival. The orca brain is advanced enough to make this meme transfer effective beyond what any other creature in the ocean is capable of achieving. In other words, just about anything might end up on the menu. The human brain, in contrast, is the undisputed learning master on the planet. Our cultures are infinitely more complex than orca cultures because the sheer volume and depth of memes we exchange is orders of magnitude greater. The flip side of this reality is that our big brains, advanced as they are, come with an array of complex shortcomings and are also expert at transmitting these shortcomings. One of the most perilous gene meme double whammies that humans possess is the notion of certainty. Our natures and our learned biases lead us to believe that we are right, whether or not we really are. This is the orca equivalent of learning the wrong way to hunt a great white shark, not a mistake any smart orca would copy. If orca cultures passed along memes that imperiled their members, they wouldn't be long for this world. Humans, on the other hand, pass on problematic memes like the notion of certainty on a daily basis. Rarely does this go well, but rarely does that stop us. The reason for our stubbornness goes deeper than we think. Neuroscience research is revealing that the state of not being certain is an extremely uncomfortable place for our brains to live. The greater the uncertainty, the worse the discomfort. A 2005 study conducted by psychologist Ming Su and his team found that even a small amount of ambiguity triggers increased activity in the amygdala, two deep brain structures that play a major role in our response to threats. Each amygdala is a cluster of nerve cells that sits under a corresponding temporal lobe on either side of the brain. Information pours into the amygdala from multiple sources. The amygdala filter through the information to determine its threat level significance and mobilizes a response. At the same time, the brain shows less activity in the ventral striatum, a part of the brain involved in our response to rewards. We would expect to see increased activity in the ventral striatum when we are anticipating a pay raise or vacation or even a kiss, for instance. As the level of ambiguity increases, amygdala activity continues to increase and ventral striatum activity continues to decrease. What this tells us is that the brain doesn't merely prefer certainty over ambiguity, it craves it. Our need to be right is actually a need to feel right. Neurologist Robert Burton coined the term certainty bias to describe this feeling and how it skews our thinking. The truth for all of us is that when we feel right about a decision or a belief, whether big or small, our brains are happy. Since our brains like being happy, we like feeling right. In our everyday lives, though, feeling right translates into being right. Because if we could admit that we only feel right, then we might not really be right. And from our brain's point of view, that's just not all right. Our fierce mammalian cousins in the oceans are not strapped with the existential baggage of craving certainty. Their needs are far more straightforward, and their brains evolved to facilitate learning specific to meeting those needs. As one unfortunate great white found out, orca brains are very good at what they do. Our brains are also very good at what they do. But as a consequence of their expansive abilities, our paths to surviving and thriving are not nearly so clear-cut. Our intense desire for feeling right is but one example of this uniquely human reality and what this chapter is all about. Blinded by the Bleeding Obvious Meet Phil, a youth program specialist at a school for deaf and blind students, responsible for the well-being and mentoring of students living at the institution. Phil, who, by the way, is quite a smart guy, Mensa member to boot, recalls the situation when he started the job. He was making nightly rounds of all the rooms in the blind student dorm to ensure that every student was in his or her room and accounted for. In his previous experience at other institutions, room checks were synonymous with lights out. But in this case, he was instructed that blind students often sleep with their lights on, because lights on or off don't matter to them either way. And the administration preferred that the lights stay on for safety reasons. As he made his rounds floor after floor, he found that all of the students' lights were on, and in each case, a student was in the room. When he came to a room with the lights off, the exception to what was now a well-established rule, he walked into the darkness and called out the student's name from his roster. No answer. He called again, more emphatically. Still no answer. After a third panicky call and no response, he checked all the remaining rooms, bathrooms, and hallways, and still not finding the student, rushed to the administration office to report him missing. Phil was asked if he was absolutely sure that the student was missing, 
and he affirmed that he had thoroughly inspected the entire building and was certain that the student was not in the room or anywhere else in the vicinity. His statement triggered a campus-wide search for the young student that spilled out well into the city and went on for hours. At some point during the search, something occurred to Phil that sent nervous energy tingling through his limbs. He ran back up to the floor of the student's room, still entirely dark, blindly reached around an inside wall and flicked on the light switch. The student was lying comfortably in his bed with earphones on. How did Phil overlook something that in hindsight seemed so obvious? Let's rewind and see what happened. First, Phil was introduced to a new rule for success. When lights are on, success is achieved. In his previous positions, the reverse was true, so his brain recalibrated to the parameters of the new rule. He then experienced multiple instances of the lights being on, room after room, floor after floor. These experiences reinforced his brain's recalibration and solidified the new rule. To put all this another way, Phil's attention became exceedingly selective. A change to the rule tripped his attention alarm, and the urgency of the alarm overrode consideration of other options. Phil became blind to details that could have changed the outcome, specifically turning on the light. Phil's behavior is an example of selective attention, also called selectivity bias, the tendency to orient oneself toward and process information from only one part of our environment to the exclusion of other parts, no matter how obvious those parts may be. Psychologists have uncovered how this dynamic works by using a research method called the Erickson Flankers task. Participants are shown three sets of symbols, a middle symbol flanked by a symbol on either side, flashed briefly on a screen. In some cases, the flanking symbols point toward the middle symbol. These are called congruent symbols. And in some cases, they point away from it, incongruent. And in some cases, neither, neutral. After each symbol set is flashed, participants tell the researchers whether the symbols were congruent, incongruent, or neutral and are also asked to rate how confident they are in their response. The results are remarkably consistent. Participants say they are highly confident in their responses, but end up being wrong more than half the time. The reason is that it's shockingly easy to influence the brain to ignore a large part of its environment. By simply flashing the symbols in a pattern and then changing the pattern, the brain remains selectively focused on one variable to the exclusion of others. It simply does not see them. Time is a big part of the flanker's task. The symbols are purposely flashed for just a moment forcing the participants to make a quick determination before the next set is flashed. When more time is allotted between sets, responses significantly improve. By far the most entertaining research illustrating how extreme the selectivity effect can be is the Gorillas in Our Midst study by psychologists Daniel Simons and Christopher Chabry. Study participants were asked to watch a video of a group of people passing a basketball and count how many times the ball is passed. While they are counting, a woman dressed in a gorilla costume slowly walks into the scene, stops halfway to beat her chest, and then slowly walks out of the scene for a total of nine seconds on screen. After the video ends, participants were asked to answer a few questions, such as, did you see anything unusual in the video? And, did you notice anyone or anything other than the basketball players? Finally, they were asked, did you see the gorilla? More than half of the participants replied that they had not seen anything unusual, and certainly not a gorilla. Simons and Chabri successfully catalyzed selective attention by telling the participants to focus on the ball and count the passes. Following this pattern, most of the observers never saw the bizarre sight that appeared right before their eyes. Participants in these studies report that they are shocked at just how wrong they were. People who complete the flanker's task frequently say they were certain they had it right. People who complete the gorilla study are amazed they missed something so obvious. Coming back to Phil, as long as the rooms he was inspecting were all the same, he could effectively judge them as right or wrong with very little time. In fact, this part of his job became so easy that he was probably flying through it, getting faster as he went. When he came to a room detached from the pattern, he didn't slow down the judgment train a bit. The result was that he didn't see what was right in front of him, albeit in the dark. What could Phil have done differently? The answer probably looks obvious by now. He should have slowed down. Another few moments of deliberation would likely have opened his cerebral eyes to details he was leaving out. But to do so, he also would have had to challenge his sense of being right, his marriage to certainty. Just as flankers task participants are shocked they were wrong, Phil, we can safely assume, was shocked that he'd missed such an obvious detail. At least Phil's story ended relatively well, which is not always the case for those in the certainty jungle, as we'll soon see. Drugstore Cowboys With great injury to my teenage sense of entitlement, I worked at a drugstore in my mid-teens to earn enough money for idle pursuits. One day I was running the cash register when a man with a subtle but noticeable nervous twitch approached the sales counter. 
He said he had questions about what type of film to use in his new 35mm camera and motioned to several different boxes of film displayed behind me. As I turned to pull down a couple boxes to show him the difference between 200 and 400 speed film, I noticed a woman wearing a large overcoat milling around the front of an aisle where cartons of cigarettes were stacked. Back then, some stores still sold cigs on shelves. I continued talking to the man but kept an eye on the woman as well. The man noticed that I was distracted and started talking faster to get my attention back on him. A couple seconds later, I saw the woman stash a carton of cigarettes into her overcoat. That's when it dawned on me that the man and woman were working together. He was distracting me while she looted the joint. I grabbed a phone and dialed up Ed, the manager in the back office. At this point, the man and woman realized they were caught and both started speed walking toward the door with a the jig is up but look inconspicuous anyway shuffle. Ed sprinted to the front of the store to stop them from leaving. Within seconds, he had a choice to make. He could either try to stop the man or try to stop the woman, but he could not stop both. One was sure to get out. His subjective determination was that the woman would be easiest to stop, so he reached out and grabbed her by the shoulder. Bad decision. She grabbed his hand, swung around to face him, and while he looked on in horror, pulled back his index finger until it audibly snapped. He fell to his knees, yelling in agony, and both the man and the woman ran out the door. Ed's decision was made with simple, bifurcated ingredients. Man stronger, woman weaker. He also happened to be a good old boy who believed women are, without exception, the weaker sex. His dedication to that dubious logic led him to act at, as it turned out, significant peril. This, however, is not the end of the story. Shortly after Ed's painful miscue, another employee, we'll call him Ned, took off after the pair. Ned was larger than Ed and often boasted of his martial arts skills. He chased the thieving duo into the parking lot, yelling for them to stop. And stop they did. The man turned and confronted Ned, who immediately assumed a sort of hybrid judo karate stance as a warning to the thief that he'd be no match for Ned's estimable skills. Regrettably for Ned, the man didn't care about his stance or skills and punched him solidly under his right eye. Ned fell to the pavement and the thieves continued their escape, this time all the way to their car and out of the parking lot. The common theme for Ed and Ned is that they both narrowly framed the situations they faced with limited and skewed information without consideration of information that could have changed the outcome. The best way to think of how our brains frame information is to imagine a picture frame. Except unlike a normal frame, this one obscures everything on the outside of the frame and magnetically draws attention to the inside. If you attempt to look outside the frame, your brain sounds an alarm that it's uncomfortable and wants your attention back squarely on what's inside the frame. We can see how this tendency affected Ed and Ned. Why, for example, did Ed physically engage the thieves at all? His internal framing led him to believe that he could overpower one of them, the one he presumed must be weaker. In fact, the strength of his internal framing was greater than whatever amount of apprehension he may have felt about physically taking on a total stranger. Ned's framing went like this. I can dominate the thieves with my superior fighting skills. He didn't consider possibilities outside of this frame, namely, that he may not be as skilled as he believed, or that the thieves might be more skilled, or even armed. Nor did he consider information he'd already witnessed. Ed's finger snapping like a pretzel. Psychologists Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman were the first to identify this tendency as a cognitive bias, which they called simply framing bias, defining it as the decision maker's conception of acts, outcomes, and contingencies associated with a particular choice. The frame that a decision maker adopts is controlled partly by the formulation of the problem and partly by the norms, habits, and personal characteristics of the decision maker. Ed and Ned were making on the spot decisions and their internal framing manifested without much deliberation. We can cut them some slack for that. If we could peel back the consciousness of these fellows, we would uncover a deeper level of internalized framing, which might be better called pre-framing. The philosopher and psychology writer Sam Keen tells a story about how he and his brother were labeled by their parents. Sam's brother was a mechanical genius from an early age. He could take apart and reassemble a lawnmower before he was six. His parents told everyone that he was a born engineer, a mechanical marvel. Sam, on the other hand, was sensitive and thoughtful. He had no discernible mechanical skills, and his parents were careful to point out, to Sam and to others, just how different he and his brother were. Later in life, Sam was trying to figure out whether to go to college or vocational school, so he took a vocational exam to determine his strengths. Afterwards, Sam was asked to discuss his results with a guidance counselor. The counselor informed him that he had scored well across the board, but especially well in mechanical aptitude. Sam, shocked by the results, replied, Oh, you must have the wrong results. That's my brother. Keen's story reveals something insidious about framing's connection to the feeling of certainty. It operates in our minds like a script written by other people and colored by influences of which we're not even totally aware. 
Framing is, of course, also an external influence that affects us in the present. A great deal of research has been conducted on the role of media in framing, particularly when it comes to couching sensitive issues. Kahneman and Tversky devised a classic study to illustrate how this flavor of framing works, recreated as follows. Consider each scenario and think about your response. You work for the Centers for Disease Control, and there is an outbreak of a deadly disease called the Asian flu in a town of 600 people. All 600 people in the town are expected to die if you do nothing. Someone has come up with two different programs designed to fight the disease. With Program 1, 200 people in the town will be saved. With Program 2, there is a 1 in 3 probability that 600 people will be saved, and a 2 in 3 probability that no people will be saved. Which would you pick? Then another expert comes to you and presents two additional program options. With program 3, 400 people in the town will die. With program 4, there is a 1 in 3 probability that nobody will die, and a 2 in 3 probability that 600 people will die. Which of these do you pick? For the first set of programs, 72% of the subjects picked program 1 in the original study. For the second set of programs, 78% of the subjects picked program 4. I'm sure you've noticed, however, that programs 1 and 3 are the same, and programs 2 and 4 are the same. The only difference is the way the information is framed. In the first instance of framing the program, 72% of people chose it. In the second instance of framing, the same program, only 22% chose it. When framing blurs judgment, the nuts and bolts of the content matters far less, whether or not we realize it. The concluding irony of the Ed and Ed story is that the best decision was to let the thieves go and call the police, which, incidentally, is exactly what I was doing. As I mentioned earlier, one thing we can say in defense of Ed and Ed is that they were acting under time pressure. But as we'll discuss next, screwing up with framing doesn't require an iota of urgency. Misframed in Translation A few years ago, I was on a business trip in China and had a day to take in some sites. Number one on my list, the Great Wall. With me was an American expat named Mark who had lived in Beijing for several years and was intimately familiar with local customs and also, thankfully, spoke fluent Mandarin. He had been instructing me throughout the trip about the best ways to interact with the Chinese, things not to do, and things that I should not assume, even though in the States they'd be perfectly valid assumptions. One of his firmer admonitions was that when approaching street vendors, be extremely careful not to touch anything you don't intend to buy. While doing so is normal in the States, the Chinese street vendors perceive your willingness to investigate their products as a sign that you will buy something. This particular rule struck me as ridiculous. How would I know I wanted to buy something if I didn't at least pick it up to look it over? His response, just don't, trust me. Along the path leading to the Great Wall are several vendors selling what seems an infinite assortment of memorabilia. One item especially caught my eye, a vintage replica of a red Chinese army winter hat, complete with massive fur-lined ear flaps. I walked over to the vendor booth displaying the item. In this case, I thought to myself, surely one would be expected to at least try on the hat to see if it fits before buying it. Ignoring my colleague's advice, I picked up the hat and put it on. It didn't fit very well, so I placed it back on the display table. Before I realized what was happening, two vendors from the table circled around behind me. One of them grabbed the hat and handed it back to me while emphatically chattering in Mandarin. While I couldn't understand anything he said, the implication was clear. Buy the hat. I smiled and shook my head, trying to highlight my foreign naivete, and put the hat back on the table. Then the other vendor grabbed it and in this time forcibly put it on my head. I pulled it off and put it on the table only to have it once again put back on my head. Eventually, Mark saw what was happening and intervened, but even then we were pursued by the vendors until they gave up chase near the entrance of the Great Wall. This framing foible is of a different flavor than Ed and Ned's. I was given explicit, credible information that behaving in a certain way would result in a bad outcome. I also had enough time to fully consider my actions. Yet I still framed the situation in line with my narrowly defined criteria and acted accordingly. Research by psychologists Keith E. Stanovich and Richard F. West suggests that my error in this case was a failure to engage heuristic override. In psychology, heuristics are simple, efficient rules, either hardwired in our brains or learned, that kick in especially when we're facing problems with incomplete information. Heuristics are terrific tools that humans rely on all the time, but it's always quite possible that they are leading us down a blind alley, which is precisely when we should allow outside knowledge to supplement and perhaps trump our inner leanings. When skewed heuristics win the day, psychologists like Stanovich and West tell us we've succumbed to heuristic bias. One way to understand heuristic bias is to imagine a rule book filled with, one, rules that have always been in the book, and two, rules that are always being added to it. You keep the rule book with you at all times and refer to it often. There are, however, a couple rather big problems with the book. 
Many of its rules are written as if they are absolute and irrefutable, though they are neither, and many are written as if they apply to all situations. They don't. Unfortunately, it's hard to tell when a rule shouldn't apply, so you often find yourself deliberating about what to do. The more you question the rules, the more ambiguity you face, and the more your brain feels threatened. The tendency, then, is to go with the rule and settle the matter. That makes your brain happy, though the result might be anything but pleasant. Reflecting back on the story, I started by framing the vendor situation narrowly, to the exclusion of information presented to me. I then acted on a rule from my book, always disregard advice if it sounds inconsistent with my experience. I felt right making those decisions, both of which turned out badly with more than a little awkwardness to boot. We'll discuss more about knowing when to press the override button at the end of this chapter. For now, let's leave framing and heuristics and take a quick trip to antiquity, sort of. This is Sparta. Hike! I'm a big fan of the movie 300, a vivid retelling of the Spartans' famous stand against the Persians at Thermopylae, where 300 of Sparta's best warriors held fast against enemy numbers too vast to estimate. More precisely, it's a recreation of comic book icon Frank Miller's graphic novel about the Spartans' fight for freedom against the notoriously cruel Persian army. Why I like the movie has nothing to do with historical accuracy, of which it has quite little. Aside from enjoying its well-choreographed fight scenes, I like the movie because it's an excellent example of how information is chosen to confirm existing positions. Shortly after its release in theaters, certain right-of-center print, radio, and TV personalities picked up the film's themes of fighting for freedom and standing against oppression, and integrated them into their shticks. The movie became part of their histrionic populist anthems, and its buffed and tanned protagonists, the Spartans, became populist heroes. What the same media personalities did not roll into their monologues is that the Spartans were also brutal slave owners. The reason that Spartan men could devote themselves to becoming full-time professional warriors is that they had plenty of slaves for tending mundane, non-warrior labor. The Spartans were not concerned with the principle of freedom, they were concerned with their freedom. The Spartans were also hardly the sort of heroes anyone preaching family values should venerate. Spartan babies were routinely thrown off cliffs for not displaying the qualities valuable to a warrior nation. Spartan boys were left to fend for themselves at an early age, often starving to death or killed in a style of training barbaric to modern sensibilities. This viciously utilitarian perspective on life is the antithesis of what most Americans claim to embrace. The question is, why didn't any of that matter? How did the themes of a movie built with fictional popsicle sticks become so important in the family-centric populist milieu? The answer is that the theme of freedom, and everything that supports it, fit into the existing beliefs of those preaching and subscribing to the populist message. The historical realities that call into question almost everything about that theme did not fit, and hence were excluded. Psychologists refer to this tendency to seek confirming evidence and ignore disconfirming evidence as confirmation bias, and it's as human as sex, sleep, and barbecue. Another quick example involving burly, violent men will further illustrate how this works. Let's say that you are a diehard fan of the Oakland Raiders football team. One day you are online and decide to troll around a few professional football message boards to see what the latest buzz is, and you come across a thread entitled, Why the Raiders Suck. You click on it and start reading the entries. Some of them are blatant insults, and while those make you mad, you don't pay them much attention. The posts that really grab your attention are those that call into question certain facts about the team that you, as a longtime fan, have taken to be true without qualification. Further, a few of the posts aren't just inane one-liners, but well-thought-out arguments with supporting evidence. What are you feeling right now? It's not exactly the same as anger, because anger alone is a shotgun force. Your emotions are more directed and mixed. While you're mad that people are slamming your team, you're also concerned that what some of them are saying might actually be true. And if some of it is true, that means some of what you've held near and dear is false. That can't happen, you say to yourself. But I also can't just ignore what I've read. So you determine to do some research and write a post of your own, and you know exactly where to start. Oakland Raiders fan sites. Where else would you find information to build your case? Stop tape. You see where this is going. Your motivation in this case isn't to rationally evaluate the information you found and, if necessary, change your position. Your real motivation is to find information that will confirm your existing position, because there's no way in hell that it's changing, period. We do this all the time with all sorts of beliefs and positions. What is it we're really after when we seek evidence to confirm and dismiss or ignore evidence that disconfirms? In a word, closure. More on that after a visit to Turin and a chat about your dog. The Shroud of Turin and Washing the Dog The Shroud of Turin, that fantastically resilient white whale of religious archaeology, is never far from a new round of debate about its authenticity. What makes its resurfacing remarkable is that every credible scientific evaluation to date has exposed it as a medieval hoax. Repeatedly, radiocarbon dating has shown that the shroud is a 13th or 14th century creation, not a 1st century phenomenon. 
Yet the debate persists, and with vigor. In a 2009 volley from the Shroud is Real camp, a Vatican researcher claimed to have found virtually invisible words written in Greek, Latin, and Aramaic across the Shroud. The words, she claimed, included the name Jesus the Nazarene in Greek. If the Shroud were a medieval forgery, the contention continues, Jesus' name would not have been used without reference to his divinity. Even a smarmy forger wouldn't make such a blatant error, the Vatican's researchers argue. Hence, the Shroud must be from the first century. The lead researcher was a historian employed by the Vatican and known for her studies of the secret order of the Knights Templar. During that research campaign, she claimed that the Knights at one time had the Shroud in their possession, which strikes most historians who study the period as odd since the Knights were disbanded in the early 14th century and the first record of the Shroud's existence occurred around 1360 in France. Her more recent contention about the Shroud was also met with hefty skepticism. For years, those who have studied the Shroud have known that it is peppered with words. Nothing new about that. But she is the first to claim that she's found definitive proof of the artifact's authenticity within those words. There are, however, a few insurmountable problems with her conclusion. For example, she claims that part of the text is written in Latin, a language never used during Jewish burials in the first century. Deal breaker? Not in this debate. The question is, why do people dedicate themselves to proving something true that has already been proven false? First, we have to appreciate the depth of emotion tied to disbelief. Despite appearances, this debate is not solely about evidence. For many, a commitment to the Shroud's authenticity is integral to their overall spiritual beliefs. If the religious belief position cannot be separated from a closer-to-objective scientific evaluation, then the outcome will always be the same. The stakes are too high for disconfirming facts to prevail. The evidence will forever be in question, no matter how substantial. Taking the discussion down a hundred or so octaves, let's pretend that you and your significant other are arguing about whose turn it is to wash the dog, easily one of the least pleasant chores either of you have on your to-do lists. You both believe that you are the last one to do it. But the fact is that you both are also very busy people, and your days and nights tend to blend into each other. Either of you could easily be wrong about who washed Poochie last. Yet you stand your ground, arguing your position as if you are addressing the United Nations. But then your partner hits you with strong evidence challenging your position. You could not have washed the dog on the day you said you did, because you had to leave early for work that day to attend a meeting. All along, you've maintained that you got up early to wash the dog. Both can't be true. The argument sounds plausible, but you're still sure that you are right. Perhaps you guessed the day wrong. It was, after all, a couple weeks ago. Anyone could make that mistake. But the armor has been pierced, and now you're starting to wonder if you really have your story straight. If you can't recall which day you had an early meeting, then it's only reasonable to conclude that you could forget which day you or someone washed the dog. Is it possible that you've been selecting the scraps from memory to make your argument? Is it probable that your perception is morphed to fill the shape of your expectation? That you shouldn't have to wash your much-loved but extremely dirty pet? With evidence stacking against you and your certainty losing ground by the second, will you give in? The Shroud of Turin flavor of confirmation bias is linked to a deeply embedded religious belief. It's similar to the debate over evolution in that giving any ground in the argument is tantamount to disavowing one's heartfelt spiritual beliefs, the standing of which trumps all else. The washing your dog flavor of confirmation bias is not belief-based, but it is linked to a sense of personal credibility, your track record of being right or wrong. For most people, a credibility position is not as unyielding as a belief-based position, but it's a stubborn beast nonetheless. We can reasonably expect that, eventually, someone will give on washing the dog, after all, the dog won't wash himself. Though that doesn't necessarily mean someone will admit that she or he is wrong. Even with something so trivial, confirmation bias is a tough force to overcome. Both parties want the cerebral surge that comes with being proven right. Arguments like washing the dog offer what you might call low-hanging fruit. Getting closure on relatively small matters is like picking off the easiest fruit to reach on the proverbial tree. Our brains like this because each instance of closure is a little reward, a tasty jolt of certainty. If it were possible to win the Shroud of Turin debate, it's not. The resulting surge would be epic. Gaining cognitive closure at that level is, to use another reference from antiquity, the holy grail of certainty for our brains. And in the case of the Shroud, that certainty will, like the grail, always remain out of reach. But what might happen if a deeply held belief-based position were proven wrong in such a way that no reasonable person could challenge the outcome? Would the stanchions of confirmation bias crack and collapse under the weight of overwhelming evidence? Let's see. The Kiai Master's Challenge A number of martial arts sects across the globe claim to teach an uncanny ability known as the touchless attack. It is exactly what it sounds like, the ability to knock opponents on their derrieres without physically touching their bodies. One practitioner of this invisible assault goes by the moniker the human stun gun. Others call themselves Kiai Masters. 
chi being a spelling variation of the term chi or ki, referring to one's inherent inner force that is allegedly harnessed via certain martial arts techniques. Make no mistake, those who believe in the touchless attack are resolute that it is real. Videos of Kiai masters effortlessly flinging their students around their dojos, training facilities for martial artists, are legion on the internet. With nothing but swift hand movements through the air, these masters flip, toss, trip, and knock out each student as he or she attempts in vain to attack the carnage-wielding magician before them. Outsiders, those not students of the touchless attack, question its validity. Critics of the practice call it bullshito. Many have challenged the Kiai masters to demonstrate their ability with opponents who are not their students, and usually these challenges are ignored or rebuffed. They have nothing to prove to outsiders, the masters frequently respond. The proof is right there in the videos of their sessions for all to see. Take it or leave it. One Kiai master, however, determined that not only could he prove his abilities with non-students, but he'd even be willing to put money on it. The wager? $5,000 to anyone who could face the Kiai master and withstand his lethal assault in front of Japanese television cameras. To make the wager even more interesting, he issued the challenge directly to mixed martial arts, MMA, practitioners, those skilled in multiple arts like karate, jiu-jitsu, and kickboxing. Not surprisingly, someone took him up on it. Kiai master Ryurkarin, who claimed a 200-0 record coming into the match, faced his opponent in his dojo with a live crowd and television cameras rolling per the terms of his challenge. His opponent, an experienced mixed martial artist, publicly signed the contract before the bout, agreeing that if he could not withstand Ryurkarin's assault, he would not win the $5,000. With all formalities completed, the pair began the match. It didn't last long. The MMA fighter charged at Master Ryurkarin, who moved his hands through the air in the same manner that flipped his students on their heads, and mercilessly pummeled the Kiai Master as the crowd looked on in horror. Ryurkarin got up and again waved his hands about in the general direction of his opponent, and was again knocked to the ground and repeatedly kicked until finally submitting. Anyone watching the video of this fiasco is forced to wonder why Ryurkarin would willingly subject his belief and body to such open and painful scrutiny. Whatever the answer, what seems clear is that he genuinely believed that he possessed an ability to move physical objects without touching them. He put his money, his reputation, and his pride on the line to prove it. In doing so, he unwittingly provided us with an incredible example of belief-based confirmation bias facing the ultimate challenge and losing big. I'm not talking about his confirmation bias, mind you. I'm talking about the confirmation bias of those who believed what he believed, his students and other supporters who fervently argued that the ability claimed by the Kiai master was 100% legitimate. Surely they could no longer stand in this argument, right? Wrong. In the aftermath of the fight, many supporters of the touchless attack didn't move an inch. The MMA fighter had somehow managed to channel the energy of the master's attack, they argued. Ryurkarin was under the weather and unable to wield his power at full strength, said others. The loss was an anomaly. It proved nothing. The touchless attack and those who teach it did not go extinct as one might expect after thousands upon thousands of people watched the brutal uncloaking of Master Ryurkarin. That, in a nutshell, is the power of confirmation bias. You can punch it, kick it, break its arms and legs, and humiliate it for all to see, yet still it stands. Schema for your thoughts. Taking a position in any argument, large or small, is slippery business for our brains. We can have every intention of honestly pursuing an answer, yet still fool ourselves into thinking our method is objective when it is, in fact, anything but. Cognitive science has helped decipher this enigma with research on the theoretical mental structures our brains use to organize information called schemata. A schema, singular form of schemata, is like a mental map of concepts that hangs together by association. For example, your schema for school contains associations between teacher and books and subjects. Each of those have additional associations. Subjects is linked to math and literature, for example. Cognitive science suggests that as schemata develop, the parameters for what information can be included tighten. The reason for this is very practical. We make judgments based on the linkages in our schemata. If the information didn't hang together in a structured way, and if certain pieces of information were not excluded from the map, we'd find making even basic judgments extremely difficult. Imagine that you've been in the workforce for about 10 years and are interviewing for a job. The interviewer tells you about the job's duties, the work schedule, the location, the wage, and other pertinent details. All this is important, but what's equally as important is what you brought into the room with you. Your schema for, let's call it career, includes a host of linkages that have developed with time that you draw upon to make judgments. Is the company you are interviewing with compatible with your career? Does the schedule fit? Does the wage fit? Does the size of the company fit? Does the commute time fit? You may reasonably change your mind about any of these things, of course, but the point is that you did not enter the room as an empty bucket ready to be filled. 
You entered with a pre-established schema for career that serves as the platform for your judgments. And therein lies the rub. Pre-established schemata guide our attention to evaluate new information, but they can also guide our attention to selectively ignore information inconsistent with the schemata. To understand why, we have to go back to what makes the brain happy. When a well-established schema is called into question by new information, the brain reacts as if threatened. The amygdala fires up, threat response, and the ventral striatum revs down, reward response. This is not a comfortable place for the brain. The supercharged clay in your head doesn't like being on guard. It likes being stable. Ambiguity, which might result from considering the new information, is a threat. We can either allow the threat to stand by considering the inconsistent information or block it by dismissing or ignoring it. Or we might subcategorize information and store it away as an outlier case, something that can't be entirely ignored but does not challenge or change the existing schema. Cognitive science researchers are especially interested in how our brains maintain pre-established schemata. Successfully plumbing the depths of religious belief, for example, appears to hinge on understanding the ways our brain seeks stability. Indeed, belief in general appears to have much to do with the brain's penchant for homeostasis, defined by renowned physiologist Walter Bradford Cannon as the property of a system that regulates its internal environment and tends to maintain a stable, constant condition. We humans are prone to divide belief positions by value. Believing in God is more important than believing 2 plus 2 equals 4. But neuroscience research has shown that in the brain, all belief reactions look the same, whether the stimulus is value-laden, like religion, or neutral, like math. Whether the value we've assigned to a belief is, from our subjective vantage point, high or low, the brain wants the same things, stability and consistency. We seldom realize it, but very nearly everything we do is colored by this drive. Engaging cognitive override, Captain. A new product is about to hit the market, and I think you'll want to take notice. It's called the Supernovum. Shaped like a slightly overlarge motorcycle helmet, the user places it on her head and pushes just one button to get things started. She doesn't know it yet, but she has just given her brain an amazing advantage over all the other brains walking around out there. Some of the features she'll experience include greatly reduced selective attention, no more missing the details, broader framing, no more mental myopia, and information that challenges her beliefs can drive on in for an objective evaluation, no more confirmation bias. Plus, the Supernovum comes in a variety of colors and patterns to match its user's unique personality. Even if such a device existed, I wonder if we'd really want it. Would it be worth short-circuiting parts of our brains to avoid the sorts of certainty foibles discussed in this chapter? Probably not. A better question might be, if the brain craves certainty, then why not simply give it what it wants? Why not abide the urge to feel right if that's what makes the brain happy? Before I try to answer those questions, I want to tell you a brief story about my wife, who likes jumping out of airplanes. Just before we got married, she decided that her urge to leap from a perfectly stable plane had been put off long enough. We found a reputable skydiving outfit in Northern Virginia so that she could kick off what was sure to become a lifelong passion for death-defying sports. From my perspective, this was just short of insanity. So you're going to step out of a plane at 12,000 feet, I recall asking? the reality of the situation finally hitting me as we were reviewing the liability disclaimer forms with statements like, you acknowledge that engaging in this activity can result in your sudden death. For her, every moment leading up to the jump was sheer ecstasy. Not that she wasn't nervous. I think only a zombie wouldn't have some nervous reaction before jumping thousands of feet above sea level. But the exhilaration of doing what she'd wanted to do for so long, to take on one of her ultimate challenges, outpaced her anxiety by a furlong. She went on to have a successful jump and I managed to watch the whole thing without closing my eyes. We have to appreciate that our brains weren't born yesterday. We have mechanisms to warn of threats and guard against instability because they have worked for a very long time. We wouldn't be here without them. In the same way that any sane person feels apprehension about jumping out of an airplane, our brain puts the organism it controls on alert when danger looms, be it tangible or intangible. But we have to know when to override the alarm and take the less comfortable path anyway. Research conducted by a joint American and Italian team of psychologists found that people with less need for cognitive closure were typically more creative problem solvers than their counterparts. In other words, those who are able to work past the brain's appetite for certainty, its need to shut the closure door to preserve stability, are more likely to engage challenges from a broader variety of vantage points and take risks to overcome them. Jumping out of the airplane even when our brain is shouting, stop, is sometimes exactly what we need to do. That's the energy that fuels scientific discovery, technological advances, and a range of other human pursuits. Which is not to say, of course, that we shouldn't also listen to our brains. It's not always advantageous to act against our neural inclinations. Sometimes a narrow frame is right for the situation. And sometimes disallowing new information is necessary. 
We have to dance with our instincts to figure out when to leap or when to stay on the ground. That's the challenge of being human, of having a big brain capable of greatness with hardwiring evolved for survival. Chapter 2. Seductive Patterns and Smoking Monkeys There are as many pillows of illusion as flakes in a snowstorm. Ralph Waldo Emerson, Conduct of Life Who's telling me what? Let's try a little thought experiment. First, imagine that you are walking through an airport. As you stroll, you encounter a series of variables that occur randomly, but could easily be interpreted as uncannily coincidental. For instance, the same number, let's say 429, appears in four different places in the span of about 45 minutes. The price of a magazine, the time on your watch when you happen to glance at it, a number imprinted on the back of someone's t-shirt, and the cost of a frozen yogurt. The stroll and these weird, rapidly occurring coincidences is leading up to boarding an airplane. As it happens, the number of your flight fits eerily into the trail of coincidences. It's flight 1429. You are faced with whether to read meaning into these coincidences or ignore them. Have you been given a sign about the flight? If so, by whom? And what could it mean? Should you get on the flight or change your ticket for the next one with a number that isn't part of the strange pattern? An example like this is enough to challenge most people's skepticism about whether random occurrences mean anything when they appear to fit a pattern. But if a pattern means something, what's the compass for figuring out the meaning? Since you are about to board an airplane, the first reaction is that you have been given a warning not to get on the plane. Fair enough. But then, how many other people about to get on the same plane received a comparable warning? And if they didn't, why are you the recipient of such privileged information? And then there's an entirely different possibility that you have been given a sign that something good is about to happen to you on the plane. Maybe you'll be seated next to your future husband or someone who is going to eventually offer you a high-paying job. But again, how can you really know for certain? Is it worth taking the risk? If you get on the plane and it crashes, you will know as you descend that you could have acted on the sign but chose not to. Just thinking about that possibility causes beads of sweat to well up along your forehead. Okay, now stop and take a breath. If you found that paragraph frustrating to hear, then the first part of my point has been delivered. It is simply this. The meanings we give to patterns of coincidence originate and live solely in our minds and are then projected into the world. The problem is that once our pattern-detecting brains are provided with the rudiments of a convincing story, one with possibilities that may endanger or benefit us, it is difficult to pull out of the process. In this case, it will be hard to rewind the mental tape and ask yourself why you started looking for 429 to begin with. Perhaps you saw the number twice, and even that minor pattern put your brain on alert, with the result of tightening your focus to extend the pattern. Once that happened, finding more 429s in the airport would not be difficult. They would begin sticking out like red neon signs against a black backdrop. The reality is that your safety was never any more in jeopardy than if you had never experienced the coincidences at all. And rationally, you knew this all along. But, as we will continue to discuss throughout this audiobook, the gap between a happy brain's library of knowledge and our actions is larger than we know. Here's another example. This one entirely true and pulled from my personal repertoire of chance experience. I was about eight years old, living in Rochester, New York, playing by myself in the snow near my driveway. Three odd things happened while I was outside. First, I smelled something foul, like a dead animal. At that age, I had not been around too many animals, aside from our dog, but for some reason I connected the smell in the air with an animal of some sort. It drifted off in just a couple minutes, and I continued playing. Next, I heard what I thought was loud breathing, too loud to be a person. I looked around the house but didn't find anyone or anything, and the noise soon stopped. Finally, while I was building a snow fort out of a snowbank along a walkway to the house, I looked down and saw a splotch of snow on the walkway with a distinct shape. The more I looked at it, the more defined the splotch became, and I concluded that the shape was that of a bear. Head, body, legs, and claws. Not long after, my mother called me into the house for dinner. The local news was on TV, and my attention was immediately riveted by one of the top stories. A black bear had escaped from the city zoo and was still at large. So what do you think? Random coincidence or a sign to avoid danger? I'll leave that for you to digest as we move on. I think, therefore I connect. Since our brains are adept at finding and drawing conclusions from patterns, it's not surprising that coincidences captivate our attention. The pioneering psychologist Carl Gustav Jung went so far as to argue that what we take to be coincidences are actually interlinked associations that form a sort of unseen web. He used the term synchronicity to describe this ethereal force. A cottage industry within both the New Age and self-help spheres capitalized on Jung's claims. The international bestseller about the power of coincidence, The Celestine Prophecy, and its follow-on books are prime examples. 
This compulsion to connect experiences, symbols, images, and ideas stems directly from the brain's vital function as an organ evolved to make sense of our environment. As we have discussed, without this ability, our species would have vanished long ago. The problem is that our penchant for connection, like many features of our brains, can get out of hand. When that happens, our brains quite literally make something out of nothing, and we can't seem to stop ourselves from doing it over and over again. Consider, for example, the true case of a psychologist who has become enamored with the mega best-selling book, The Secret, another refashioning of positive thinking in the Think Yourself Rich mantra, who recommends that her patient read the book as well. As proof of how much the book has changed the psychologist's life, she shows the patient a photo of a new BMW convertible. She explains that the book convinced her that she must focus on that which she wants the most, the car, and constantly remind herself that she will own the BMW. She adds that ever since she started doing so, she sees the car everywhere. In fact, in the last few days, she has seen it no less than five times on the road. And this, she states, is surely a sign that her positive thinking strategy is working. Even as a trained psychologist, she fails to see that she has duped herself. With her attention primed by an image of the car, her brain is busily picking it out of the scenery everywhere she goes. Instead of pushing through the muddled thinking, she concludes that her positive focus is producing signs that her goal will soon be reached. Even if you do not consider yourself especially pattern-prone, you probably still fall into the connection trap without even thinking about it, albeit in not-so-dramatic fashion as our earlier airplane example. Marketers routinely use something psychologists call the clustering illusion in retail product placement that leverages our compulsion to identify patterns and assign meaning. If, for instance, three Blu-ray disc players are placed next to each other with the highest-priced item followed by the next highest-priced item followed by the lowest-priced item, then the store can expect to sell more of the item in the middle and will mark it up accordingly. The reason is that we assign a specific meaning to the placement, best, next best, worst, when it's possible that no such meaning exists. In fact, the Blu-ray player in the middle may be of no higher quality than the cheapest player. Retail marketers know that people are convinced that their meaning associations are correct, and they leverage them to reap a higher markup on cheap items. Our brains make these associations because that is what our brains do, in part. And it's always helpful to remember that the adaptive capabilities of our brains, like pattern recognition, did not evolve to make sense of complex commercial environments like those we live in. To make things more interesting, we are also predisposed to wanting an evident cause for every effect. And if one isn't evident, our brains will happily create one. Alleged Causes, Presumed Effects Imagine that a study on the effects of drinking coffee comes out in the news indicating that drinking at least three cups a day significantly improves attention and memory. Someone reads this news and immediately increases her morning coffee ritual to three cups. For the next month, she thinks she is more attentive and remembering things better because she's drinking more coffee. Then she reads a newer study that says drinking more than two cups of coffee a day is linked to significantly decreased attention and heightened anxiety. The second study has been promoted with as much gusto as the first, and the credentials of the researchers are just as impressive. She thinks, you know, I have been feeling more anxious lately, and maybe I'm not as focused as I thought and she decreases her coffee intake down to two cups. For the next couple weeks, she feels more attentive and not nearly as anxious, until she reads an article a few weeks later discrediting the second study and upholding the findings of the first. At each step along the way, the effects she was experiencing had far less to do with coffee and far more to do with her belief that causal links existed between a behavior and an outcome. My analogy of choice for highlighting this tendency is the smoking monkey, referring to the kitschy novelty item popular in the 1960s. A small plastic or ceramic monkey is packaged with a tiny cigarette that is placed into a hole in its mouth, and when lit, the monkey appears to smoke the cigarette, even blowing smoke rings. The monkey is hollow, and there is a second hole in its bottom, allowing air to circulate through its body and keep the tiny cigarette smoldering. At least, that's the cause and effect takeaway someone might have when the hole in the bottom is shown to them and the air circulation link is suggested. In much the same way, when a person smokes, air circulates through the cigarette and keeps it going. That would be a neat and tidy analogy that makes sense of the original puzzle, except the smoking monkey does not work at all the same as a smoking human, and the explanation is wrong. In truth, the hole has nothing to do with the cigarette, which is instead made of paper designed to smolder without burning. We're usually like the person who sees the other hole, gets a little information, and concludes a cause and effect link, what psychologists call causation. We're faced with smoking monkeys every day, and our brains are happy to fill in the blanks with causal relationships that don't really exist. What our brains are searching for in each smoking monkey scenario is a story that makes sense. Next, we will discuss why. It must mean something, right? Storytelling is powerful medicine for the mind. One of the reasons stories appeal to us, in audiobooks, on TV or otherwise, is that they link together shards of meaning that eventually yield even greater meaning. In other words, stories make sense of the world. 
Making sense of the world makes our brains happy. But some of the stories we hear lack an adequate wrap-up. Here's a true story that illustrates the point. A few years ago, I was working on a public health campaign in Birmingham, Alabama, and heard some news that put a tragically capital R in random. A woman driving downtown stopped at an intersection and waited for the light to change. What she didn't know is that she had stopped her car directly over a water main manhole cover. What she also didn't know and could not have known is that the city was experiencing a massive pressure surge in the water main, which was building in intensity as she approached the intersection. In the handful of minutes that she waited for a green light, the pressure surge reached the part of the water main where her car had stopped and, having hit the weakest part of the pipeline, erupted as a geyser of scorching hot steam through the manhole. She was steamed to death in her car like a lobster in a pot of boiling water. It's difficult to imagine the odds of such an exceptionally random event, but I did some rough figuring and came up with about 1 in 500,000, taking into account the average number of drivers in downtown Birmingham, the number of manholes, and the chance of that sort of water pipeline problem happening. I later learned that it's called a water hammer. I'm sure my figures are far from perfect, but whatever the actual number is, there's no question the chances of dying that way are remote. And yet, on one idle afternoon when everything seemed just as normal as any other day, it happened. Upon hearing a story like this, we can actually feel how our brain wants to string together the chance events leading up to the outcome in an effort to make sense of the tragedy. But even with a physical explanation as to why it happened, pressure surge, the story lacks closure at the level of why, capital W, it occurred. The reason this open-endedness is hard to accept is because it reinforces the sense that random tragedies can happen to anyone, including us, and that is mighty threatening to a threat-sensitive brain. Said another way, the lack of a why underscores the power of randomness in our lives. We crave a reason. Hence the off-quoted statement, everything happens for a reason. What is the reason? We don't know. But asserting that there must be one acts as a surrogate for closure. It also provides us with something absolutely necessary for a reason to exist. Agency. An agent in psychological literature is a person or thing responsible for causing something to happen. We search for agents all the time, personal and impersonal and we select words that imply agency even when we know it doesn't exist. For example, a professor is attempting to give a presentation to his class using a computer and projector. The projector isn't working, and after several attempts to fix it, he says, it seems this projector is determined to wreck my class. He knows, as does everyone in the room, that the projector is not an action-causing agent, but his words betray the brain's desire to assign agency no matter the physical facts. We blame our car for not starting, software for not saving documents, plants for not growing, and on and on. The philosopher Daniel Dennett calls this the intentional stance. We refer to objects both animate and inanimate as if they have minds as a shortcut to figuring out what is really going on. Again, we can find a likely evolutionary underpinning for this tendency of a happy brain, namely that identifying what is causing an action could save our lives. Picture one of our ancestors gathering food in the thick of the forest. Suddenly he hears a rustling in a nearby tree. Is it the wind? a harmless bird, or a massive man-eating cat. Decoding the clues quickly and finding the actual cause could be the difference between returning to the family with dinner or becoming dinner. Leaving the forest, we can also see how this tendency would evolve for deciphering the intentions of others. The human animal is the most formidable on a planet not only against other species, but also against other humans. Not correctly identifying another's real intentions could very well be the last mistake a person makes. Stats and your brain, not a love story. Statistics is not most students' favorite subject. Next to calculus and organic chemistry, it might be the most avoided class in any college undergraduate program. The truth, however, is that statistics lord over our lives every minute of every day. For the purposes of this discussion, suffice to say that all of us are the pawns of probability. Given enough time, enough drivers, enough incremental problems in the water main, eventually someone will stop their car over a manhole cover that is about to blow. It may happen only once in a year, or 10 years, or maybe more but it will happen. How do we know this? Because it happened. The words random and luck are really stand-ins for a more jargony term, probabilistic outcomes. When a tornado rips through a town and destroys every house in a neighborhood except for one, which is somehow left intact right down to the manicured hedges, it is acceptable shorthand to call the house still standing and the people in it lucky. Or someone might attribute the saving of the house and destruction of the others to an otherworldly agent like God or Satan. But a diligent statistician would simply call it a probable outcome given the factors at play, such as the structure and speed of the tornado, location of the house compared to the others, and so forth. The statistician would also refer to a body of statistical evidence about tornado damage gathered over time that shows how frequently one house in a given neighborhood is left standing 
and conversely, how frequently only one house among several is destroyed. None of this information is going to precisely answer why one house was spared or destroyed, but it will provide context for understanding that this event is not beyond explanation. Nevertheless, our brains have a hard time accepting the explanation. The immediate need to assign agency for what happened is strong enough to overpower the realization that many things happen without a why. Indeed, on a less epic scale, they happen all the time. I am still shocked every time I hear a word or phrase. For instance, a radio host says something about a brown horse, and I happen to look out of my car window and simultaneously see a brown horse in a stable near the road. Probabilistically speaking, this is not so remarkable. But in the moment it happens, I find myself looking for significance in the connection. It's not a silly mistake. It's what our brains do. A final word on why this matters. There is another dimension to this discussion that I have intentionally held for last in hopes that it might serve as a useful takeaway. Psychologists use the term illusion of control to describe what happens when we place ourselves in the role of agent in a situation that truly lacks one. We tend to assume the role when something tragic happens to us or someone we love, and we think, if only I had, then this wouldn't have happened. In most cases, the control we think we could have exerted to prevent the tragedy is illusory, but the need to explain the why of the tragedy and a craving for agency will make it very hard for anyone to convince us that we are not in some way responsible for what happened. Another way this plays out is in gambling, from state lotteries all the way to Vegas. Lotteries rely on the illusion of control for their very existence. Many lottery players are convinced that the numbers they have picked, as opposed to those randomly generated by a machine, are better numbers because they were selected by the player. If the player skips a day without playing those numbers and they come in, he's probably going to find the nearest ledge to jump from. So he plays his hand-picked numbers over and over and over again. He is operating under the illusion that he has control over the probability of the numbers coming in, but in truth, he has not changed the odds of winning at all. Casinos take advantage of similar thinking. The next time you go to a casino, ask a few people playing slot machines how they plan to win it big. What you will hear from some is that they have a system for winning the slots, and as long as they stick to the system, they will eventually win big money. Again, they are operating under the illusion that they can positively change the outcome with a formula for success. Unfortunately for them, the only real formula for success is to stop playing. Part 2. Drifting, Discounting, and Escaping Chapter 3. Why a happy brain discounts the future. I never think of the future. It comes soon enough. Unknown. Your supervisor calls you one morning and tells you that she is heading up a new initiative. She describes in fine detail what this initiative entails, why the company is allocating a budget for it, and each of the expected outcomes. Eventually, she comes around to the question you thought might be lurking from the second you answered the call. Would you be willing to take a major role in the new effort? The problem is that your docket of projects is already teetering on unmanageable, and that situation won't be changing anytime soon. You explain this to your supervisor, who tells you that she understands, but, she adds, what she'll need you to begin doing on the new initiative won't kick off for at least six months. It is your choice, she emphasizes, and if you decide not to participate, it won't be held against you. The work you do on a daily basis is valued, and that will not change. However, you think to yourself, if I do take on the new role, I'll be that much more valuable in the organization. And since the role won't start for at least six months, it seems like passing on this opportunity might be a mistake. So you say, yes, you'll commit to taking on the new role in addition to your existing work. You end the call feeling good about the impression you've just made and go about your work as you normally do. A little more than six months later, you receive an email from your supervisor with a long bulleted list of assignments, all due within two weeks that you are expected to complete as a key participant in the new initiative. Your existing workload is still immense, as you predicted it would be six months ago, and now you have an overwhelming responsibility on top of it. The panic alarms sound, and you mentally flog yourself for taking on the new role half a year earlier when you knew you'd be swamped. What were you thinking? Whenever we are presented with a commitment that is a long way off, our normal tendency is to downplay the commitment, particularly if an immediate reward is involved. In the preceding story, the immediate reward was a favorable reaction from the supervisor, which the employee believed would make him all the more valuable an asset. But when the commitment materialized, the employee's fear that he would be overloaded was proven out. Now what? His performance across all his projects is likely to suffer because he said yes months before. Future is uncertain. When presented with distant commitments, we stumble on the difficulty our brains have placing us in the future with any degree of accuracy. Because our brains evolved to make determinations about our existing environments and predict immediate threats and rewards, 
It's a stretch to gain perspective even a few weeks into the future. As important, our brains are always quite happy to capitalize on an immediate reward. When combined, the challenge to gain future perspective and the desire for immediate reward sets us up for a range of problems. Economists call this tendency hyperbolic discounting. People selling high-ticket items leverage these tendencies all the time to sell cars, houses, timeshare units, and the like. When you are haggling with a car salesperson, take note that the figure she or he will focus on is the monthly payment. If you attempt to move the conversation away from the monthly payment, note that the salesperson will try to pull it back to that point. The reason is that if the more immediate issue, what you will pay every month, becomes palatable, the long-term issue, what you will be paying, including interest, years from now, will be overshadowed. So if you really can't afford a particular car, the salesperson's goal is to put you into it via other means, namely by finagling the monthly cost over time to make you feel good about the purchase. Note also that the financing of the car is handled in another room by another salesperson. That person's job, adjunct to the first salesperson, is to maximize the car dealership's stake in your purchase while keeping you hooked. So again, if you really can't afford the car, perhaps instead of a five-year loan, you'll be placed on a six-year loan. Whether you agree to five or six years doesn't seem like a very big difference from where you are standing right now. That you will be paying a full 12 more months of interest, potentially thousands of dollars, doesn't outweigh the immediate reward of driving off the lot with the brand new car. The second salesperson's job is also to plug as many products, such as warranties, as possible into your sale and stretch them out accordingly to keep you focused on what you want in the short term. And above all else, the salesperson must keep you there to make the sale that day. For the simple reason that taking additional time to consider the long-term commitment will darken the rosy hue of the short-term reward. Selling is a game of momentum that leverages your brain's penchant for immediacy to close the deal, whether or not it was truly in your best interest. Perhaps the most salient example of this tendency in action is something that frequently happens among friends and family members and, unfortunately, often injures those relationships. Someone asks a friend or family member for help, let's say moving from one city to another. The move won't take place for several months, but it will require at least two full days of nonstop work to complete. In the moment the request is made, the person being asked for help likely wants to please the other, or perhaps feels obligated to say yes. In either case, the brain of the person being asked is seizing upon an immediate reward, gratification from satisfying the other person's need for help, or gratification from escaping the friction of evading a sense of obligation. This is an important point, because we usually think of a reward as getting something but it can also be derived from avoiding something unpleasant. The issue, of course, is not that the person being asked to help shouldn't want to help, but that it's very easy to overcommit oneself in the moment, and the consequences of overcommitment may be far worse than saying no up front. When the commitment eventually becomes a present reality, we're often left wondering how we could have committed ourselves when we have so many other competing commitments vying for our time and attention. Evolution isn't directed by the interpersonal concerns of humans. Unlike our primate cousins, whose world is respectably complex but much more straightforward than ours, we have the added challenge of tailoring our responses to our expansive and complicated social environment. We place value on honoring our commitments, and failing to do so is viewed as a debit against one's character. What made our brains happy at the front end of a commitment tunnel may very well be what hurts us and others at the other end. All the more reason that we exercise a sort of cerebral restraint before satisfying the initial urge to collect our reward in whatever form it takes. Death by urgency. Another way this tendency plays out has nothing to do with pleasing others or feeling gratified from escaping the friction of no, and everything to do with clearing our mental and tangible desktop. Generations of corporate denizens, to pick on just one portion of society, have fallen victim to the syndrome of urgency that sacrifices sound long-term decision-making in favor of a get-it-done mentality. Faced with multiple deadlines and a lack of resources to address them all, It's easy to make quick decisions on matters in which the outcome won't materialize for a period of time long enough to mollify our anxiety. Consider the example of a junior staffer responsible for arranging a dinner for a group of clients in a city several states away, which will take place after a business conference five months from now. He has many other projects in front of him, with deadlines he must meet in a matter of days and weeks. Instead of conducting the full due diligence on the client dinner to make sure the venue is appropriate and well-regarded and all the planning logistics are addressed, He makes a hasty decision and picks the first restaurant he comes across in his search. Unfortunately for him, when the dinner actually takes place months later, the clients are aghast at how badly it goes, from the setting to the food to the service, and their impression irrevocably rubs off on the firm, resulting in a loss of business and revenue. 
All this transpired because on one busy afternoon, an employee made a quick decision so he could reap the mental reward of clearing it off his desktop. In the long view, early gratification led to a negative impact on his company and likely on his job. We shouldn't be so hard on the junior staffer. After all, he was reacting in an understandable way to a pressure overload. From the information before him, his brain calculated a series of outcomes and estimated a reasonable chance of success for the dinner months in the offing. That calculation redirected resources toward the urgencies of the coming days, a reward in itself, no doubt. And the outcome of the decision was so far in the distance that it could barely compare to the outcomes he would experience if deadlines dropped in the short term. You can imagine a thousand similar examples with a thousand unfortunate victims, and in each case, we would find the decision scale balancing toward immediacy. But short-term thinking is not the only problem, as we'll discuss next. What I feel now and think I'll feel later. If I had been in that situation, I would have. It's a tired old saw, but all of us have said it at one time or another. And when we say it, we mean it. We are convinced that if we had been in the same situation as someone else, we would have acted differently, i.e. more effectively. My favorite gadfly of this effect is a television show called What Would You Do? that places people in difficult, emotionally charged situations and uses hidden cameras to document how they react in the heat of the moment. In one case, an actor plays the role of an employee at a restaurant who hurls racist insults at particular customers, also actors, while other customers look on. Some of the people intervene, but most do not. Instead, they either pretend to ignore the travesty or just watch, dumbstruck and speechless. The host of the show eventually stops the mayhem and tells everyone that they are a part of a TV show. He then asks both the people who intervened and the ones who didn't why they acted as they did. It can be uncomfortable to watch those who did nothing explain why they didn't act, and it is all too easy to imagine that we would have been one of the good guys. What psychology research suggests, however, is that all of us watching that show really have no idea how we would react in a similar situation, unless we have already been in one a lot like it. We falter on something psychologists call the intensity bias, which simply means that we are poor forecasters of our emotional reactions. A related bit of psychology jargon is moral forecasting, how effective we are at predicting how morally we will act in a given situation. When we are in a non-emotionally charged state, like watching a TV show in the comfort of our living room, we can imagine any number of ways we might react. But all these future projections are concocted without the presence of emotions we would actually feel in an intense situation. A similar thing happens when we make a short-term decision without a long-term perspective. In the short term, we are processing a decision that is unplugged from how we will actually feel in the long term. Sometimes this works out fine, particularly if the outcome of the decision goes well. The hypothetical employee really could reap major benefits from taking on the new project, even though it will be painful to complete. Other times, our future forecasting handicap results in problems for us and for others. And though hindsight will tell a different story, we seldom see the problems coming. And then there is the question of whether we were really paying attention in the first place are floating among the clouds. We'll address that topic next. Chapter 4. The Magnetism of Autopilot All that is gold does not glitter. Not all those who wander are lost. J.R.R. Tolkien, The Fellowship of the Ring Time Traveling Homeward You are driving home one night after work, later than typical, with a lot on your mind lingering from a busy day. Most of your 30-minute drive is on the highway, and as you get on the road, you are pleased to see that traffic is lighter than usual. The tape of the day's tensions and demands replays in your mind. You think back to an especially awkward interaction you had with a coworker who seemed to be accusing you of sabotaging one of his projects. At least his words struck you that way in the moment. You weren't sure how to respond, so you went with your gut and reacted defensively. With a few hours of reflection, though, you can't help but wonder if perhaps you overreacted. You replay his words, facial expressions, and tone of voice to pick up on anything you may have missed. From his point of view, the situation must have appeared different than how you were seeing it. Why else would he accuse you of something so ridiculous? Plus, he's usually a reasonable guy, and... You find yourself driving down the street to your house, your driveway now in clear view. If the scenario sounds and feels familiar to you, you're not alone. All of us have felt like we've lost time at some point and can't figure out how we got from here to there without remembering a minute of the transit. When you caught yourself, you probably experienced a jolt of anxiety about what might have gone wrong while you were on autopilot, driving off the side of the road, for example, or running someone over. Why our brains are happy to switch on autopilot is a topic of intense interest to cognitive scientists. The latest consensus is that most of us are mentally elsewhere between 30 and 50 percent of our waking hours. Equally striking is the finding that underlies the percentages. 
Being a space cadet appears to serve an important adaptive function. But like so many adaptive functions, the more we indulge it, the more we are likely to take a fall. Built to wander. The theory of a specific neural structure behind mind wandering is only a decade or so new. Until then, a handful of researchers, most notably Jerome Singer at Yale, suspected that daydreaming was more than a mere bug in the cerebral system and served a useful purpose. But hard evidence to support the theory wasn't available. Brain imaging has helped fill out the picture by showing which brain areas fire up when we're wandering off. Specifically, a web of neurons, dubbed the default network, spanning three brain regions, the medial prefrontal cortex, the posterior cingulate cortex, and the parietal cortex, are activated when our brain flips on autopilot. When we're not focused on something capable of holding our interest, the network is triggered. Or, in another view, it's always on in the background, but only takes first chair in our brains when we're not focused on anything in particular. Several theories offer possible explanations as to why such a network exists, but the most compelling, in my view, is that the default network is integral to our sense of self. Imagine a world in which your attention was always focused outward. Your mind would be effectively externalized, as you would have no opportunity to explore your internal landscape. You would never connect with the you within the you that interacts with the external world. You would also be unable to process information without focusing on it directly. The default network appears to allow us to digest data as we wander, and quite possibly while we sleep. The old adage to sleep on a problem and wake up with an answer is not baseless. In a very real sense, our brains are capable of problem solving in default mode. Quoting the brilliant comedian John Cleese on this point, When I was in college, I would go to bed at night with a problem, and when I woke up, not only was the solution to the problem immediately apparent to me, but I couldn't even remember what the problem had been the previous night. I couldn't understand why I did not see what the solution was. We also know that the default network is triggered by increased stress, boredom, chaotic environments, and sleepiness. And according to research by Harvard psychologist Daniel T. Gilbert, we report being less happy when in mental default, even though, according to this study, our minds are wandering 46% of the time. It's difficult to say why we are not especially jubilant in default, but the fact that mind wandering often includes replaying stressful situations probably has a lot to do with it. Whether or not we assess ourselves as happy in autopilot, what is clear is that our brains are happy to go there. All other things being equal, our noggins will drift ethereal without fail. On the upside, research points to a strong link between mind wandering and creativity. This seems especially true for those of us who can pull ourselves out of our daydreams at will. The ability to retreat into the clouds and come back down to terra firma may be one of the more effective self-preserving functions we possess enabling us to extract ourselves from unhealthy environs and relocate in mental space of our choosing. In that space, we are less constrained to envision creative solutions to problems or simply allow ourselves to paint boundless images across our mental canvas. The philosopher Bertrand Russell touches on this point in his book, The Conquest of Happiness, when he said, The man who can forget his worries by means of a genuine interest in, say, the history of stars, will find that when he returns from his excursion into the impersonal world, He has acquired a poise and calm that will enable him to deal with his worries in the best way. Lost in Default Overindulgence in our brain's tendency to wander is, however, a potentially debilitating problem. Psychologists have even coined a phrase to describe it, obsessive rumination. Those of us who obsessively ruminate are prone to lose ourselves in other worlds of our creation. Those worlds and the freedom they provide have a compulsive quality not unlike the escapism of role-playing, which we'll be discussing in the next chapter. What also seems true is that rumination comes in more than one flavor, some more directed than others. While you may be able to more or less manage the flow of thought as your mind glides, I might find myself drifting aimlessly. The greater the degree of direction one is able to exert on the mind's wanderings, the greater one's ability to pull out from the drift and come back to the here and now as Russell describes. That is much harder to do than it sounds, chiefly because the default network's activity is strongest when we don't know we are drifting. That was the finding of researchers from the University of British Columbia studying the neural tripwires that jettison our attention. The deeper and more complex our drift into the ether becomes, the more our mind space is consumed. Worth noting, something very similar happens when we drink alcohol. Have you ever had a couple drinks and your mind started wandering in a booze-induced haze? If you can't remember that happening, that's probably because you had a couple drinks. Research suggests that alcohol is the dual effect of causing our minds to wander while not noticing that we have zoned out which is essentially an amplified version of our normal tendency to drift. And as we've seen, our brains really don't need any help going there. Research indicates that those who obsessively ruminate tend to dwell on negative thoughts and emotions. 
There is, in fact, a strong correlation between this kind of rumination and depression. Repeating mistakes, hurtful remarks, stressful situations, and the like over and over again in the mind is like being stuck in a self-defeating movie of our making, starring us. And when the movie starts, it is hard to turn off, largely because our penchant for the drift, even when filled with dark thoughts, is built into our brains. Right alongside that tendency is one we'll discuss next, the drive for the great escape. Chapter 5, Immersion and the Great Escape Beware lest you lose the substance by grasping at the shadows. Aesop, Aesop's Fables, The Dog in the Shadow When the web was young I distinctly remember the first day I saw the graphical World Wide Web. It's one of those where-were-you-when moments that usually append a historic tragedy, but in this case it was the unveiling of a technology that would change the world in ways both fantastic and tragic. It was 1993, and I was in the University of Florida Interactive Media Lab where a small group of classmates and I convened to witness what at the time was described as a graphical overlay for the World Wide Web, called Mosaic. Only a minority of people knew such a thing as the World Wide Web existed at all. In its monochrome, all-text form, there was little in it to excite the masses. Information hounds and users of bulletin board systems, think of 2400 baud modems, had patronized the network for some time. But for the world to take notice, something bigger had to happen something expansive well beyond the interests of techno-savvy enclaves. Well, big happened, and then some. We were floored, speechless, almost unbelieving as the images scrolled before our eyes. As students of media technology absorbed in the history of mediation and the future potential of the new media, all of us knew we were witnessing the micro-explosion of a technological Big Bang. Less evident at the time was how this new universe would affect entire populations. Indeed, successive generations of populations across the physical world. How could anyone have known? The chronicles of media, while littered with history-altering shifts, had little to say about the effects of a deeply immersive technology, particularly one with powers of organic growth rivaling the speed and potency of thought itself. A multitude of predictions were made, of course, and this chapter couldn't hold them all. For our purposes, one matters more than the rest, though the decades since that day in 1993 have proven it an inadequate forecast at best. But before we discuss immersive e-media and its consequences, I want to zip back in time a couple decades before Mosaic shook the world, before technologically enabled escapism was the only game in town. These were the days of Dungeons and Dragons, played out of books, actual paper books, with dice, pencils, and paper. Arguably the most immersive gaming experience ever invented up to that point. D&D, as it was called, was to outsiders frightening, bordering, and dangerous. To some, it was simply diabolical. Every few months, a news story about a D&D playing teenager jumping off a building or stabbing another teenager implicated the game as the insidious influencer. Christian television was brimming with scathing sermons about the game Lucifer himself must have crafted. Most of these reactions, religious and sectarian, were overblown rants. D&D was the target du jour for anyone with a pulpit or soapbox, and more than a few of the criticisms against it were little more than silly. But what was plainly true is that D&D did enable something undeniably powerful an immersive experience with a rabidly compulsive quality. The formula for successful role-playing in any form is to empower participants to assume an identity as far removed from their day-to-day identities as they wish and provide a dynamic, interactive world for them to explore. While the parameters of physical existence are all too apparent, the new identity is beginning a virtually limitless existence. The appeal of living, in effect, another life, one that consumes the same cranial space as the one that requires breathing air and drinking water, cannot be understated. And it should be noted that each of us comes equipped to spin off identities separate from the one consuming most of our waking hours. And these identities find a way to emerge, whether via role-playing or other experiences that fit the need. For example, the you who curses other drivers up and down the highway is probably not the you who behaves diplomatically at the office. In this sense, taking on new identities via media immersion in any form is not an extraordinary stretch for our brains. It just happens that some forms of immersion are more compelling than others. Despite what now seem like anachronistic tools, D&D was to role-playing what the Macintosh was to desktop publishing. Players, and in my early teens I was one of them, invested mental energy in the game at a level unappreciated by anyone who had not personally become immersed in the fantastic worlds that were instantly accessible when a new game module was opened. With years to digest and reflect on the experience, What playing D&D taught me most is that our brains are quite capable of participating in split existences, at least to a point. It is this point that deserves the most attention, 
because immersive e-media have blurred the distinction between existences beyond what anyone might have predicted in the early days of role-playing. It would have been hard to imagine, for example, thousands of internet cafes strewn across Southeast Asia, packed with patrons 24 hours a day. And few would have looked down the road and seen parents abandon their children in favor of virtual children, whom they nurture online day and night, while their real children die of malnutrition and dehydration in the same room. Could anyone have envisioned a problem big enough that a government would issue laws that force establishments with internet access to close up shop at night to prevent online junkies from never leaving? These are not fictional examples. South Korea and Vietnam, among other countries, are struggling with how to handle online role-playing addiction to little avail. When it comes to e-media immersion, we walk an extremely fine line. Unfortunately for us, some more than others, our brains lean toward the wrong side of that line, and the consequences can be severe. And so it is with many other activities that seem to navigate their way into our brains so quickly that we fail to notice that it's happening. Why does our brain seem to want more of what ultimately isn't best for us? Perilous Strolls Down the Compulsion Pathway To adequately tackle the issue of compulsive e-media use, or any compulsive behavior, we need to take a few minutes and dive into what cognitive science research tells us about why our brains are prone to these behaviors to begin with. Right up front, a qualifier to this discussion is in order. Quoting clinical psychologist and psychoanalyst Todd Essig, while all addictions become compulsive, not all compulsions are addictions. This is a crucial point because it is too easy to put all compulsive activity into the same oversimplified bucket and ignore the differences, something popular media does habitually. Again, quoting Dr. Essig, non-addictive compulsions can really screw up a life as much as can being a junkie, hand-washing, walking backwards, calorie restrictions, body modifications, facial tics, plastic surgery, etc. Whether sleepless Korean denizens of video game parlors are more like junkies or like people with OCD or Tourette's, or are victims of habit reinforcement run amok, is still very much an open question. So the distinction between claiming someone is addicted to immersive media or is compulsively drawn to it is one worth acknowledging. What we know is that our brains are equipped with a reward center that serves to adaptively motivate behaviors that benefit our species. These behaviors include every rudiment of survival, nourishment, care of the young, and sex, to name a critical few. And they include behaviors that help us thrive in our environment, what we can loosely describe as achievement motivators. Without this motivation and drive to seek out pleasurable experience, we would be a very dreary and endangered species. This reward center, called the mesolimbic reward center, while indispensable to us, is not unlike an unprotected power grid in that it can be hijacked and tapped into from external forces. These forces make use of the same reward circuitry that benefits us in so many ways. And this circuitry, called incentive salient circuitry, or ISC, adaptively responds just as it does to accommodate beneficial rewards. The problem is that the new rewards imprinting the ISC are generally not beneficial. But our brains suffer a sort of reward distinction blindness, and new imprints are integrated into the grid. When the reward center is overwhelmed by disadvantageous reward imprinting, we say that someone is addicted to a substance or behavior. At this point, the reward center is in a state of malfunction, a tenaciously difficult problem to reverse. As the neural underpinnings of addiction have been better understood, so has the understanding that the common denominator in all compulsive behaviors is a malfunctioning reward center. Whether drug abuse, gambling, overeating, or sexual behavior is the culprit, the same underlying dynamic facilitates compulsive continuation and intensification of the behavior. Early neuroscience research on addiction used our friends the rats to test the theory that stimulation of the reward center can become compulsive. Tiny electrodes were inserted into the part of the rat's brains thought to be responsible for motivating pleasure-seeking behavior. The rats were then trained to press a bar that activated the electrodes, giving them a hit to the reward center. Before too long, it became apparent that the rats more than enjoyed the hit because they wouldn't stop pressing the bar. In fact, they would not eat, drink, sleep, or have sex as long as the bar was available. Many collapsed from exhaustion, and the rats not forced to eat starved themselves to death. But they never gave up the bar. This explains much about why meth and crack addicts are willing to forego food, sleep, and sex to get more of the substance that their brain now craves the most. And it also suggests an explanation as to why parents would abrogate responsibility to nurture their own child so that they could continue receiving the overpowering reward of staying immersed online. Though the processes at play are not necessarily identical to those resulting from chemical addiction, it is clear that e-immersion is providing a reward, and that continuing to seek the reward, in this case continuing to raise a mystical child online, has become compulsive. 
The more the reward is sought, the more the compulsive behavior is reinforced. The neurochemical currency at play in these and all addiction scenarios is dopamine. Specifically, dopamine receptor activity in a part of the brain called the ventral tegmental area, VTA. Often called the reward neurotransmitter, dopamine is essential to our survival, but a potent enemy within when our brain's reward circuitry is overwhelmed with the wrong kinds of rewards. Clearly, some people are more susceptible to compulsive behavior than others. A genetic component cannot be denied. But what's alarming is that anyone's brain can theoretically become addicted to a substance or behavior, given enough exposure. And once that happens, the addiction pathways are open to accommodate additional compulsive behaviors, which is why addictions to narcotics and sexual behavior or gambling often present in the same person. Said another way, the brain's incredible plasticity, its uncanny ability to adaptively change, can ensnare us from the inside out. Which brings us back to life online. The reason I am choosing to focus primarily on immersive e-media in this chapter, and less on the droves of other compulsive behaviors any of us could trip on, is simply because it is ubiquitous. Indeed, ubiquitous at an unprecedented level, and will only become more so. We have seen only the beginning of the expanding online universe, and also because research indicates that immersive e-media are an effective compulsivity accelerant. In his book, iBrain, Dr. Gary Small, director of the UCLA Memory and Aging Research Center at the Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior, explains that particularly for those bringing compulsive tendencies to the technology, the results can be severe. Quoting Dr. Small, Someone with obsessive compulsive tendencies is already predisposed to a range of addictive behaviors, and technology has a way of accelerating that process. This is an important point because it is unclear what percentage of the population is predisposed to compulsivity disorders, although some estimates put the numbers as high as 50 million people in the United States alone. Even half that estimate represents a significant percentage of the population in just one country, to say nothing of the developed world overall. One reason for this hyper-compulsivity effect may be the neural rewards gained from the sense of belonging many of us get from online interaction. Scott Kaplan, associate professor in the Department of Communication at the University of Delaware, commented on this subject. The research suggests that people who prefer online social interaction over face-to-face interaction also score higher on measures of compulsive Internet use and using the Internet to alter their moods. In 2007, Kaplan conducted a study of 343 undergraduate students to determine the major variables contributing to problematic Internet use, or PIU, to use the standard term. He examined personality-related variables such as loneliness and social anxiety, but also potentially compulsive activities like playing video games online, viewing pornography, and Internet gambling to determine which stoked the fires of compulsive use the most. Of these variables, social anxiety emerged as the strongest. The argument I've made in my research is that individuals who have problems with face-to-face interactions are drawn to the unique features of being online, Kaplan adds. As they develop a preference for online social interaction, my hypothesis is that they begin to use these channels for mood regulation, which becomes compulsive. Admittedly, it is important not to paint everyone with the same digital brush. Just as with exposure to alcohol or gambling, some people are bitten and begin the compulsive drive immediately. Others seem unaffected even after deep exposure. This is undoubtedly also true of life online. One crucial difference, however, is the extent to which larger swaths in nearly every age group of the population are exposed to immersive e-media versus most other potentially compulsive behaviors. It is yet unclear what the long-term effects of such broad exposure will be. What is clear is that there is enough research-based evidence to warrant a cautious, though not paranoid, approach to the future of life online. The Brain That Wants to Belong Some of this evidence comes from studying the former heavyweight champion of e-media, television. Since the 1970s, psychological research of television's effects have scarcely abated, even as the Internet began swallowing larger and larger portions of our attention. As it turns out, television has admirable staying power as an attention grabber, despite how many other diversions emerge. And because it has been with us for so long, a relative eternity compared to the online world, it is still one of our best sources for finding out how e-media affects our brains. One research team engaged a topic by asking whether we can become emotionally entangled with fictional characters on a TV screen. Four studies conducted by researchers at the University of Buffalo tested the social surrogacy hypothesis, which holds that humans can use technologies like television to feel a sense of belonging that they're lacking in their physical lives. And not only TV, but movies, music, and video games can fill this need as well, according to the theory. The experiments measured different categories of emotional reaction like self-esteem, belongingness, loneliness, rejection and exclusion, 
and responds to descriptions of subjects' favorite TV programs. In one of the experiments, 222 undergraduate students were asked to write a 10-minute essay about their favorite TV shows, and then to write about TV programs they watch when nothing else is on, or about the experience of achieving something noteworthy in school. Afterward, they were asked to verbally describe what they had written in as much detail as possible. The results, after writing about their favorite TV shows, participants verbally expressed fewer feelings of loneliness and exclusion than when describing the filler TV shows or the experience of academic achievement. The takeaway is that surrogate relationships with characters or personalities in TV programs can fill emotional needs. Another of the experiments produced results suggesting that thinking about a favorite TV show buffers against drops in self-esteem and feelings of rejection that accompany the end of a relationship, an electronic vaccine for heartbreak. These results buttress a psychological concept that most people would admit scares them a little, technology-induced belongingness. That spending a half hour with our favorite imaginary personalities can turn on our love lights seems a bit strange, but may be truer than we're willing to admit. Reality and fiction are only pixels apart. Results like those from the study just described spark a crucial question. How does the brain distinguish between reality and fiction? And more important, does the brain distinguish between reality and fiction? This question served as a jumping-off point for another study conducted at the Max Planck Institute for Human Brain and Cognitive Sciences, which attempted to identify how the brain responds when exposed to contexts involving real people or fictional characters. The research followed up on a similar study conducted in 2008 titled Meeting George Bush versus Meeting Cinderella, the neural response when telling apart what is real from what is fictional in the context of our reality. In the present study, researchers used functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, to evaluate subjects' brain regions, specifically the anterior medial prefrontal and posterior cingulate cortices, AMPFC, PCC, while they were exposed to contexts involving three groups. One, family and friends, identified as a high-relevance group. Two, famous people, medium relevance. And three, fictional characters, low relevance. The working hypothesis was that exposure to context with a higher degree of relevance would result in stronger activation of the AMPFC and PCC. In previous studies, the AMPFC and PCC were shown to play a large role in self-referential thinking and autobiographical memory, essentially the me part of your brain. The idea behind the present hypothesis is that information about real people, as opposed to fictional characters, is coded in the brain in such a way that it elicits a self-referential and autobiographical me response. The more personally relevant the context is, the stronger the response. The results were consistent with the hypothesis, showing a pattern of activation in which higher relevant subjects were associated with stronger AMPFC and PCC responses. This result also held true for several other brain regions to varying degrees. In other words, for our brains, reality equals relevance. But then how do we end up merging with fictional or virtual personalities on TV or a computer screen? For the answer, we have to delve into what relevance really means in our day-to-day -day lives. The truth is many of us spend more time connecting with personalities online and on TV than we do with people physically in our presence. Social neuroscientist John Cassiapo, whose research on loneliness has opened new doors to understanding this darkest of emotions, has observed that we live in an age of constant interaction, and yet more of us are claiming we're lonely than ever before. Loneliness, Cassiopo points out, has nothing to do with how many people are physically around us, but has everything to do with our failure to get what we need from our relationships. The research tells us that virtual personalities online and characters on television are surrogates for emotional need fulfillment, and hence occupy the blurry margins in which our brains have difficulty distinguishing real from unreal. The more we rely on these personalities and characters for a sense of connectedness, the more our brains encode them as relevant. All this can be said another way. Our brains can be tricked, and the irony is that we're complicit in the trickery. As need-driven animals, we seek out the paths of least resistance to get what we need, in whatever form we can find. And electronic immersion provides the most accessible, non-chemical path yet invented. Parting thoughts. The ongoing debate about media effects, flanked by extremes on both sides, is always a couple inches away from falling into irremediable silliness. Media in any form does not, strictly speaking, cause any human behavior. To suggest otherwise is to endorse the old blank slate notion of human nature that was abandoned a long time ago. We bring a complex array of psychological variables to the media experience, and it's the interplay between what we bring and what we see, hear, and read that yields influences on our thinking and behavior. For some, these influences will be subtle and virtually unnoticeable. 
For others, they can be significantly more pronounced and damaging. We also have to remember that people choose to immerse themselves in any form of media, or truly anything else. While the reward system is open to hijacking by external forces, there is always an original motivation for role-playing and other forms of escapism. A full explanation of why people go there in the first place is well beyond the scope of this audiobook. The big takeaway is that we are living in a world with ever more compulsive diversions, and that is only going to intensify in the years ahead. Careful consideration of the outcomes, as opposed to paranoia or blanket indulgence, is not such a bad idea. Part 3. Motivation, Restraint, and Regret Chapter 6. Revving Your Engine and Idle Thunder is good, thunder is impressive, but it is lightning that does the work. Mark Twain, from a letter to an unidentified person. Beating the system like a drum. I'd like to introduce you to a most unlikely master of industry. We begin by observing Mike in high school. He is, to use the vernacular of the 80s, a total burnout. He misses classes and chronically shows up late for the ones he does attend. The only thing he makes sure never to miss are parties. At those, he's a fixture. He sleeps very little and parties very hard, and he's a thread shy of being kicked out of school. What almost no one realizes about this young man is that he really does have a quite lofty aspiration. He wants to learn everything there is to know about lasers. From a very young age, he was fascinated with light, from flashlights to fluorescence, and was endlessly curious about how they worked. School bores him. His real education, as far as he's concerned, comes from reading what he wants to read. Sometimes he spends hours at the local library reading books about laser technology. How it works, its applications, its future. The other thing just a few people know about him is that he's a textbook lazy genius, an underachiever par excellence. While he struggles to get C's in school, he aces standardized tests without the least preparation. And that's how he gets to college, where, with more freedom to learn what he wants to learn, he does exceptionally well. So well, in fact, that he's offered a spot in a laser tech graduate program at Carnegie Mellon University. He studies with some of the most renowned laser experts in the world. While still in school, he starts his first business developing specialized lasers for computer hardware companies. He eventually starts three more companies, each focused on development of customized laser applications. Today, he is one of the foremost laser experts in the world and the pioneer of path-breaking laser applications most of us can barely imagine. His companies work with the largest corporations on the planet. In a very real sense, he is helping to design the future. Mike's story is an illustration that the systems we find ourselves in are not always best suited for our potential. Low achievers, even extremely smart ones, can become terminal failures if their passions and interests are not tapped. Educational systems accomplish this in some cases, but often they simply fail. That leaves people like Mike to either figure out how to work around the shortcomings of the system and themselves, or be left in the dust. Mike did it by focusing on the one thing that was always fun for him to learn about from an early age. To make matters more complicated, the happy brain is not natively structured to challenge the systems we inhabit. Think of a system, educational or otherwise, as an environment that has been built for people like us. Schools are, in fact, just that, designed environments for learning. Once we become part of that environment, our brains begin the work of mapping out the territory so that we can secure a niche. When that has been achieved, changing things up causes instability. And instability is a threat to the happy brain. So how does a chronic low achiever like Mike, or one of the other many examples out in the world, go from nearly not making it through high school to becoming a global master of industry? That question brings us to our first topic. Achievement for me, boring for you. With Mike's story as a backdrop, let's start with a question about what sort of achiever you are. If I asked you to place yourself somewhere along a spectrum, with the far left side representing quintessential slackerdom, and the far right side representing hyper-overachiever mania, where would you fall? We'll come back to that question in a minute. But first, let's talk about an age-old generalization. Everyone agrees that high achievers do many things well, particularly when they're convinced that excellence requires their utmost performance. Low achievers, as we also know, have a hard time getting motivated and often find themselves coughing in the dust of the high achiever's hustle. That's the generalization, and like all generalizations, this one has a definite limit. A study conducted by University of Florida researcher William Hart uncovered a variable that knocks this scenario on its head and has everything to do with what makes low achievers tick. Researchers conducted multiple studies to evaluate how participants' attitudes toward achievement influence their performance. In one study, participants were primed with high achievement words related to winning, excellence, etc. flashed on a computer screen. Each word appeared only for an instant, too fast for conscious deliberation. 
Participants with high achievement motivation perform significantly better on tasks after being primed with the words than those with low achievement motivation. In another study, participants completing word search puzzles were interrupted and then given a choice to either resume the task or switch to a task they perceived as more enjoyable. Those with high achievement motivation were significantly more likely to return to the puzzles than the underachievers. The results of those studies buttress what we generally know about high and low achievers. But the final study was a wicked curveball. Participants were primed with high achievement words, excel, compete, win, and then asked to complete a word search puzzle. But instead of describing the task as a serious test of verbal proficiency, the researchers called it fun. The results? Participants with high achievement motivation did significantly worse on the task than low achievers. The study authors believe that when high achievers are primed to achieve excellence, the idea that a task is fun undercuts their desire to excel. If something is enjoyable and fun, how could it possibly be a credible gauge of achievement? Conversely, low achievers who are similarly primed with achievement words perceive a fun task as worthwhile. Not only is their motivation to perform improved, so is their ability. This intriguing twist says much about why one-size-fits-all educational strategies so often fail. For students motivated to achieve excellence, making tasks entertaining may actually undermine their performance. Likewise, for those not normally motivated to achieve, Describing a task as urgent and serious yields a predictable result. Coming back to my initial question, whether your answer puts you closer to the low achiever or high achiever end of the spectrum, the takeaway is that trying to force yourself into a motivational mold not sized for your personality probably isn't going to work. Regrettably, many of the systems we find ourselves in, educational or otherwise, were designed without this knowledge, so it's usually up to us to figure out how to game our way into better performance. The crucial thing to remember is that your brain is not natively tuned to challenge the system. Going head-to-head with established conventions causes disruptions in stability and consistency, and that triggers alarms. You can heed those alarms and stay right where you are, or you can forge ahead and find a way to manage the conflict. For example, you may be the sort of person who finds getting motivated at work extremely difficult. You can fight through your lack of motivation as a matter of necessity, but it's a draining process that just doesn't seem like it should be so hard. It's time to more closely examine what sort of achiever you are and determine if the motivational dynamics you rely on are the best fit. If you think you're closer to the low achiever end of the spectrum, ask if you have enough enjoyment threaded through your projects. The remedy might be very simple, like listening to music while working. Or it might be more elaborate, like scheduling breaks in your planner to get out of the office at different points during the day and talking with a colleague about movies, music, or anything else that will inject a dose of fun into your day. Or you may need to audit your projects to identify ways to lighten your disposition toward their more mundane requirements. Push yourself to be creative in finding the solution. If you find yourself always well behind projects and chores at home, change your perspective and ask if you're having a hard time getting things done because you haven't engaged the right motivational cues for who you are. If you like gardening because it's a fun, laid-back pastime, but hate organizing your garage for obvious reasons, do a little fun-infused self-negotiation. On Saturday, agree to devote three hours to organizing the garage. On Sunday, you're not even going to think about the garage, but instead spend as much time cultivating your garden as you like. Spending time doing what you enjoy becomes, in effect, a reward for accomplishing what you don't. It's easy to get caught up in the popular mantra of achievement that simplistically assumes motivation is always available as long as the achiever has enough desire and will. The point is that lacking a hardwired desire to achieve does not mean you can't achieve, or even that you're achievement handicapped. The research indicates that you just need to be a little more creative. In doing so, the fight to reach your goals becomes less arduous and might even become something you like taking on. Remember, your brain is structured to take the path of least resistance, because that's the less threatening way to go. But it's usually not the one that will lead you to greater echelons of achievement. Competition and the size of your fishbowl. Now let's shift to another motivational vantage point and examine what sort of competitor you are. Are you a solo practitioner, or do you perform best when you can see your competition, sizing them up before battle? If you think you're in the second category, then you're just like most of us. Conventional wisdom has it that one of our mightiest competitive motivators is social comparison. We begin competing with others as soon as we compare ourselves to them. Whether the stakes are minuscule or massive, something in us wants to measure up inch for inch. Research conducted by University of Michigan professor of psychology Stephen Garcia shows, however, that our competitive urges don't engorge in a vacuum. It's not merely being among a group of competitors, but the number of competitors we're vying against that has a direct effect on our motivation to compete. Your brain isn't about to let you dive into competition without opening an opportunity for you to short-circuit your efforts and get back to a comfortable, non-competitive state of mind. 
Here's an illustration. Jessica takes a seat in a classroom with 10 other students. She looks around, evaluates the competitive landscape, and determines that her odds of doing well against this small group are good. The instructor passes out the particle physics exam, and Jessica is off and running, motivated to score among the best in this class. Jason arrives at a different room to take his exam, and it's a lot bigger than Jessica's. In fact, it's 10 times as big, and Jason has to find a seat in a crowd of 100 students. He looks around and gulps. There's no way to realistically compare himself to so many people. The instructor passes out the exam, and Jason begins without feeling a competitive edge. The lack of motivation that Jason feels, in comparison to Jessica's hyper-motivated resolve, is what psychologists refer to as the N effect, the effect that occurs when the number of total competitors results in diminished motivation for individual competitors. Researchers assess this effect through a series of five studies. The first examined SAT and CRT, cognitive reflective test, scores in light of how many people took the tests in given venues over multiple years. Even when controlling for other variables, researchers found a significant inverse correlation between the number of test takers and scores. The more people taking the test, the worse the scores. Another study examined whether test takers, told to finish the test as quickly as possible, would finish their test faster when competing against 10 others or when competing against 100. As predicted, the best scoring testers finish their test significantly faster when competing against a smaller group. Why self-awareness fuels motivation. What's the best way to keep the N effect from undermining your motivation to compete? As with many unconscious influences, the solution is to identify it early and critically dismantle its effect before you succumb. In other words, force yourself to exert more rational muscle than you would if blind to the influence. For example, let's say that you are interviewing for a job, and as you enter the office lobby, you see six other candidates awaiting interviews for the same position. As you take your seat, you think to yourself that if six others are there that day for the interview, then it's more than likely several others are interviewing as well making the total candidate pool far larger than you had expected. Your first reaction is that your chances of getting this job just took a harrowing drop. That thought leads to a jolt of intimidation, and your motivation is falling by the second. But you stop yourself right there and ask, if I didn't know how many other candidates were vying for this job, would I still be feeling this sudden drain on my motivation? What's really changed? The truth is that the only factor that has changed is your awareness that at least six others, and probably more, are competing against you. Does this observation make you any less competent, skilled, or experienced than you were when you agreed to the interview? Absolutely not. Your footing to compete at your highest level of ability need not slip an inch. Realizing this, you march into the interview and put everything you've got into getting the position. And as we're about to see, you'd also do well to believe that you will receive the results soon after you leave the building. Feedback. The faster, the better. Shifting just slightly to another vantage point. Let's talk about the role performance feedback plays in the motivational mix. A strong argument can be made for positive feedback increasing motivation and negative feedback dampening it. But an equally strong argument can be made that negative feedback increases motivation, at least for some of us, because it presents a challenge to overcome. There's little point debating this because depending on who you are, either argument might apply. What's not nearly as clear is the effect of when we receive the feedback, or more precisely, when we expect to receive it. Let's say that you're preparing for an extremely important test that you and roughly 100 other classmates will be taking in a week, or if you prefer an executive training program exam or certification exam, pick your poison. A few days before the test, you find out that your instructor will be going on a trip not long after the test is over and will be providing written and verbal feedback to the students within a day of the test. This is unusual, because ordinarily the instructor waits a week or more before providing feedback. About half the class finds out that they'll be getting rapid feedback, and the other half thinks they won't receive feedback for several days, per usual. Which group is more likely to perform better on the test? That question was investigated by University of Alberta researchers Carrie Kettle and Gerald Hubble, who hypothesized that the mere anticipation of proximate feedback would result in better performance on a test. Previous research has shown that when feedback is rapid, the threat of disappointment increases. The desire to avoid the dreary feeling you get when you fall short of expectations is a potent motivator to perform well. Students were recruited into the study by emails sent 1, 8, or 15 days prior to a nerve-wracking test of their performance, making a public presentation. The students were reminded of their presentation date and also told when they would receive a grade, which would be provided as a percentile score, 90th percentile, 70th percentile, etc., Then they were asked to predict their performance by selecting a grade rank from 1 out of 10 possible percentile grades. In all, 271 people ranging in age from 18 to 32 participated in the study. The results were consistent with the hypothesis. 
Participants who anticipated more rapid feedback scored the highest on the test. The surprising part was how significantly different the grades were for each group. Students who thought they'd receive rapid feedback performed 22 percentile ranks higher than students who thought they wouldn't receive feedback for several days, and this held true across the full range of scores. At the same time, predicted performance went in exactly the opposite direction. Students who predicted they would perform the best actually performed the worst. Students who predicted they'd perform the worst did the best. The reason for these results is that the students who fear disappointment the most, those who thought they'd receive immediate feedback, were more powerfully motivated to do well, while simultaneously reducing their personal expectations of performance to prep themselves for bad news. In other words, motivation to perform well and pessimistic expectations are not mutually exclusive. In fact, they seem to get along famously. The other students saw disappointment as a more distant possibility and were consequently less prepared for the test, even though they thought they'd do just fine. The takeaway here seems to me very practical. When you're about to face the test of performance in any walk of life, imagine that you'll receive feedback right away and act accordingly. The proximity of potential disappointment will keep you sharp and ready to perform. And don't feel bad if a bit of pessimism slips in to help you brace for impact. It's best to view that pessimism as your brain's way of alerting you to the possibility of failure, an unpleasant jolt to cerebral happiness. Stark Naked Commitment So far we've talked about the sort of achiever you are, the role of competition, and the effect of feedback timing. And in each case, we've seen that motivation tips up or down depending on a slew of variables that we can identify, and in doing so, give ourselves a better chance of capturing the magic. Now let's talk about whether going public with our intentions, as many motivational programs advise, really does amp up our motivation. For this, we use an example taken from the upper echelon of America's national obsessions, losing weight. Several of the most popular weight loss programs operate on the public commitment principle. Individuals are challenged to state publicly, which may simply mean in front of a small weight loss group, that they want to lose so much weight in a given time period. The commitment hinges on social pressure working against the possibility of failure. If someone doesn't succeed or at least makes substantial progress toward the goal, everyone will know it. On the face of it, this principle seems sound, since no one wants to be publicly embarrassed or viewed as a hypocrite. In practice, however, there's a hitch. For the public commitment principle to operate at full steam, its adherents must genuinely fear the disapproval of others, and that's simply not true of everyone. A study conducted by researchers Prashanth U. Nair and Stephanie DeLond investigated how public commitment affects individuals who fear social disapproval. That is, people with high susceptibility to what psychologists call normative influence, SNI, versus individuals who are not as easily influenced by others' opinions, low SNI. It also tested the efficacy of short-term versus long-term public commitment, as well as no public commitment. 211 women between the ages 20 and 45 were recruited for the study. They signed up for a 16-week weight loss program designed to help people lose 15 to 20 pounds and maintain weight loss over time. All subjects completed questionnaires that gauged SNI level and personal weight loss motivation. Subjects were then randomly separated into three groups, long-term public commitment, short-term public commitment, and no public commitment. Those in the long-term group wrote their names and weight loss goals on index cards that were publicly displayed in the fitness center for the full 16 weeks of the program. Those in the short-term group did the same, but the cards were displayed for only the first three weeks. Those in the no public commitment group did not fill out cards. At the conclusion of the study, the effect of long-term public commitment was evident. Those in the long-term group lost significantly more weight than the short-term and no commitment groups. At the 16-week mark, Subjects in the long-term group had, on average, exceeded their goals to the tune of 102%, while the short-term group achieved an average of 96% success, and the no-commitment group reached only 88%. The effect of SNI level was also evident. Subjects in the long-term group that tested as having low SNI, in other words, low susceptibility to social pressure, achieved an average of 90% of their weight loss goals. In contrast, individuals who tested as having high SNI exceeded their weight loss goals by a significant margin an average of nearly 105%. What this study tells us is that in general, the public commitment principle produces results, especially if the commitment is long-term. But in the mix of people who make the commitment, those who genuinely fear social disapproval, not a personality trait usually given very high marks, will likely succeed the most. Those who couldn't care less what others think are, ironically, more likely to come up short. Talking to your inner Bob. Are you the sort of person who routinely tells yourself that you probably can't achieve whatever it is you'd like to achieve? Does the voice in your head, the voice of a brain that craves stability, say things like, be realistic, you can't really do this? And perhaps fed up with positive talk mumbo-jumbo in the media, 
You think that the only self-talk worth listening to is the realistic kind, the kind that tells you how it is. Whatever your feelings about positive psychology and its many spin-offs, I'm here to tell you that credible research has something to say about all this, and your little voice should be listening. Research by University of Illinois professor Dolores L. Barrison and her team has convincingly shown that those who ask themselves whether they will perform a task generally do better than those who tell themselves that they will. But first, a slight digression. If you have young kids or even early teens, you may be familiar with the TV show Bob the Builder. Bob is a positive little man with serious intentions about building and fixing things. Prior to taking on any given task, he loudly asks himself and his team, can we fix it? To which his team responds, yes, we can. Now compare this approach with that of the little engine that could, whose oft-repeated success phrase was, I think I can, I think I can. In a nutshell, the research we're about to discuss wanted to know which approach works best. Researchers tested these two different motivational approaches with 50 study participants, first asking them to either spend a minute wondering whether they would complete a task or telling themselves they would. The participants showed more success on an anagram task, rearranging words to create different words, when they asked themselves whether they would complete it than when they told themselves they would. In another experiment, students were asked to write two seemingly unrelated sentences, starting with either I will or will I, and then work on the same anagram task. Participants did better when they wrote will followed by I, even though they had no idea that the word writing related to the anagram task. In other words, by asking themselves a question, people were more likely to build their own motivation than if they simply told themselves they'd get it done. The takeaway for us is that the little voice has a point, sort of. Telling ourselves that we can achieve a goal may not get us too far. Asking ourselves, on the other hand, may bear significant fruit. Retool your self-talk to focus on the questions instead of presupposing answers and allow your mind to build motivation around the question. Or take a shortcut and just remember the anthem of Bob the Builder. Parallel to the motivation issue is commitment to goals and the restraint required to reach them. We'll visit those topics in the next chapter. Chapter 7, Writing Promises on an Etch-A-Sketch I can resist everything except temptation. Oscar Wilde, Lady Windermere's fan. This time I really promise. Robert is a well-regarded pharmacologist who runs a clinic for diabetes patients in Orlando, Florida. Many patients of this clinic do not want to begin a regimen of insulin shots, due to the obvious reason, pain, and the stigma of having to take them, even though they have failed to control their blood glucose by other means. Weight loss offers the only real hope of eliminating their need for insulin, and patients will often beg for another chance to lose weight so they can avoid the need for shots. Nearly 100% of the time in the pharmacologist's experience, this cycle continues indefinitely or until he stops it. At each appointment, the patient will beg for another opportunity to begin losing weight and will express his or her seriousness this time, but very few ever follow through. There is always a reason they weren't able to do it the last time but they should be able to eat better, exercise more now that some small circumstances changed. We had family in town. I had a stressful situation with my sister. My job changed. I had a cold, etc. The cycle continues and their health worsens. Robert has an interesting technique he uses with patients caught in this cycle. He stops the game, so to speak, by taking the ball from the patient and initiating a negotiation. First, he clarifies with them whether they truly understand that they only have two options, lose weight or take insulin shots. When this is confirmed, he then asks them to commit to an amount of weight they intend to lose in the next month. The patient must come up with a number. He then asks them to commit to a particular day upon which they will be weighed to prove they lost the weight. Again, it's up to them to pick today. The important part about this step is that the patient is empowered to establish the goals. Then he asks them to firmly commit, then and there, that if they do not reach the goal by the date, they will begin taking insulin shots. Almost everyone at this point agrees to accept the terms of the negotiation. What Robert knows from years of experience is that 90% of the patients will not lose the weight, but because they, and not he, establish the goals and parameters, they will more easily accept the consequence. In effect, he is making them face their game, and by doing so, stops the cycle. If a patient does lose the weight, then all the better. But if not, at least he or she will willingly receive the necessary treatment. This is one example of chronic self-restraint failure and also an intervention strategy to prevent the consequences of the failure from causing even worse outcomes. If Robert took a hands-off approach to his patient's situations, the cycle would no doubt continue, and for many of his patients, the results would be catastrophic. Most of us don't have the luxury of relying on a skilled clinician like Robert to stymie the results of our self-control breakdowns, and what's worse is that our brains are not natively tuned to offer much assistance. As any yo-yo dieter knows, when you severely cut back on calories, 
Your brain responds by decreasing your caloric burn to keep you from starving to death. The fact that you are never in danger of starving to death doesn't matter. When you deprive your body of carbohydrates, as with a restrictive protein diet, you will eventually crave them to the point of hyperloading and gaining more weight than you lost on the diet. For every aggressive move we make, our brains have a counter move. Ironic, isn't it, since all the moves originate in the same place? Let's explore a few restraint quirks and follies and see if we can't get a better handle on the insanity. All the restraint you can eat. For six months, you have worked really hard to stick to a diet, and it's paying off. Not only have you lost weight, but now more than ever, you're better able to restrain your impulse to eat fattening foods. Your friends are telling you how impressed they are with your resolve. And truth be told, you are feeling pretty damn good about yourself as well. Which is why, around month seven, you decided that your impulse control is sufficiently strengthened that avoiding being around ice cream, nachos, chicken wings, soda, and all the other things you used to eat out with your friends is no longer necessary. You spent half a year changing the way you think about food, and it worked. Maintenance won't be difficult with a new mindset. Time to live again. I probably don't have to end the story for you to know how it turns out. It's a classic tragedy with which many of us are already too familiar. Pride comes before a fall, but even more often it's our sense of inflated self-restraint that precedes a tumble into relapse. Researchers from Stanford University, Northwestern University, and the University of Amsterdam teamed up to investigate the dynamics underlying why we repeatedly convince ourselves that we've overcome impulsiveness and can stop avoiding our worst temptations. This particular tendency toward self-deception is what psychologists call restraint bias. And four experiments were conducted under this study to test the hypothesis that it's rampant in our bias-prone species. In one of the experiments, people walking in and out of a cafeteria were approached with seven snacks of varying fattiness and asked to rank the snacks from least to most favorite. Once they finished ranking, participants were told to pick one snack and further told that they could eat it at any time they liked. But if they returned a snack to the same location in one week, they'd receive $5 and could also keep the snack. After choosing the snack, participants indicated if they would return it for the money and then filled out a questionnaire that assessed their hunger level and impulse control beliefs. Participants who were walking into the cafeteria said they were hungry and those leaving said they were full. So the first evaluation was whether those leaving with full stomachs would indicate stronger impulse control beliefs. And they did. The next evaluation was whether the not-hungry participants claiming the most impulse control would choose the most tempting and most fatty snacks. They did. Finally, would those who selected the most tempting snacks be least likely to return them a week later? Indeed, they were. In another experiment, heavy smokers were asked to take a test to assess their level of impulse control. The test was bogus, designed only to label roughly half of the participants as having a high capacity for self-control and half as having a low capacity. Being told which label they earned seated participants with a self-perception in either direction. Participants were then asked to play a game that pitted the temptation to smoke against an opportunity to win money. The goal of the game was to watch a film called Coffee and Cigarettes without having a cigarette. They could select among four levels of temptation, each with a corresponding dollar value. One, keep a cigarette in another room, earn $5. Two, keep a cigarette at a nearby desk, earn $10. Three, hold an unlit cigarette in their hand throughout the film, earn $15. Four, or hold an unlit cigarette in their mouth throughout the film, earn $20. Participants earn the money only if they avoided smoking the cigarette for the entire movie. As predicted, smokers told that they had high self-control exposed themselves to significantly more temptation than those told they had low self-control. On average, low self-control participants opted to watch the movie with a cigarette on the table. High self-controllers opted to watch with a cig in their hand. The result, the failure rate for those told they had high self-control was massively higher than for the low self-control group, to the tune of 33% versus 11%. Those who thought themselves most able to resist temptation had to light up three times as much as those who suspected they'd fail. One way to view these results is as reinforcement of a very old cliche. We're our own worst enemies. Restraint bias has a place high in the list of biases we stumble on routinely, and tripping on it once is no guarantee of not doing so again and again, and maybe again. Dieters relapse, smokers relapse, anyone with anything approaching a compulsion relapses usually more than once. This study suggests that part of this repetition is due to thinking we can handle more than we can. Another takeaway is that an entire industry is based on bolstering impulse control. Self-help books and motivational speakers aplenty play on a dubious concept, that there's a gold ring of restraint we can all reach. Just follow X system to get there. But what this study suggests is that even if you think you've arrived there, you'll eventually find out that there never existed. You were sold a mirage in the form of an inflated self-perception of restraint. Sorry, no refunds. Outsourcing self-control. 
Common among couples who have been together for several years is the phenomenon of being able to finish each other's sentences. After a while, it becomes one of those funny things couples do. And if you notice, the phenomenon is especially true when one of the partners is trying to remember something. The other partner fills in blanks in the discussion with pieces of memories the other can't recall. Psychologists studying how this works call it transactive memory, which simply means that over time, relationship partners are able to rely on each other to remember things. They become a memory duo, sharing certain memories that neither one of them can reconstruct in total. In light of the brain's energy conservation strategy, discussed more in Chapter 10, this arrangement makes a lot of sense. As it turns out, something similar happens with self-control, and the news about this is both good and bad. The good news is that transactive self-control evidences a strong bond between partners and probably contributes to reaching long-term goals, such as the discipline to get a degree. The bad news is that it appears to undermine short-term self-control goals, such as losing weight. That was a conclusion from a study conducted by psychologists at Duke and Northwestern Universities, testing the pros and cons of outsourcing self-control to romantically tied partners. The study showed that when someone expects a level of support from a partner to stick to a diet, for instance, that person will actually decrease their energy expenditure. The effect was especially strong for participants who were already worn out from other energy drains. Alongside that result, participants who relied on a partner for help with their studies procrastinated more than those who went it alone. The reason, returning to a common theme, is energy conservation. Our brains are huge energy consumers. 20% of our daily caloric intake fuels the brain, but stingy energy users. If an external resource is available to draw on instead of using stored energy, you can be certain the brain will want to tap it. Ironically, as this study suggests, doing so in the short term damages self-control by weakening our resolve to try as hard as we otherwise might. This result should not, by the way, be misconstrued to contradict the public commitment findings discussed in the last chapter. In that case, the commitment is reinforced by others holding us accountable to achieve a goal, not helping us in any substantial way to get the work done. Flavors of imagination that deny temptation. Think about chocolate, a nice big bar of especially delicious Belgian chocolate on a table in front of you, and it's all yours. Imagine unwrapping it, smelling the sweet chocolate aroma, breaking off a piece, and bringing it to your mouth for a taste of ecstasy. For most of us, aside from those who inexplicably don't like chocolate, that description will kick up a craving for chocolate or something sweet. In fact, studies on self-restraint have found that the description need not be nearly so detailed. In one study, simply imagining placing 30 M&Ms into a bowl significantly increased how many of the candies participants devoured afterward. But here's the twist. When participants in the study were told to imagine eating M&Ms, they actually ate less of them, 1.6 times less than the group that imagined placing them into a bowl. The reason seems to be that the brain's response to a conjured image of placing or eating M&Ms is much like its response to the real thing. The anticipation of eating the candy drives up temptation but the image of already chewing and swallowing M&Ms drains the energy out of the temptation. The problem, of course, is staving off temptation long enough to visualize eating the target of our sweet lust before pouncing on it. Far easier said than done. Oh, what the hell. Here is something I frequently see and admittedly do on business trips. A large group sits around the table at a nice restaurant and a couple of people order several appetizers for the table to share and a couple bottles of wine to start things off in style. The appetizers come along with baskets of bread, also passed around and devoured. Then orders for the meal are taken, and everyone gets a salad or soup to begin, followed by a steak or other rich dish. More wine follows. Afterward, most also order dessert and coffee to cap things off, if not a glass of port or grappa. Before these dinners, I typically tell myself that I will have no more than one small appetizer and pass on the bread. Then I will order a salad with a not-too-terrible dressing, followed by a semi-healthy dish, at least compared to most, like fish. No dessert. No more than one glass of wine. That's what I tell myself. But when the event begins, something peculiar happens. The appetizers arrive, and they look delicious, and I am hungrier than I expected, so I have two or three samplings. Then the bread comes around, and I think, well, I already ate more appetizers than I should have, so what the hell? Might as well have a roll. When ordering the entree, the what the hell effect elevates even more, and I just go ahead and order that juicy steak instead of fish. By this time, what the hell is the overriding sentiment, and having blown every self-control commitment so far, I feel fine about ordering dessert with coffee. Notice the degeneration of control and how with each slip-up, the following slip-ups become easier to make. And it's also important to note that the what-the-hell effect isn't just about self-control, but about failure to reach goals. Janet Polivy and her research team plumbed the depths of what-the-hell with an experiment featuring two delicious treats, pizza and cookies. The researchers invited 106 female participants to the study some of whom were dieting and others who weren't, 
under the pretense that they would be tasting and rating a variety of cookies. They were all told not to eat beforehand and were served one slice of pizza when they arrived. Exact same size peas for everyone. Then asked to sample and rate some cookies. Here's the twist. A portion of the participants were made to believe that they had received larger or smaller slices of pizza than others. Some of the women got to see another person's slice just before it was carried into that person's separate test room. The slice in question was either one-third larger or one-third smaller than the actual one that the experimental subject was given to eat. In other words, some people were made to think they'd eaten more than the others, although in reality, they'd all eaten exactly the same amount. Then three enormous platters were brought out with piles of oatmeal raisin, chocolate chip, and double chocolate chip cookies. The participants were told they could eat as many as they needed to rate the quality of the cookies. What they did not know was that the platters were weighed before and after they were brought out, so the researchers knew exactly how many cookies were eaten. When the cookies were weighed, it turned out that participants who were on a diet and thought they had already blown their calorie restriction goal ate more of the cookies than those who weren't on a diet, over 50% more. On the other hand, when dieters thought they were safely within their calorie limit, they ate the same amount of cookies as those who weren't on a diet. Again, it's a matter of goals and our perception of how close or how far away from reaching them we are. The farther away we perceive ourselves to be slipping from the goal, the more what-the-hell thinking seeps in. And this tendency applies to a variety of goals besides dieting. Perhaps your goal is to stop smoking. You go two weeks without a cigarette and one night find yourself at a party with friends, several of whom are lighting up. You think to yourself, I've made it two weeks, which is pretty good, so I can afford to have one smoke in a social setting. Later that night, your friends continue smoking and the party is still going strong and you think, well, I've already had one tonight, so what the hell, might as well have another. Before long, you are wrestling with the fact that you have slipped well away from your goal and must start over again. A different kind of control. So far, everything we have discussed in this chapter has to do with applied restraint, or lack thereof. But there is an entirely different kind of self-control that we engage in without realizing it. First, a little story. Elton is a philanthropist who specializes in raising funds to support children's hospitals all over the world. In some cases, he works with local agencies to develop business plans to build a new hospital, often in a third-world country where it is desperately needed. In other cases, he works directly with potential funders to help them identify hospitals in need of support and work through the logistics of making sure the money is used effectively. Over the last 15 or so years, he has helped raise nearly $1 billion for children's hospitals in 50 countries, the equivalent of helping more than 100,000 children get the vital care they needed and would not have received without a fully functioning children's hospital in their region. Ethical questions crop up during the course of Elton's work. Certain investors aren't as interested in supporting children's health as they are in courting favor with local authorities, who, in light of the investments being made, are often more willing to overlook less commendable things the investors are involved in. Sometimes this means waiving regulations, reducing taxes and fees, or, in more extreme cases, ignoring blatantly illegal activity. The philanthropist is usually aware that these things are happening, and sometimes this fee gets a boost if the activity in question is especially sordid. He knows, of course, why he's getting more money and he could turn it down. In fact, he could stop the deal altogether or at least refuse to participate. He doesn't. In his mind, the scale is balanced. If he didn't participate in the deals, the children's hospitals wouldn't be built and maintained. If he ignores unethical behavior and even occasionally takes what amounts to a bribe to keep quiet, that's okay, because on the other side of the seesaw, he is doing noble work. Elton's thinking and behavior illustrates what psychologists in recent research have dubbed the moral self-regulation effect the tendency to conduct a balancing act in our lives by doing something moral in one case to offset doing something wrong or doing nothing at all in another. When we do a moral act to offset an immoral one, we are engaged in moral cleansing. When we do nothing or perhaps something perceived as immoral because we feel like we have enough in the moral bank account to get away with it, we are engaged in moral licensing. A great deal of green marketing is predicated on the assumption that people will buy a green product to make themselves feel better about moral deficiencies in other parts of their lives. Other forms of green messaging, such as expensive hotels asking patrons to reuse bath towels, use this same dynamic. Nothing is offered to the patron in return for not using the towels other than a feeling of doing good for the environment, a feeling that will offset a sense of moral deficiency for not recycling at home, as an example. The hotel, meanwhile, benefits from reduced costs, which add directly to its bottom line. My purpose here is not to disparage worthwhile environmental campaigns, but only to show how the moral self-regulation effect is applied in real situations. The subtlety of this effect is on the level of background noise. It's happening all the time and we rarely give it a second thought. The important point to remember is that we use mechanisms like moral self-regulation to gain balance and feel more at ease with our place in the world. Balance makes the brain happy. 
and feeling at ease as whipped cream on the Sunday. We will come back to self-control machinations later in the audiobook, but now we will turn to one of the more misunderstood cycles of thinking any of us experiences, the cycle of regret and all emotions thereunto appertaining. Chapter 8. Want, Get, Regret, Repeat I see it all perfectly. There are two possible situations. One can either do this or that. My honest opinion and my friendly advice is this. Do it or do not do it. You will regret both. Soren Kierkegaard. Balance between aesthetic and ethical, volume two, either or. Going Z instead of Y. Oh, why? Madison was never entirely sure that she wanted to become a lawyer. After spending two years at a law firm, she was becoming absolutely certain that she should never have become one. Her expectations for the profession may have been distorted, or perhaps she simply had a naive view of the law from the start. She was willing to concede these points, but doing so was not making her day-to-day existence any easier. To continue on in a profession that failed to inspire any degree of passion and commitment was a horrible prospect. But how could she possibly change direction after years on this road, to say nothing of the huge financial investment she had made to get there, one that would take years to pay off? For Madison, every day was a draining struggle with regret. After digesting a vignette like that, I'm sure everyone listening recalls with discomfort similar situations in their lives. Perhaps not this extreme, but no one living who makes decisions escapes the pain of regret in at least one area of life, usually more than one, in fact. Our brains experience regret as a form of loss, and as we've seen, avoiding loss makes our brains happy. The problem is that avoiding regret is rarely possible, and attempting to do so is perilous business in its own right. We also fail to realize that regret is not one thing. It manifests in overt and covert forms that materialize in our brains as varying levels of loss. For all the fear and loathing it generates, to say nothing of the thousands of songs and poems it inspires, regret is a deceptively complicated topic. We will attempt to unravel at least part of the enigma in this chapter. Wiley Coyote, Faux Girlfriends, and eBay. For those of us who grew up watching Looney Tunes cartoons from Warner Brothers, the Roadrunner was a Saturday morning staple. The premise was simple. An especially lucky roadrunner, a fast desert bird, is relentlessly pursued by a desperate coyote. No matter what the coyote does, including using every contraption imaginable from the Acme Corporation, the roadrunner manages to escape him. The first of these cartoons aired in 1949, and since then the inexhaustible duo have appeared in countless episodes ranging from shorts to full-length features. With such a simple premise and just two characters, it's interesting to wonder why the cartoon has been so popular for more than 60 years. We'll come back to that question in a moment. Director Steven Soderbergh is known for movies that take on gritty topics without pulling too many punches. His style is to give the audience an on-the-scene perspective by using handheld cameras, moody lighting, and by putting viewers in the middle of the action. In 2009, he turned his attention to high-end prostitution in a film called The Girlfriend Experience. The film follows a successful call girl as she tries to take her career to the next level. What she offers, as the title suggests is the experience of having a beautiful girlfriend without having to manage an actual relationship. Her customers are wealthy, often married, and each seeks a different experience from her. Some want sex, others want to talk, with various shades between. At the same time, she is attempting to manage an ongoing relationship with her oddly understanding boyfriend, though the relationship steadily falls apart as the movie goes on. At one point, the main character thinks that she may want to have a true relationship with one of her customers, and he agrees that they should try and see where it goes. Predictably, it goes nowhere. As soon as the chasm between the girlfriend experience and an actual relationship is breached, the fantasy is over. You would have to search long and far to find someone who has not bid for something on eBay. Volumes of research have been written about the online auction phenomenon. Of particular interest is what drives people to continue to bid on items even when the price eventually exceeds the value of the item and or what the bidder was originally willing to pay. Many factors have been cited, and no doubt the reasons are not the same for all people. But the one consistently mentioned factor is that the allure of anticipating the win is immensely powerful. It is so powerful, in fact, that after focusing for days on winning an item and fighting off those who would nab the prize, bidders often feel an emotional letdown. They won the item, and in a few days it will arrive in the mail, excitement not included. As I am sure you have noticed, the three examples I just described share a central theme. The power of wanting trumps the satisfaction of getting. For a 60-year-old cartoon featuring nothing more than a coyote and a bird to remain popular, the tension of wanting has to be preserved. It doesn't work for the coyote to ever get the Roadrunner. People love the cartoon because Wiley Coyote wants the prize with every fiber of his being and forever fails to reach it. 
For the girlfriend experience to remain a profitable endeavor, it cannot become the girlfriend for real experience. The energy and money is derived from the tension of wanting something that will never materialize. And for many bidders on eBay, it is the thrill of the hunt that motivates higher and higher bids, even when the same item could be bought elsewhere for less money and with less time required to get it. Obtaining the thing in question often leads to a dull, hopeless feeling peppered with confusion. That is the regret of getting. A feeling of loss that, if it could speak, would ask, now what? Singing the Habituation Blues And as you might expect, our brains have an answer to that question. Target a new reward. That answer makes sense because the brain's reward system is structured to drive us to continually seek beneficial rewards, be they food, water, sex, shelter, or proxies for these, like money and all that it can provide. The problem, of course, is that when we get the thing we wanted, the game is over. On top of this, something psychologists call habituation begins to set in, and we get used to the thing in question in a mere matter of days or weeks. An example of this process that we see every day is new technology purchases, whether it's a new computer, video game console, or smartphone. First, we feel elation in anticipation of buying the item. When we finally do buy it, that high-pitched elation gives way to a more grounded liking of the item, which, over the next few weeks, dissipates into a neutral appreciation. That stage may last for a while, but eventually the item becomes just another possession in your collection with certain usefulness, if it's even still useful. The initial feeling of elation can never be totally recaptured for that item once the cycle comes full circle. What's the brain's answer? Focus on something new and get back to elation. In fact, regret can set in even before we finalize getting or doing that which we've anticipated. Research shows that regret is one of the most influential factors in decision making, because we feel it so strongly once the anticipation of rewards starts settling into something much less exhilarating. The drop-off often begins even before the decision is finalized. Several examples illustrate the process. For instance, consider a man or woman who is divorced and remarried multiple times. Psychology research on habituation in relationships suggests that many people simply never overcome the elation drop-off once the reality of their commitment sets in. Regret fills the void, and the marriage suffers until it ends. Not by coincidence is the divorce rate for second marriages higher than it is for first marriages. Attempting to recapture the anticipation of reward simply sets off a new cycle of habituation and regret. Another example that most of us can relate to is purchasing a new car. It's not uncommon for regret to set in even before the deal is finalized, because once the would-be buyer enters the showroom, he or she is faced with comparisons between the car they intend to buy and all the other cars on display. With each observation of features other cars have that the intended car lacks, the door of regret is cracked open a bit more. When the car is purchased, post-commitment comparisons begin with other cars on the road, in magazines, on TV, and so forth. In this case, habituation and regret move along parallel tracks. Or consider moving to a new city and starting a new job. It's common to believe that the new place or position will be significantly better than what we have become accustomed to. Newness has a sort of mystical draw, even though it's incredibly short-lived and rarely meets expectations because those expectations are colored by an unattainable desire for ongoing elation. When we move to the new place and start the new position, the same cycle of regret sets in as anticipation of reward drifts off. Hence the quirky but insightful axiom, wherever you go, there you are. The counterfactual conundrum. For all its negatives, regret actually serves an important adaptive function. Without it, our ability to learn, change, and improve would fall short of what our species has needed to survive and thrive. Regret as a learning tool happens through something called counterfactual thinking, a dynamic with two razor-sharp edges. When we look back on a decision and think, if I had done A instead of B, then I wouldn't have to deal with horrible C, we are engaging in counterfactual thinking. Madison, from this chapter's introduction, thinks to herself that if she had pursued her original goal of becoming a graphic designer and not been so frightened by the possibility of not finding a good job after graduation, then she wouldn't dread every day that she must now function as an attorney. As the name implies, counterfactual thinking involves thinking of what could or should have happened given a different set of facts. From a learning standpoint, this can help us immensely because the next time we face a similar situation, we will have the results of our counterfactual thinking in mind and not make the same errors again, hopefully. From an emotional health standpoint, spending too much time in the counterfactual examination room can lead to serious consequences. If we allow ourselves to dwell on a bad decision and everything else we could have done to avoid a bad outcome, Negative emotions will overshadow the learning benefits. For those suffering from depression, obsessive counterfactual thinking is like propane gas feeding a fire. Unfortunately, beating ourselves up over poor decisions is a hard habit to break. Our brains revisit these decisions because learning from error is central to a happy brain's reason for being. 
The problem is that we lack an internal governor to regulate how much of this learning process to indulge, and eventually what could help us ends up hurting us. And the good news? So what can we do about it? Recent research suggests that we can train our brains to temper anticipation of reward without squashing it altogether. Certain brain injuries can result in loss of anticipation of reward. It's not something most of us would want to lose. At the same time, psychology research indicates that when we're making decisions about what we want, focusing on experiences involving friends and family yields greater long-term rewards and far less regret than purchasing material items. The issue is more complicated for relationships, but solid research has shed light on this complex topic as well. More on those suggestions in Chapter 15. For now, we must move on to examine the social sandbox in which we all play, and what research tells us about the influence we possess and the influences that possess us. Part 4. Social Ebbs and Influential Flows Chapter 9. Socializing with Monkeys Like Us Society is a masked ball where everyone hides his real character and reveals it by hiding. Ralph Waldo Emerson Conduct of Life. Monkey See, Monkey Drama. Professor Lori Santos is one of the leading primatologists in the country. As a director of the Yale University CAP Lab, aka the Comparative Cognition Laboratory, she has developed an understanding of Capuchin monkey social systems that is challenging many of our long held assumptions about monkey and human distinctions. At times, she explains, watching the Capuchins is just like watching a human soap opera, without the cheesy dialogue. Monkeys display jealousy, grief, worry, joy, and a range of other emotions that we used to think were exclusive to humans. They also cheat on their partners, steal, and alienate others, just like humans do. As it turns out, the dynamics of monkey society are not unlike our own. In some ways, they are startlingly similar. What is not the same, Santos points out, is how we and our Capuchin cousins navigate our way through our respective social landscapes. The reason for this disparity is that natural evolution and cultural evolution move at entirely different speeds. Santos comments, Culture moves faster than natural selection, too fast for natural selection to ever catch us up biologically. Another way to state that observation is that our social infrastructure is far more complex than natural selection could prepare us for. When we observe monkeys, we see a species exhibiting emotional undercurrents similar to our own and addressing them with basic skills that fit the need. If an alien race were to observe us, on the other hand, they would see a species wrestling to manage social complexity that is frequently over our heads, threatening to drown us on any given day. What this means is that our brains are in many ways at odds with our social environments. Happy brains are protective, predictive, and conservative, not the best fit for human societies that place high value on unpredictability, speed, and consumption. Nevertheless, this is where we find ourselves, and our social culture is ours to manage no matter how profound the difficulties. After all, we are the crafters of our societies, so let's do some digging. Hi there, I'm evaluating you. We will begin with a core element of social dynamics, first impressions. We all intuitively know the importance of first impressions. From an early age, the mantra of, you never forget a first impression, is pressed into our psyches. But what's really going on when we first meet someone that has such a significant impact forevermore? Researchers from New York University and Harvard joined forces to identify what neural systems are in play upon first acquaintance. To accomplish this, the research team designed a novel experiment in which they examined the brain activity when participants developed first impressions of fictional individuals. The participants were given written profiles of 20 individuals describing different personality traits. The profiles, presented along with pictures of these fictional people, included scenarios indicating both positive, for instance, intelligent, and negative, for example, lazy, traits in their depictions. After reading the profiles, the participants were asked to evaluate how much they liked or disliked each person. These impressions varied depending on the value assigned to the different positive and negative traits. For instance, if a participant valued intelligence more than aggressiveness, he or she formed a positive impression of a profile conveying intelligence. During this impression formation period, participants' brain activity was observed using functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI. Based on the participants' ratings, the researchers were able to determine the difference in brain activity when they encountered information that was most important in forming the first impression. Two areas of the brain showed significant activity during the coding of impression-relevant information. The amygdala, which previous research has linked to emotional learning about inanimate objects and social evaluations of trust, and the posterior cingulate cortex, which has been linked to economic decision-making and valuation of rewards. Both of these areas of the brain have been linked to how we determine the value of things, or value processing, if you prefer. 
While the line from study results to behavioral inference is never perfectly straight, it appears that this study indicates we're all hardcore value processors even before hello comes out of our mouths. The subjective evaluation we make when meeting someone new includes, to put it bluntly, what's in it for us. This interpretation is not nearly as cynical as it may seem. We are wired to evaluate others in large part on a trust basis, and to our brains, trust is linked to rewards. Both earning another's trust and feeling at ease enough to extend our trust are rewards in the parlance of the happy brain. It makes sense that our brains begin this evaluation from the first moment we make someone's acquaintance. Another not-so-obvious aspect of first impressions is that the impression we are trying to give influences how we evaluate others. That's the finding of a study that included hundreds of participants who watched a short film and then discussed it with another participant. Half the participants were given an impression management goal to appear introverted, extroverted, smart, confident, or happy. After the discussions, participants rated themselves and the person they had spoken with across several personality traits. Those with an impression management goal rated their conversation partner significantly lower on the trait they were trying to show in themselves, but not on other personality traits. This seems to happen because when we focus on embellishing a particular trait in ourselves, we unconsciously increase the standard for that trait in others, and they usually fall short. So just because someone you're trying to impress doesn't seem as outgoing, gregarious, or confident as you are, don't assume that they truly aren't. It could be that how you're trying to come across has changed your perspective. Your brain wouldn't have it any other way. How we prune our networks. First impressions behind us, let's move on to the dynamics of the most common of relationships, friendships and acquaintanceships. With the dawn of the social networking age, these relationships are drifting into murkier waters all the time. Not because social networking necessarily makes them any less meaningful, but because virtual interaction makes them harder to pin down. We are going to examine one aspect of this ambiguity, the turnover of relationships over time. For ages, sociologists have debated whether personal preference or social context holds more sway over how we meet people and the nature of our relationships. Would, for example, your husband have become your husband if you'd met him in a bar instead of via your best friend? Sociologist Gerald Molenhurst took on the challenge of addressing this question by crafting a study that investigated how the context in which we meet people influences our social network. To his surprise, he found that we lose and replace about half of our friends every seven years. And as a result, the size of our social network remains the same over time. Molenhurst conducted a survey of 1,007 people of ages 18 to 65 years. Seven years later, the respondents were contacted once again, and 604 people were re-interviewed. They answered questions such as, Who do you talk with regarding important personal issues? Who helps you with projects in your home? Who do you pop by to see? Where did you get to know that person? And where do you meet that person now? Molenhurst found that personal network sizes remained stable, but many members of the network were new. Only 30% of the original friends and discussion partners had the same position in a subject's network seven years later, and only 48% of all the contacts were still part of the social network. Molenhurst also found that social networks were not formed based on personal choices alone. Our choice of friends is limited by opportunities to meet, and people often choose friends from a context in which they have previously chosen a friend. If the pond had fished the first time, why not cast back in? Also, in contrast to research that suggests people typically separate things like work, social clubs, and friends, this study shows that these categories often overlap. A happy brain social preferences. So we see that our social networks are anything but static. Not only should we expect movement in and out of our social circles, but we should also acknowledge the limiting factors that influence them. Another of these factors is the degree to which we feel an affinity with someone not yet in our social circle, the pre-existing inness or outness feeling each of us gets when making a new acquaintance. It comes as no surprise that people tend to prefer others of the same in-group. If, for example, you are a diehard supporter of a political candidate and someone drives by with a bumper sticker endorsing the candidate, you feel a hint of inness with that person. If someone drives by with a bumper sticker of the candidate's opponent, you feel a twinge of otherness about that person. If asked why, you might say that the first person probably shares many of your views and you're on the same team, more or less. The second driver is showing with the opponent's bumper sticker that she's on the other team. In effect, you feel a sense of in-group trust with the first person that you don't feel with the second. But why exactly trust a stranger any more than another stranger if you don't really know either of them? That question was addressed in a study conducted by researchers from Australian National University and Hokkaido University in Japan. The study began by establishing two possible rationales for group-based trust. The first is stereotyping. 
People tend to judge in-group members as nicer, more helpful, generous, trustworthy, and fair. The second is expectation. People tend to expect better treatment from in-group members because they are thought to value and want to further other in-group members' interests. Study participants were offered a choice between an unknown sum of money from an in-group member or an out-group member, and were told that the in-group and out-group members controlled the amount of money to allocate as they desired. The initial result was that participants overwhelmingly chose the in-group member option. And, surprisingly, this result held true even when the stereotype of the in-group was more negative than that of the out-group. Good, bad, or indifferent, the stereotype was ignored in favor of group identity. But when participants were told that the in-group money giver didn't know they were part of the same group, the situation changed. When this was the case, participants resorted to making their choice on the basis of stereotype. If the in-group was portrayed negatively, then the participants were more likely to choose the out-group member option and vice versa. This study suggests that when members of the in-group are mutually aware of their in-ness, there is an expectation of better treatment than would be received from an out-grouper. But when that awareness is muddied, reliance on stereotypes kicks in. What does this finding tell us about our biases when selecting new members of our social circles? First, it tells us that we often use shaky criteria for making judgments about people. We determine that one stranger is more deserving of our trust than another, either because we put unjustifiably high value on their like-mindedness, or we simply default to a stereotype. Neither of these tendencies speak especially well of themselves, though they evidence basic tendencies that are in all likelihood neurally imprinted. In fact, neuroscience research has identified neural structures in our brains correlating to our social biases, so there is worthy evidence that social bias is, at least to some degree, wired into our noggins. Negotiating Fairness, Indignity versus Integrity Like the monkeys in Dr. Santos's lab, humans are endlessly gauged in a tricky game of give and take. Dr. Santos coined the term monkeynomics to describe this interplay among the Capuchins. When a monkey feels wronged in a negotiation, he or she will refuse to participate any longer, or at least until the wrong has been rectified, which usually means that the other monkey hands over the grapes. Humans face similar circumstances all the time, albeit with additional layers of complexity that make knowing when to draw the proverbial line all the more challenging. Let's say, for example, that you are negotiating with someone about how to split a sum of money that you both can rightly claim, but that the other person, regrettably for you, has in his possession. You have one opportunity to make the deal, and the other person is not obligated to keep negotiating with you after this. Since he has the upper hand, the person you're negotiating with says that he thinks a 70-30 split is fair, with 70% going to him. If you accept his terms, you get 30% of the money. If you reject his terms, you get 0%. You believe the terms to be unfair, but if it's a difference between 30% and nothing, you'll take the 30%, right? Maybe not. Instead, you might reject the offer as a symbolic way of expressing your anger and take the opportunity to tell the unfair dealer exactly what you think of him, money be damned. Okay. But now imagine that you are negotiating with someone who has been informed that she can unilaterally decide how much of the money to give you, and you have no say in the outcome. In other words, as far as she's concerned, she can dictate the amount and she doesn't care what you decide. In fact, she'll never even know. On your side of the deal, however, all you know is that you are going to be offered a sum of money just as you were in the first deal, and you can choose to reject or accept it. You cannot, however, discuss the deal with the other person and voice whether you believe the deal to be fair or unfair. You have no recourse. So once again, you are offered 30% of the money. And this time, not only are you faced with 30% or nothing, but you're also denied the satisfaction of telling the unfair dealer off or even symbolically protesting. This time, it seems clear. You take the money, right? Once again, quite possibly not. But why not? You have no chance of trying to make the deal fairer and no opportunity to express your disgust. So what's making you still turn down the money? That's precisely what a study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences investigated. Participants were made to play both of the games. The first is called the impunity game, a variation of the ultimatum game. In the ultimatum game, a proposer is given a sum of money and told to negotiate with a responder on how to split the amount. The responder has two options. One, accept the amount proposed and both parties get the agreed upon amount of money. Or two, reject the amount proposed, and neither party gets any money. The typical result of this game is that most unfair offers are rejected, and the parties commonly agree to a 50-50 split. In the impunity game, the responder can still reject the offer, 
but by doing so also loses any claim to the money. It's a take X percent or nothing deal. The typical results of this game are that between 30 and 40 percent of responders reject the offer in a show of symbolic punishment against the unfair party. The responder forfeits the cash, but still says her piece. The final variation is called the private impunity game, the second imaginary scenario I gave you, in which the proposer is told that he can simply dictate the amount to be given to the responder. The responder, however, is told that she can still reject the offer, but the proposer will never know what decision she made. In this case, the predicted result is that nearly all participants will act rationally and take the money, since they have no chance of recourse and no chance to make the proposer aware of their disgust. That's the prediction, but surprisingly, it turns out not to be true. The rejection rate of unfair offers is still a hefty 30 to 40 percent. The reason suggested by this study is, in a word, emotion. When faced with an unfair offer, we have the choice of rationally accepting the immediate incentive and ending the dispute, or allowing an emotional response to dominate. We respond emotionally to unfair treatment for the same reason that a bear charges someone intruding on its territory. Because we know that a bear will act aggressively if it feels challenged, we avoid bears. The same dynamic applies to us. If someone is known to emotionally respond with anger and moral outrage to unfair treatment, he develops a reputation as someone to avoid crossing. What this study also tells us is that not only are we concerned with consistency in our external reputations, but we're just as much, if not more, concerned with internal consistency. Our emotional response guards against accepting immediate incentives that compromise our integrity. Over time, this internal consistency that preserves integrity may also spruce up our external reputation. Simply put, most of us would rather be seen as bears than sheep. But here's the question. If it is really in our best interest to take less when the alternative is nothing, and stubbornly we still don't, have we really made the best decision? The tricky part is knowing what constitutes the best decision, and if perhaps taking a short-term hit to one's dignity is better for one's long-term interest. Unfortunately for us, our brains are not terribly efficient at making these judgments in short order. Time is always a factor. If the defensive emotional response is strong enough, it's likely no amount of calculating is going to thwart it, especially when things are happening fast, and they usually are. Again, there is nothing black and white about the tendencies of a happy brain. Opinions on the scenario I just described will vary widely. But the main point remains the same. How our brains react in a given situation may very well undermine our best interests in the short and or long term. Now we will shift to another social dynamic that sits at the hub of every relationship, and not only those with other people, the power of influence. Chapter 10, The Great Truth Rub-Off For certainly, at the level of social life, what is called the adjustment of man to his environment takes place through the medium of fictions. Walter Lippmann, Public Opinion. Opinion by Committee. Just last night, you went to see a movie that defies simple categorization. Some films are plainly bad, others are obviously good, but this one doesn't filter so easily through the quality sieve. You find yourself searching the web for reviews. When you stop to think about it, this is an odd thing to do after you have seen the movie. Normally, you would consult reviews to find out if a movie is worth your time and money. But in this case, you are doing it to find out what others thought about the film, even though you have already watched it. You also post a note on your social networking site asking if anyone else has watched the movie and what they thought about it. You do the same with an email to a handful of friends. Why are you pursuing these opinions? Why do they mean so much to you now that you've already seen the movie? Asked another way, what is lacking in your self-perceived ability to evaluate the film that you think others can supplement? These questions flirt with uncomfortable psychological territory. We like to think of ourselves as self-sufficient arbiters of our experiences. To admit otherwise is to suggest that we are not independent thinkers. But for the last several decades, psychology, and more recently neuroscience research, has been providing evidence that independent thought is certainly not absolute, and possibly a figment of our ego's making. The truth is that our brains are not wired for complete independence. We are instead an exceptionally social species wired for interdependence. Ours is an existence of influence and counterinfluence, and none of us lives on one-way streets. Knowing this, it is much easier to understand why we would search out opinions on a movie or anything else that challenges our sense of self-sufficiency. 
But this, like all tendencies of the happy brain, can quickly go too far. Without checking ourselves, continual reliance on others to form our opinions and make our decisions is damaging, principally because it prevents us from reaching, taking psychological risks that are important to the formation of character and strengthening of personality. There are, of course, also good reasons for this tendency, and in some cases they yield distinct benefits. You decide, I decide, you decide. Rather than label the tendency to seek opinion reinforcement as a weakness of character or another pejorative, we are better to serve to find out what drives it. Neuroscience research has been delving deeper to glimpse a few answers, with some intriguing results. For example, a study conducted by a team of researchers from Emory University in Atlanta wanted to find out what happens in the brain when offloading decisions to external sources. In the case of this study, the sources were financial experts. Study participants were asked to make financial choices both inside and outside a functional magnetic resonance imaging scanner. The choices were divided into two categories, sure win and lottery. During the scanner session, researchers introduced a financial expert to the study participants and provided the expert's credentials to enhance his influence. The expert's advice was presented to participants on a computer screen above their financial choice options. If the expert recommended an option, the word accept was displayed above it. If he advised against the option, the word reject was displayed. During half the trials, the word unavailable was displayed, indicating that the expert had no advice for that decision. The results indicated that both behavior and neural activation patterns were significantly affected by expert advice. When given an accept signal by the expert, participants tended to make decisions based on the advice. Simultaneously, neural activity correlating with valuation was witnessed in the absence of expert advice. No significant neural correlations with valuation were seen in the presence of expert advice. In other words, the brain appears to offload the burden of figuring out the best decision when given expert financial advice. When the expert's advice was available, the participant's brain simply did not have to work so hard, so they didn't. When this research was first published, it was covered by several media outlets with headlines like, Study suggests that expert advice causes our brains to shut off. In fact, the study did not suggest this at all. Much the opposite. It showed an active, not passive, tendency of a happy brain. Conserve resources when credible external resources are available. It also showed that time is a critical factor affecting the offloading tendency. Study participants were given an average of 3.5 seconds to make a decision, which means that they did not have time to deliberate. The researchers intentionally designed the study this way to push participants' brains to make a decision. With less time, the brain must work even harder to calculate outcomes. Consider the energy spent to sprint a mile versus jog the same distance. More ground is covered in less time, but more energy is required to get there. When an external source becomes available to draw on instead of burning through internal resources, the brain is happy to accept. The brain imaging results of this study show an attenuation of neural activity correlating with valuation, that is, a tapering or reduction of activity which is exactly what we would expect to see from a brain offloading the resource burn to someone else. Another way to think of this is to envision a race car driver trying to get an edge in the race without having to expend more energy. Burning more fuel will result in more pit stops, so instead the driver drafts another car, effectively pulling energy away from that car to supplement his momentum. Likewise, the brain drafts external sources, thereby conserving its own. Peer Power Plus Unquestionably, peers exert a great deal of influence on each other, even aside from our brain's crafty energy conservation tendencies. Adolescence is nothing if not a working model of peer influence in its purest form. But psychologists have wrestled with a tough issue when trying to isolate exactly what drives the juggernaut of peer influence. Is it simply the desire to look cooler for show, or does peer influence actually change our minds? A study by a team of psychologists at Harvard University used a combination of social psychology and neuroscience methodologies to find out if peer influence really can change how people value something. In this case, the attractiveness of a face. Fourteen male participants rated pictures of 180 women's faces on a computer monitor. For the majority of the faces, after they'd made their own rating, the students were shown the average rating given to that face by hundreds of previous participants. Unknown to the participants, the researchers had made up these ratings, which were sometimes higher than the participants' own rating and sometimes lower. 
Later, the participants rated the same faces again while undergoing a brain scan. The results indicated that viewing the faces had a definite effect on reward-related regions in the participants' brains, and that this effect depended on the feedback the participants had received earlier about how their peers had rated those faces. In other words, the peer feedback genuinely changed the participants' attitudes about facial attractiveness. This held true even for faces participants had rated as equally attractive. If participants were told that those faces had been rated as more attractive by previous participants, greater reward-related brain activity was observed, and they also increased their ratings. In contrast, the faces they had earlier been told were rated as less attractive by peers triggered less reward activity, and were now rated as less attractive by the participants. The reason for these effects seems, again, to be a matter of neural wiring. The researchers who conducted this study believe that the same neural structures that guide us toward highly valued outcomes across a range of things, including food, water, and reproduction, are at play when we conform to others' opinions. The brain interprets the different value ratings and opinions of others as a signal that adjustment is needed to more effectively target the best outcomes. Hence, if it's good for them, perhaps it will be good for me. Sending Identity Smoke Signals Another aspect of the influence effect has much to do with who is choosing what. As a social animal, we have a deeply rooted desire to belong to a social group, a preferred tribe, if you will. When members of a given social group use or approve of something, it sends a signal to others that the thing in question is good for the group, that it is consistent with the tribe's identity. Researchers studying this dynamic use the terms conformance and convergence when separating out whether or not influence is identity-based. As it turns out, we can reliably predict whether someone will be influenced in, for example, a purchasing decision. We are more likely to conform our behavior to the groups when we witness others buying a practical product like toothpaste, for example, because the group purchase signals that this product is superior to the rest. In that case, it doesn't matter if the others are or are not part of a particular social group. It is the choice of the group overall that matters. On the other hand, we are more likely to converge with or simply join those of an esteemed social group when we witness them buying high-ticket items items that signify the group's status. In this case, it definitely matters who is doing the buying. If Ron's social group is keen on Mercedes-Benz cars, he's probably not going to go out and buy a Lexus, unless there's a distinct social advantage in doing so. The first example illustrates choice conformity that is not identity-based. The second example illustrates choice convergence, which is tightly wrapped up with identity. In both cases, choice was influenced by others. But conformity is rooted in seeking highest value. Convergence is about who we are or think we should be. The interesting thing about identity-based decisions is that we have a harder time explaining why we made them, though we will come up with multiple reasons that are tangential to the core reason. Sleek styling, smooth shifting, impressive handling, etc. Rarely will someone reply, This car most closely fits the identity of my social group, and since my identity is derived in part from my group's identity, I bought it. Beware, truth mirages abound. So drafting external resources to process decisions and opinions is not necessarily bad. In fact, it's a crafty conservation strategy that often serves us well. And peer influence also appears to be a function of our brain's adaptive strategy to locate high-value resources and also to signal our affinity with a social group. That is all well and good, much of the time. But the flip side is that these tendencies can also predispose us to influence by propaganda and cons of every stripe. Two dynamics fuel the brain's acceptance of these influences, repetition and something psychologists call cognitive fluency. Since the early days of studying propaganda used during World War II, psychology research has demonstrated that the more a message is repeated, the more likely we are to believe it, particularly if we are paying little attention. Counterintuitive as it may sound, The series of glancing blows from oft-repeated messages is what eventually locks us into the illusion of truth. The more focused we are on the message, the less likely we are to be influenced. Cognitive fluency refers to our brain's tendency to accept messages that are easy to understand and effortlessly fit into existing schemata, referring back to Chapter 1. And when positively employed, it is a skill crucial to learning. The reason that persuasive messages are short, pithy, and digestible in seconds is that we process them so quickly that they become familiar without us even noticing. While conventional wisdom holds that familiarity breeds contempt, 
In the world of influence, familiarity breeds acceptance. This is again due in large part to the brain's proneness to conserve resources. Familiar messages require fewer resources to decode and process, and a happy brain is happy to take the less strenuous route. Conversely, messages that are harder to process elicit the opposite effect. We are less likely to believe them. For abundant anecdotal proof of this, consider the difficulty policymakers have attempting to explain complicated issues to the public and how equally hard it is to convince us that the more complex position merits our belief when a sea of simpler and more influential messages washes over us every day. The problem facing anyone trying to communicate complex messages is that our brains are not natively inclined to tackle such messages. Substantial effort is required to force one's attention toward less simple, less pithy messages when so many low-resource vittles are out there to digest with negligible attention required. Advertisers and political strategists know this, of course, and capitalize on the fact that fostering an illusion of truth is what generally wins over voters and consumers. It is hardly an exaggeration to say that almost every political campaign waged in the United States is a battle of illusions of truth. The more money a candidate has at his or her disposal to craft more effective messaging strategies, the more likely she or he is to win. If you cannot get your illusion of truth out there enough times to counteract your opponent's messages and draw in constituents, your efforts are handicapped, likely beyond repair. It's a tragically simple algorithm that has dominated the political and consumer marketplace for well over a century. It is worth noting that research has also been conducted to find out just how many times a message should be repeated for optimal effect. These studies suggest that we invest the most confidence in a message when it has been repeated three to five times. When we are saturated beyond that point, repetition loses its persuasiveness and may even reverse the effect altogether. All aboard the Narrative Transport Express. Needless to say, our brain's internal governor for accepting or rejecting external influence isn't always at the top of its game. You may be surprised to find out, for example, that even the fictional characters in our favorite television shows can persuade us to alter our thinking on touchy topics. That was the conclusion of a study showing that organ donation, when depicted favorably in popular television dramas, gets a boost in the public sphere. This might be good or bad, depending on how you look at it. For some time now, Research has been showing that television is a potent way to facilitate what psychologists call social learning, the tendency of people to model attitudes and behaviors of others under particular conditions. Two conditions are requisite, attention and memory. Engaging television dramas that draw the viewer into their narratives meet both conditions. They absorb attention and catalyze memory formation. When a viewer strongly identifies with a particular character in the drama, the effect, referred in psych circles as narrative transport, is even more potent. In this case, a research team led by Lauren Movius, professor of psychology at Purdue University, wanted to know if depictions of organ donation in TV dramas like CSI, Numbers, Grey's Anatomy, and House would influence learning about organ donation and increase motivation to become a donor. They also wanted to know how, or if, accuracy of the information influences learning and motivation. Participants were asked to watch a selection of episodes from popular TV dramas with storylines that included both positive and negative depictions of organ donation, and then complete surveys that assessed a range of factors related to how strongly the viewer had been influenced by the storylines. And no small potatoes here. More than 5,000 people completed the house survey. The results indicated that viewers who were not organ donors before watching the dramas were more likely to decide to become one if organ donation was portrayed positively, and if characters in the show explicitly encouraged it. Viewers who reported emotional involvement with the narrative were significantly more likely to become organ donors. And finally, viewers clearly acquired knowledge from the content of each drama, whether or not it was accurate. And that's the depending on how you look at it part of this. The study is really telling us a couple different things. Emotional involvement with narrative affects the way people think and supplies knowledge that may very well not be true. Most people would probably agree that organ donation is a social good. And if TV dramas encourage it, then all the better. But the troubling part is that the same dynamic driving the good can also serve up the bad with equal effectiveness. Pseudoscience, vaccine alarmism, and quackery of every flavor spreads just this way. In another study, researchers wanted to find out if this effect holds true on the big screen, this time with smoking as the model behavior. If a viewer strongly identifies with a particular protagonist in a movie, Will that protagonist smoking influence the viewer's thoughts about smoking? Turns out, it does. Greater identification with a smoking protagonist predicted, one, 
stronger implicit associations between the viewer and smoking for smokers and non-smokers. In other words, associations that they were unaware of or wouldn't explicitly admit to. And two, increased desire for those who already smoke to go light one up. The researchers concluded that when we watch a movie, we often identify more with one character for any number of reasons. Our attention is engaged by his or her emotions and behaviors, and we slide into the character's cinematic shoes. And, just as in real life, it's easier to be influenced by someone whose shoes we're trying on. The stronger this identification becomes, the more our thoughts are influenced, with behavior often following suit. The Sway of Metaphor Whether in person or on screen, one of the strongest influences on our thinking is woven into the verbiage all of us use in discussions big and small. Metaphors. Let's say that we are comparing cities we have visited or would like to visit, and I mention one that I have not yet been to, but you have. You say, it's a massive, stinking cesspool filled with garbage and crawling with every form of filth imaginable. Immediately, my mind conjures an image of a filthy retention pond covered with scum, loaded with trash, and lousy with rats and roaches. How close the metaphor you have chosen is to actually describing the city is debatable. But in the few minutes we are speaking, this doesn't really matter. What matters is that you have provided the metaphorical rudiments for me to construct an image that is now schematically associated with the city in my mind. One day I may visit that city and determine that your metaphor was inaccurate, or I may conclude that it was dead on. Until then, or until I come across information that contradicts or verifies your description, the image will be there. And even after that, I'll find removing that image from my mind very difficult. That is the power of metaphor, a power so subtle we barely notice how much it impacts our thinking. Researchers Paul Thibodeau and Lara Boroditsky from Stanford University demonstrated how influential metaphors can be through a series of five experiments designed to tease apart the why and when of a metaphor's power. First, the researchers asked 482 students to read one of two reports about crime in the city of Addison. Later, they had to suggest solutions for the problem. In the first report, crime was described as a wild beast preying on the city and lurking in neighborhoods. After reading these words, 75% of the students put forward solutions that involved enforcement or punishment, such as building more jails or even calling in the military for help. Only 25% suggested social reforms, such as fixing the economy, improving education, or providing better health care. The second report was exactly the same except it described crime as a virus infecting the city and plaguing communities. After reading this version, only 56% opted for greater law enforcement, while 44% suggested social reforms. Interestingly, very few of the participants realized how affected they were by the differing crime metaphors. When Thibodeau and Boroditsky asked the participants to identify which parts of the text had most influenced their decisions, the vast majority pointed to the crime statistics, not the language. Only 3% identified the metaphors as culprits. The researchers confirmed their results with more experiments that used the same reports without the vivid words. Even though they described crime as a beast or virus only once, they found the same trend as before. The researchers also discovered that the words themselves do not wield much influence without the right context. When Thibodeau and Boroditsky asked participants to come up with synonyms for either beast or virus before reading identical crime reports, they provided similar solutions for solving the city's problems. In other words, the metaphors only worked if they framed the story. If, however, they appeared at the end of the report, they didn't have any discernible effect. Just how malleable are we? If listening to this chapter has so far left you unconvinced that our brains can be conjoled and swayed by any number of influences, listen on. This next discussion might be the clincher. What if I were to tell you that your judgments about good and bad are heavily influenced by whether you are right or left-handed? This is actually not a new finding. Past studies have demonstrated that we are, in fact, prone to make judgments that correspond with the side we act more fluently on. Right-handed people prefer products and people on their right. Left-handed people prefer the left. The question is, why? Are these preferences hardwired in our brains, or are they learned over time? Researchers Daniel Casanto and Evangelina Krasicu from the New School of Social Research and University of Pennsylvania investigated this question using a series of experiments that tested both possibilities. To address the first question, are these tendencies hardwired in our brains, the researchers recruited 13 right-handed patients who had suffered cerebral injuries that weakened or paralyzed one side of their bodies. 
Five remained right-handed. The rest lost their right side and became effectively left-handed. The patients were shown a cartoon of a character's head between two empty boxes and told that he loves zebras and thinks they're good, but hates pandas and thinks they're bad, or vice versa. Then they were asked to say which animal they preferred and which box, left or right, they'd put it in. All the patients who were still right-handed put the good animal in the right box. All but one of the new lefties put it in the left. So it would seem from this experiment that the brain's preferences, right or left, can definitely be altered. But is the change due to neural wiring adjustment or new learning? To rule out neural wiring is the answer, the researchers then took a group of 56 healthy right-handed people and asked half to wear a ski glove on the left hand and half on the right. The participants were instructed to pull dominoes from a box two at a time, using one hand for each, and place them symmetrically on dots placed across the table. If a domino fell, they were to set it upright with the appropriate hand only. In other words, half of the right-handers were turned into left-handers for the duration of the experiment. They were then escorted to another room and administered the same animal box test as the brain-injured patient. The results? Three-quarters of those with ungloved right hands put the good animal in the right box. Two-thirds of the temporary lefties put the good animal in the left. It took all of 12 minutes' worth of training to change a significant percentage of right-handers' loyalties to the left. What this and similar studies tell us is that even very basic judgments that we make every day are influenced by factors as innocuous as which hand we use the most. Does that mean we cannot trust ourselves to make sound, rational decisions? No. But it does mean that more of our decisions, opinions, and judgments are affected by a much greater range of influences than we know. And as we are about to see, it also means that our brains are psychosocial germ mongers. Chapter 11. How Your Brain Catches Psychosocial Colds It would be difficult to exaggerate the degree to which we are influenced by those we influence. Eric Hoffer, The Passionate State of Mind You feeling me? You are at a party with a few friends, and everyone appears to be having a good time. The chit-chat is casual and upbeat, as you would expect. The music is loud, and it's hard to hear anyone talking more than a couple feet away. But you begin hearing what you think is yelling coming from the far side of the room. You tune in more, and now you're sure it's yelling. Two male voices shouting louder and louder over the music. You start walking that way, along with several other people and soon everyone else at the party except for the two men yelling are circling around the scene. Someone shuts off the music, now full focus is on the ruckus. It isn't long before one of the guys throws a punch. The other guy avoids it and tackles the first guy, who is elbowing the back of his opponent's head while both of them fall backward onto an end table that collapses upon impact. Eventually, they are pulled apart and told to leave. But everyone knows what is going to happen when they exit, so the mass of people trail behind the two as the fight resumes outside. Now the crowd is yelling, some people for one of the guys and the rest for the other. Then a couple of those people begin shouting at each other, followed by a few more, and soon the formerly calm and friendly crowd is now a bomb on the brink of detonating. All of this happened in the span of about six minutes. Party over. That cheery tale is an overt example of the psychosocial contagion phenomenon, the tendency to become infected by the emotions, thoughts, and behaviors of others. A happy brain catches emotional contagions rather easily and is also happy to pass along the bug. This, as with all tendencies of a happy brain, is both good and bad. Anger, or in the party example, anger mixed with hysteria, is just one of several contagions psychology research has identified. Here are a few more. Blame, stress, fear, disgust, anxiety, happiness, moral outrage, risk perception, binge eating, unethical behavior. The largest study to date on emotional contagions focused on how happiness spreads through large social networks. The study used 20 years of data from the massive Framingham Heart Study to identify several important characteristics of contagious happiness. First, the study suggests that happiness spreads over three degrees of separation, such as friends of a friend's friend. Researchers also found that people who are surrounded by happy people in the near term have a significantly greater likelihood of future happiness. And they found that happiness is a potent force for gluing people together, regardless of whether those people were similar to begin with. In short, happiness is highly contagious and its effects are lasting, unless or until geographic separation gets in the way, the one thing that cuts the infection short. Additional behavior contagions findings from the same study include that we are 61% more likely to smoke if we have a direct relationship with a smoker. 
If your friend of a friend is a smoker, you are still 29% more likely to smoke. Even at a remote third degree of separation, friend of a friend's friend, you are 11% more likely. Recently, the third degree of separation findings have been challenged by some statisticians. But even without those findings, the overall impact of the research is powerful. A different study conducted by the same researchers, this time tracking social network contagions over a 32-year period, determined that if your spouse becomes obese, the odds of you becoming obese increase by 37%. And if a close friend becomes obese, the odds jump to 57% that you'll also pack on the pounds. Synchronized anxiety. Psychosocial contagion spread because we humans are socially interdependent. Not only do we overtly influence each other, but we also spread influence without knowing it through a form of emotional synchronization. One way to think about this dynamic is to imagine a flock of birds feeding on the ground until something startles a few of them and they take flight. Within seconds, the entire flock is taking off and flying in the same direction. The out-of-hand party scenario is one example of this. Another example is the way in which anxiety spreads through groups. In a group of any size, there will be some people more prone to anxiety than others. But research suggests that when the entire group is exposed to an anxiety-provoking stimulus, everyone eventually reaches the same level of anxiety, no matter how emotionally controlled they were initially. David Ilum, a researcher at Tel Aviv University, measured how groups of vols responded to threats produced by vol-hungry barn owls. Vols are a favorite rodent of researchers because they display very distinct social qualities, like humans, and because they display a range of anxiety responses, also like humans. When barn owls flew over the cages of individual vols, each of the animals' nervousness increased by about the same amount, as measured by standard behavioral tests. As a group, the animals continued to be all over the anxiety map. But when Elam took groups of vols with different individual anxiety levels and exposed them to barn owls, the anxiety spread throughout the group and all the vols became nervous wrecks. Elam believes that behavioral norms might be beneficial for social animals during a crisis. This convergence to similar behaviors may help explain why humans turn to religion and other rituals after a major catastrophe. These ceremonies, Elam says, may keep the most anxious humans from going over the edge. Beware the blame monsters. Blame is an especially intriguing contagion, illustrated to near perfection in a Twilight Zone episode, circa 1959, titled The Monsters Are Due on Maple Street. The setting is a calm suburban street at night that emotionally erupts after what appears to be a meteor flies overhead and the entire street experiences a total power failure. Then the neighbors receive shady news that human-like aliens from the meteor have been spotted invading Maple Street. Soon, strange things start happening, like the lights in one house turn on and off, and then a random car in the street will start up with no one in it. It doesn't take long for the neighbors to begin accusing each other of being the alien invader. Blame spreads through the community until finally someone is mistaken for an alien and killed. All the while, two aliens sit on a nearby hill controlling the power and marveling at how easy it is to manipulate human emotions. Oversimplification aside, though masterfully told by Twilight's own creator Rod Serling, the story effectively hits the point that blame spreads fast and usually ignites a few other dark emotions along the way. Science agrees. A study conducted by researchers from the University of Southern California and Stanford University suggests that blaming someone in public is the psychosocial equivalent of coughing swine flu into a crowd. Over the course of multiple experiments, researchers showed that witnessing someone play the blame game significantly increases the chances of others blaming someone else for their failures even when those failures had nothing to do with what they witnessed. Blame contagion is essentially about self-image protection. The study authors believe that when someone watches another person level blame, the implicit takeaway is that self-image protection is a goal that she should also aspire to. In this study, blame became less contagious if people wrote down and affirmed their values before they witnessed someone attribute blame, which acted as a blame antidote. The more self-affirmed people became, the more of the antidote they took, the less they felt the need to protect their image. So that's blame. What about the flip side of the emotional coin? Catching the empathy bug. More and more research suggests that happy brains have difficulty differentiating between observing an action and actually participating in it. Empathy, a contagion in its own right, seems to hinge in part on our ability to take on another's emotions through vicarious experience. I always think of this when watching a comedian fall flat. 
I can feel the embarrassment as if I'm standing there on stage looking at a room full of blank stares. Something very similar occurs when we become infected with the emotions of others, as if our brains struggle with separating from what we see happening in those around us. Research has even found that our brains respond to the pain of those close to us as if we are in pain ourselves. A study conducted by psychologists from Yale University and the University of California, Los Angeles, investigated this dynamic with an interesting angle. Researchers wanted to know if observing someone else exert self-control boosts or reduces one's own self-control. Participants were asked to either take on the perspective of someone exerting self-control or merely read about someone exerting self-control. They were also asked to take on the perspective or read about someone not exerting self-control. The results? Participants who took on the perspective of someone exerting self-control were unable to exercise as much self-control as those who merely read about someone exerting self-control. In other words, getting into the shoes of someone making the effort wore them out as if they were doing it themselves. On the flip side, participants who read about someone exerting self-control experienced a boost in their own self-control compared to those who read about someone not exerting self-control. Reading resulted in a buttressing effect rather than a vicarious one. The distinction between these results boils down to degree of psychological separation. Taking on perspective reduces psychological separation, and the more the gap closes, the greater the vicarious effect. Reading about something provides more of an opportunity to expand psychological separation, since the people you are reading about are not in front of you, which reduces the chances of vicarious effect. The implications of these findings are quite practical. For instance, if a group of people is working on a project and certain members are exerting an especially high degree of effort, this study suggests that other people in the group will experience a vicarious energy drain. An entire group's energy could be affected by the exertion of just one or two members. Another example is situations involving police officers, hospital staff, and other emergency workers whose ability to maintain self-control is essential to their jobs. It's easy to see that if they experience vicarious depletion, anything from small breakdowns to catastrophic outcomes could result. As an aside, this study also leads me to believe that self-control is at least half misnomer. Social influences affect it more than we know. On the other hand, regulating psychological distance, not something easily done, is a genuine application of self-control. If the pendulum swings too far in either direction, we either become wishy-washy emotional sponges or Dr. Spock. What Yawning Chimps Reveal About Empathy Contagious yawning, I think you will agree, is no myth, and primate research is lately indicating that it may actually tell us something about the nature of empathy. Researchers at the Yerkes National Primate Research Center, Emory University, have been deconstructing the mechanism thought to underlie contagious yawning in both chimpanzees and humans. They discover that chimpanzees yawn more after watching familiar chimps yawn than after watching strangers yawn. Yerkes researchers Matthew Campbell and Franz DeWall one of the world's leading primatologists, think that when yawning spreads between chimpanzees, it reflects an underlying empathy between those familiar with each other. They studied 23 adult chimpanzees that were housed in two separate groups. The chimps viewed several nine-second video clips of other chimpanzees in both groups, either yawning or doing something else. They yawn 50% more frequently in response to seeing members of their group yawn compared to seeing others yawn. Campbell and DeWall point out that yawns are contagious for the same reason that smiles, frowns, and other facial expressions are contagious. They are a measure of empathy. And here's the fun part. Empathy is biased. Odd as that may sound, what this research uncovers about chimps is just as true for humans. We empathize much more with those familiar to us. And this familiarity bias is demonstrated in something as basic as yawning. As we have already discussed, the happy brain is quite the biased organ. And we would expect that to be the case since brains evolved to ensure survival, and strangers to the tribe are more likely to be dangerous than those we know. Unfortunately, it often turns out that those we know are also dangerous, but that's a different topic. You can't mimic the truth. There is another significant drawback to catching the empathy bug, and we'll close out this chapter with a bit about it. Empathy research of the last 20 or so years has reinforced the mantra that mimicry, the tendency to imitate the behaviors and expressions of other people, not only smooths the wrinkles of social interaction, but also facilitates better emotional understanding. The idea being that mimicry helps people feel what others are feeling and allows speakers to more accurately understand one another. And when it comes to truthful interaction, plenty of studies suggest this is the case. But what about during deceptive interaction? If mimicry helps me better understand you, will it also help me to know when you are lying? A study conducted by psychologists at Leiden University in the Netherlands set out to answer exactly that question. 
Participants were asked to interact with and mimic or not mimic people who claimed to have made a donation to charity, some of whom really had made a donation, others of whom were lying. In total, the experiment included three participant groups operating under three conditions. One, told to mimic. Two, told not to mimic. Three, control. No instructions given. The results? Non-mimickers were significantly better at identifying the liars than mimickers. And this result held true when comparing the non-mimickers to mimickers and to the control group. Also worth noting is that all three groups were generally not very good at detecting lies, though the non-mimickers were the best. Which buttresses another well-tested theory that, overall, people are just not very good lie detectors. These results have several implications. That used car salesman who is trying to put you into a great deal, be careful not to mimic him. Ditto for just about any salesperson you come in contact with. While they may or may not be lying to you, it's best to put as much objective distance between you and them as you can, and mimicry reduces that distance. And that guy who shoulders up to you at a bookstore or coffee shop to tell you about a great business opportunity? Well, don't even talk to that guy. None of what we have discussed implies that we should not try to be empathetic. Rather, in light of what we know about the potency of emotional contagions, it's not a bad idea to be aware of potential drawbacks of getting too emotionally enmeshed too quickly. It's entirely possible to empathize with others and safeguard against getting hoodwinked at the same time. Chapter 12, The Hidden Power of Stuff The things you own end up owning you. Chuck Palahniuk, Fight Club. Brains at my fingertips. A few years ago, I was part of a group that was making a presentation to state health agencies on effective ways to educate the public about air quality. During our last practice session before the real presentation, one of the seasoned and sly presenters brought in three massive bound documents and dropped them with a thud on the left turn. Before we started, I asked him what he was going to do with them. He replied, you'll see. When it was his turn to present, I did indeed see. Every time he made reference to research backing up his assertions, he lifted one of the documents high enough for the audience to see and then judiciously dropped it onto the wood surface just enough for everyone to feel the weight of it. I never asked him if the documents actually contained the research he was mentioning, but it really didn't matter. The effect was potent. What I didn't know at the time is that this trick was making use of something cognitive psychologists call embodied cognition, the hypothesis that bodily perceptions, like touch, strongly influence how we think. Another way to explain it is that our brain is not restricted to the space between our ears. Since our entire nervous system is integral to thinking, It makes sense that the physical sensations out in the world would influence our perception. What makes this hypothesis so interesting, however, is that these influences affect us without our notice. Let's take a look at a handful of experiments that illustrate the point. Heavy is the mind. A study entitled Weight as an Embodiment of Importance sheds light on the example I used at the beginning of this chapter. Over the course of multiple experiments, researchers investigated whether judgments of importance are tied to an experience of weight. For a little context, consider how many ways in which weight, or facilitators of weight, overtly affect our judgments. In English, we use the term weighty to signify something substantial and important. We also use the term gravitas to connote seriousness, an elaboration on our understanding of gravity as a force exerting the power of weight over everything around us and ourselves. We also think of weight as an arbiter of physical strength. The more someone can lift, or looks as if he or she could lift, the more impressive. Weight is even a socioeconomic force, as in the size of someone's car or SUV. I recall when the Hummer first arrived on the scene. We heard a lot about it being a six-ton SUV, as if that specification made it more noteworthy than any other SUV. In the study, a group of participants were first asked to estimate the value of several foreign currencies while they held a clipboard. Some held a light clipboard, others held a heavy one. As predicted, participants who held the heavy clipboards estimated the value of the currency significantly higher than those who held the light clipboards. The second study repeated the first, but instead of judging currencies, participants were asked to judge the importance of having a voice in an important decision-making process. They were given a scenario involving a crucial decision affecting them being made by a university board. Again, participants holding heavy clipboards judged the importance of having a voice in the decision as more important than those holding light clipboards a result showing that even something abstract, like making a decision, is tied to experience of weight. In the final two studies, participants were asked to agree or disagree with arguments of varying strengths. This is a test of cognitive elaboration, one's tendency to assume and defend a strong position in light of given factors. 
The results again showed that people holding heavy clipboards assumed stronger, more polarized positions than those holding light clipboards and made significantly stronger arguments in defense of the positions. Opinions of those with heavy clipboards were voiced more vituperatively than the others as well. What makes this series of studies so impressive is that they cut across tangible and intangible variables, currencies versus decisions, arguments, etc., and arrived at a quite consistent result. Experience of weight affects our thinking and does so without our notice. If you're feeling warm and fuzzy, it might just be the coffee. If you have a falling out with someone and he starts ignoring you, he's giving you the cold shoulder. If you feel emotionally close to someone, you have warm feelings toward that person. We're accustomed to using metaphorical language like this to describe human relationships. But do these words also imply more literal meanings? A study in the journal Psychological Science delved into whether the actual experience of warmth or coldness influences our perception of social relationships. In other words, are temperature differences really tied to differences in social closeness and social distance? The study included three experiments. In the first, participants entered the lab and were handed either a cold or a warm beverage. They were then asked to fill out a questionnaire, which was just a prop for the study, and then asked to select a person they knew and rate their relationship with that person on a scale called the inclusion of other in self, designed to determine the degree of closeness between the subject and the person he or she selected. At no time were the subjects made aware why they were holding a warm or cold beverage. All they knew is that they were being asked to complete a few questionnaires. The results? Subjects holding the warm beverage had a significantly higher level of perceived closeness to the individual they selected than subjects holding the cold beverage, bearing out the hypothesis that physical warmth is tied to perception of social warmth. The second experiment investigated whether watching film clips in a warm or cold room influenced the choice of language used to describe the film, with the hypothesis being that warmer temperatures will influence subjects to use more concrete language, such as John punched David, versus more abstract descriptions. John is angry with David. The results were that subjects watching in the warm room did in fact use more concrete language to describe the film than did subjects in the cold room, who used abstract terms to describe the same clips. Previous research has shown that use of concrete language strongly correlates with a sense of social closeness, whereas abstract language correlates with social distance. Come heavy and sit hard. A well-publicized study published in 2010 did an especially nice job of bearing out the embodied cognition theory. Researchers from MIT, Harvard, and Yale performed six experiments exploring whether the hardness, weight, shape, and texture of certain objects affect our decisions about totally unrelated situations. For example, the study shows that when you're negotiating a deal, it's better to sit in a hard, sturdy chair. Doing so may lead you to negotiate harder than you otherwise would. And when you go for a job interview, be sure to carry your resume in a weighty, well-constructed portfolio. According to the study, Job candidates appear more important when they are associated with heavy objects. And when you invite your date over for dinner, keep the setting smooth. Objects with a rough texture make social interactions seem more difficult than they really are. So put away those glasses with the beveled edges, and your evening will stand a better chance of success. Having covered influence from multiple angles, we will now move on to topics so central to our lives, we would be lost without them. Literally lost. Part 5. Memory and Modeling Chapter 13. Your Mind in Rewrites Time and memory are true artists. They remold reality nearer to the heart's desire. John Dewey, Reconstruction in Philosophy Are you sure you saw X? As a consulting analyst for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, I spent quite a bit of time conducting research to find out if a national campaign to raise awareness about childhood lead poisoning was reaching the eyes and ears of the right people parents of young children in cities with older housing. One of the ways the lead awareness message was advertised was in pre-movie reels at movie theaters in multiple cities. I conducted on-site research at theaters in Baltimore that included two types of in-person surveys, a pre-movie survey to determine people's knowledge of the lead poisoning issue, and a post-movie survey to determine if people had been influenced by the lead awareness message. The first survey established a benchmark of awareness. The second gauged how much the advertising had elevated awareness. At the same time, the post-movie survey determined to what extent people recalled the lead awareness advertisement. After the first couple on-site studies, it became clear to me that something odd was going on. I knew going in that under the best circumstances, we would see at most a 30 to 40 percent recall rate for the advertisement, realistically closer to 25 percent. Yet we were getting 60 to 80 percent results at the movie theaters, double the expected rate, and virtually unprecedented for this sort of public outreach. 
So in the next theater study, I decided we should begin asking a couple new questions in the post-movie survey to determine if people could recall details about the advertisement and not just a message. Doing this revealed that relatively few people could recall anything specific about the advertisement, although they claimed that they did recall seeing the lead poisoning awareness message. What was really happening? After some digging, I reached a few conclusions. Chief among them, that people were unknowingly picking up on shards of information in the theater lobby, such as briefly seeing the EPA logo at a table we were using, and some had heard the words lead poisoning as they walked by other people being interviewed, or overheard people that had completed the survey talking about it on their way out of the theater. The reality was that no more than 30% were actually recalling the pre-movie advertisement. Others had assembled enough fragmented information that they were sure they must have seen it. The fragments commingled in their memory, and when they were asked a question that served as a sort of mental glue for the fragments, they were sure they had seen the ad. This example illustrates a simple truth that we are typically reticent to admit. Our memories are wrong at least as often as they are right. At best, they are incomplete, though we might swear otherwise. This affects countless aspects of our lives, and in many cases our memories, true or false, affect others' lives. But before exploring the fallibility of memory in greater detail, let's take a few minutes for an overview of what we know about how memory works. A brief primer on memory. Memory can be separated into two main divisions, explicit and implicit. Explicit memory, also called declarative memory, principally holds words, numbers, and events. Or, to use the parlance of neurobiology, it is memory that's semantic and episodic. When we are trying to remember what happened on the camping trip we took with our in-laws in late 2004, for example, explicit memory is engaged. Implicit memory, also called non-declarative memory, is where so-called muscle memory is found. The motor skills that, once learned, are always available to us. How is it that you never have to remember how to clip your nails or brush your teeth? Because implicit memory has you covered. Those are the two main divisions of memory. But there are also two temporal, time-based memory categories. The first is working memory, or what we usually call short-term memory, the category of memory that includes anything we are actively thinking about right now. In earlier models of memory, working and short-term memory were considered two different categories with short-term thought of as a passive holding zone for information with closer links to attention and awareness. But in current memory parlance, these categories are synonymous. The second category is long-term memory, the place where everything remembered resides. Long-term memory is engaged in the short-term, for example, word memorization, and in the long-term, for example, childhood memories. One way to think about short-term, working memory, versus long-term memory is that anything actively in your awareness right now involves short-term memory. In most views, short-term memory has extremely limited capacity, about seven items at a time. Long-term memory includes anything that is not currently active but could be recalled and made active. This could be anything from information you crammed for an exam yesterday to the address of the house you lived in when you were eight years old. Perhaps the most exciting neuroscience discovery of the last several decades is that our brains are not static hunks of tissue, but flexible and adaptive organs that change throughout our lives. The term used to describe this new understanding is brain plasticity. The flexibility of your brain is essential to memory and indispensable to learning. Specifically, the plastic parts of our brain are synapses, the connection points that allow neurons to transmit signals between each other. Hypermagnification of synapses in an adult human brain shows various sizes and shapes, some shaped like mushrooms, others shaped more like small hills, and others shaped like broad-based mountains. The incredible part is that in your brain and mine, Synapses are morphing from one shape to the next depending on the need, how fluid the connection between neurons needs to be, for example, and this continues happening throughout our lives. Another discovery related to brain plasticity is that the amount of activity between neurons corresponds directly to how strong their connection will continue to be. Cognitive scientists commonly use the phrase, neurons that fire together, wire together. What this means in terms of memory is that the more intense the activity is between neurons constituting your memory of any given event, the more robust the memory will be. That is one reason why emotionally charged memories frequently percolate to consciousness in vivid detail. I can still remember almost exactly where I was standing outside my high school in Florida just after the space shuttle Challenger exploded. I was looking up at the sky and could see the entire shape of the explosion outlined in smoke. All where were you when moments have a degree of the same intensity, which makes them easier to recall than anything else that was happening at the time. In fact, as I was researching this information, history transpired. The president announced that Osama bin Laden had been killed. I feel as though I now have bookend memories of the horrible events of 
I can recall in detail what I was doing when I first learned of the terrorist attacks in 2001. And now I will have a memory of where I was when the mastermind of that attack was finally dispatched almost 10 years later. These are powerful emotional events accompanied by intense neural activity. The imprint, though still imperfect, remains with us for a lifetime. That is not true, however, for most memories. Even for the sharper memories born from strong emotions, often called flashbulb memories, time erodes the infrastructure, leaving cracks and gaps. Instead of remembering specific, perfectly accurate details, what constitutes memory over time are general impressions of events with spotty details. And the older we get, the spottier they become. Remember once, forget twice. To figure out why that happens, among other perturbations, cognitive science has tackled memory more aggressively than perhaps any other topic. As a result, we have a growing wealth of research to draw upon to better understand the quixotic art of remembering. What we now know is that our brains happily reconstruct memories, though we are frequently fooled into thinking that the reconstructions are seamlessly recorded recollections. What I want to convince you of in this chapter is that our memories are anything but concrete and can be altered with relative ease. That's the bad news. The good news is that imperfect memory is an evolutionary adaptation that serves our species well much of the time. Loss of memory and creation of new memory is central to a relatively efficient system of information processing that never sleeps. The selective movement of information into long-term memory is an adaptive marvel that allows our brains to store crucial pieces of information that we will rely on in the future and shed information not worth holding on to. The process is not neat and tidy, and memory selectivity often works against us. Think about how many memories you would love to forget. But when you view the process through the lens of species survival, it makes unassailable sense. In those terms, it is crucial to remember where the best sources of food are located, where the best hunting grounds are located, which areas to avoid lest you become something else's dinner, and how to return safely back home. For our ancestors, reliance on memory of particular details was a matter of life and death. The problem for us moderns is that memory, incredible adaptation though it is, faces relentless challenges in societies driven by information. We simply have too much to remember at any given time, and the vast majority of our brains are not equipped to handle the deluge. Our expectations for what we should be able to recall are hardly in line with what our brains are capable of processing, which, by the way, is an enormous amount. We have also adopted inaccurate metaphors for memory that lead us to incorrect conclusions. The bookshelf metaphor, for example, which suggests that when we need to recall a memory, we simply find it categorized on a mental shelf ready for consumption. Or the computer metaphor, which suggests that our brains store files on a cerebral hard drive that we can access as we would files on our laptop. These and similar metaphors are wrong for roughly the same reason. Memory does not reside in any one place in our brains, but rather is distributed across multiple brain regions. But because we more easily connect with a metaphor like those rather than the messy truth of distributed and reconstructed memory, the misunderstandings persist. Next, we will review a few experiments that put a finer point on just how changeable memory can be. A photo is worth a thousand ways to change your memory. Most of us realize that memory is fallible because of the little things that happen all the time. We forget things like car keys, passwords, whether we've turned off the oven, and so on. But how many of us would admit that our memory is susceptible to change from the outside? That's different from simply forgetting, something we all do on our own, because someone else changing our memories requires getting in our head, so to speak, right? The truth is that this sort of outside-in influence does not take very much effort to accomplish. Just a few images and a little time. A study conducted by Linda Henkel in the Department of Psychology at Fairfield University tested whether showing people photos of completed actions, such as a broken pencil or an opened envelope, could influence them to believe they'd done something they had not, particularly if they were shown the photos multiple times. Participants were presented with a series of objects on a table, and for each object they were asked to either perform an action or imagine performing an action. For example, crack the walnut. One week later, the same participants were brought back and randomly presented with a series of photos on a computer screen, each of a completed action, for example, a cracked walnut, either one, two, or three times. Other participants were not shown any photos. One week later, they were brought back to complete a memory test in which they were presented with action phrases, for example, I cracked a walnut, and asked to answer whether they had performed the action, imagined performing it, or neither, and rate their confidence level for each answer on a scale of 1 to 4. The results showed that the more times people were exposed to a photo of a completed action, the more often they thought they'd completed the action, even though they had really only imagined doing it. 
Those shown a photo of a completed action once were twice as likely to mistakenly think they'd completed the action than those not shown a photo at all. People shown a photo three times were almost three times as likely to think they had completed the action as those not shown a photo. Two factors in this study speak to the malleability of memory. The first is duration of time. The experiment was carried out with a week between each session. Enough time for the specific objects and actions to become a little cloudy in memory, but not enough time to be forgotten. This lines up well with real-world situations, such as someone providing eyewitness testimony in which several days, if not weeks, might elapse between recollections of events. The second factor is repeat exposure to images. The study showed that even just one exposure to a photo of a completed action strongly influenced incorrect memory, while multiple exposures significantly increased the errors. If the video says so, then I must be guilty. So if static images can be used to manipulate our memories, what about video? After all, in a world dominated by endlessly pliable electronic media, you can never be 100% sure that what you're seeing on screen is what really happened. Two memory studies conducted by researchers Kimberly Wade, Sarah Green, and Robert Nash at the University of Warwick, UK, illustrate that point nicely. In the first study, researchers wanted to know if they could convince people that they had committed an act they never did. To accomplish this, they created a computerized multiple-choice gambling task for participants to complete, which entailed increasing the winnings from a sum of money as much as possible by answering questions. The money was withdrawn from an online bank based on cues given to participants by the computer program. When they answered questions correctly, they were told to withdraw money from the bank. When they answered incorrectly, they were instructed to deposit money back into the bank. Subjects were videotaped while they completed the task. Afterward, participants were asked to sit and discuss the task with a researcher. During the discussion, the researcher said he had identified a problem during the task and then accused the participant of stealing money from the bank. Some of the participants were told that video evidence showed them taking the money, but they weren't actually shown the video, while others were shown video proving that they took the money. What the participants didn't know is that the video had been edited to make it appear as if they did something they had not. Participants were then asked to sign a confession stating that they did in fact take money from the bank when they should have deposited it back. Participants were given two chances to sign a confession, and by the end of the day, all of them did. In fact, 87% signed on the first request, and the remaining 13% signed on the second. Interestingly, even participants merely told that the video showed them taking the money eventually complied with the confession. The next study used the same principle, but this time to see if people would accuse someone else of doing something they had not. Again, a gambling task was used, but instead of one person completing it, two people placed side by side completed it, sitting not even a foot apart with monitors in full view of each other. Subjects were videotaped as before, and the video was doctored as before to show one of the two participants taking money. Afterward, the innocent participant was asked to discuss the task with a researcher and told that video proof had been obtained showing that the other participants stole money. In order to pursue action against that person, the researcher said, the innocent participant would have to sign a witness statement corroborating the video evidence. Some of the participants were, as before, only told that the video existed, while others were shown the edited video and there was also a control group neither told about nor shown video. The results? When first asked to sign the witness statement against the other person, nearly 40% of the participants who watched the video complied. Another 10% signed when asked a second time. Only 10% of those who were only told about the video agreed to sign, and about 5% of the control group signed the statement. These results point to the alarming power of video to shape and distort memory, not only about others, but about ourselves as well. In the first study, it wasn't only watching a video that made a difference. Merely being told that a video existed made nearly as big an impact. And it is worth noting that in the second study, some of the people who signed the witness statement became so convinced that the other person was guilty that they went on to insert even more details of suspicious behavior, as if they knew the other person was doing something wrong all along. Trusting your way into false memories. The examples we just discussed addressed what can happen to our memory when visual information is manipulated. Let's now remove the visual element and focus instead on how the integrity of information received affects memory, or, more precisely, the integrity of the information provider. If, for example, you follow a news commentator closely, reading everything he or she writes in whatever venue it appears, you may unknowingly be in a trust trap. Studies have shown that once we invest trust in a particular source of knowledge, we're less likely to scrutinize information from that source in the future. A study conducted by Elizabeth Loftus at the University of California, Irvine, and her team took this investigation a step further. 
showing that the trust trap can also result in the creation of false memories, and not only in the short term. Researchers crafted an experimental design in which they exposed two groups of participants to a series of images, followed by narration about the images. The first group, referred to as the treat-trick group, received mostly accurate narration about the images. The comparison group received mostly misinformation. Both groups then completed tests of recall to determine how much accurate versus inaccurate information they remembered. One month later, the participants were brought back to undergo the same experiment, except this time the tree trick group was given misinformation during a narration, i.e. the trick, as was the comparison group. Both groups again completed tests of recall. Here's what happened. In the first session, the treat trick group had a significantly higher rate of true memory versus the comparison group, which we would expect since only the comparison group was given misinformation during this session, at a rate of about 82% for the treat trick group and 57% for the comparison group. But in the second session, in which both groups were given misinformation one month later, the treat trick group had significantly lower true memory recall than the comparison group, 47% versus 58%. The most likely reason for this effect is that the treat trick group fell into a trust trap. Because information provided by the narrative source in the first session was accurate and test scores were high as a result, participants believed the source to be credible and trustworthy. The comparison group, on the other hand, had no reason to invest trust in the original source and exhibited recall at roughly the same level for both sessions. What's most interesting is the time frame of this effect. Researchers conducted the sessions a month apart, allowing ample time for a trust effect to wear off but it didn't. Once again, we see that the real-world implications of this research are important. Eyewitness testimony can be changed when a witness listens to an information source she has previously trusted as credible, media, interrogators, or other people. And this study suggests that the window of opportunity for this effect is large. Any follow-up information received by an eyewitness from any number of sources can significantly alter his or her memory. False beliefs, spawn of false memories. If there's anything that cognitive psychology studies have made clear over the years, it's that humans can be exceptionally gullible. With a little push, we're prone to developing false beliefs not only about others, but also about ourselves with equal prowess. And the results can be, well, hard to believe. And at the core of many of these false beliefs live false memories. For example, a study in 2001 asked participants to rate the plausibility of having witnessed demonic possession as children and their confidence that they had actually experienced one. Later, the same participants were given articles describing how commonly children witness demonic possessions, along with interviews with adults who claim to have witnessed possessions as children. After reading the articles, participants not only rated demonic possession as more plausible than they'd previously said, but also became more confident that they themselves had actually experienced demonic possession as children. Another less dramatic study asked participants to rate the plausibility that they'd experienced barium enemas as children. As with the other study, Participants were later presented with credible information about the prevalence of barium enemas among children, along with step-by-step procedures for administering an enema. And again, the participants rated the plausibility of having received a barium enema as children significantly higher than they had before. A study conducted by researcher Stephanie Sharman at the University of South Wales sought to determine the effect of prevalence information, information that establishes how commonly an event happens, making it seem more likely and therefore more relevant on the development of false beliefs. Participants were asked to rate the plausibility of 10 events from 1, not at all plausible, to 8, extremely plausible, and how confident they were that they'd experienced each event from 1, definitely did not happen, to 8, definitely did happen. The events included a range of highly plausible, I got lost in a shopping mall as a child, to the highly implausible, I was abducted by a UFO. Two weeks later, participants were brought back and given information on four of the events they'd previously rated, all in the low to moderate plausibility range, no UFOs. The information included newspaper articles, third-person descriptions, and data from previous study subjects, all of which were designed to establish higher prevalence of the events. The results showed that high prevalence information from all sources affected the development of false beliefs. In particular, Participants given high prevalence information in false newspaper articles became more confident that they had actually experienced the events, testifying to the power of the printed word on memory. The takeaway here probably has a few prongs. First, we shouldn't discount the possibility that we're just as susceptible to developing false beliefs as anyone else walking around on this planet. The brain is a superb miracle of errors, and no one except the brainless is exempt. On the other hand, 
Knowing that to be true is also the best preventative against chasing the make-believe rabbit down its hole. Last word, total future recall. If you stop and think about it, the ability to construct future scenarios in our minds is really quite remarkable. As far as we know, all other species, including our closest primate relatives, react to events as they occur. They can learn from these events and apply that learning in the future. Think of chimpanzees learning how to catch ants by poking a stick into the mound and doing the same thing for every new ant mound they find. But they do not assemble complex pieces of information into a coherent whole of the future. How exactly do we accomplish this? As with many issues in cognitive science, it is difficult to say for certain. But the latest thinking is that we engage in something called episodic future thinking, which means that we simulate the future by using elements from the past. Recent brain imaging studies show that some of the brain regions that are activated when recalling a personal memory, the posterior cingulate gyrus, parahippocampal gyrus, and left occipital lobe, are also active when thinking about a future event. Our future simulations are obviously not carbon copy replicas of the past, but we draw on experience to generate the simulations in the same way that a sketch artist uses the pieces of information provided to her to compose an image. Sometimes we get close, other times we are far off. The farther removed the future scenario is from actual experience, the less likely it is to be in the proverbial ballpark. Perhaps this ability, among other abstract thinking abilities, confers an adaptive advantage. For the happy brain to make anywhere near accurate predictions about our environment, it helps to have access to as much past information as possible to construct multiple scenarios of what could happen. It could be that what we lack in instinctual gumption, like that of other primates, we make up for in imagination. The ability is far from perfect, but it is the most powerful organically based prediction tool yet evolved. Chapter 14. Born to Copy, Learn to Practice. Smooth ice is paradise for those who dance with expertise. Frederick Nietzsche, The Gay Science. The Marx Brothers were masters of comic timing, as hilariously demonstrated in a 1933 movie, Duck Soup. Groucho, Harpo, and Chico appear in the famous grease paint eyebrows, mustache, and round glasses while wearing nightcaps. They are so indistinguishable, it's almost impossible to tell them apart, which makes the famous mirror scene work perfectly. In the scene, Groucho stands on one side of a doorway and Harpo and Chico on the other, though not at the same time. Every move Groucho makes is imitated by one of the other two, creating the illusion that the doorway is actually a mirror. Groucho is suspicious and tries to throw off his reflection, but he's met move for move by the imitators for several minutes, until they finally make a mistake and both appear in the doorway at the same time. I'm sure the Marx Brothers didn't realize that they were giving a comic illustration of a hardwired aspect of the human brain that is central to our growth and development. We are all born imitators, and a good chunk of our lives is spent playing out the evolutionary version of the mirror scene. A happy brain is happy to copy, and doing so is largely an automatic as opposed to voluntary response. Just to be clear, this is not the same as saying that we emerge from the womb like a blank sheet of paper ready to be scribbled on. But we are born ready to reproduce observed behaviors, and without this ability, we would be truly lost in the woods. Several other species aren't quite so lost when they enter the world. If you have ever had the opportunity to watch a horse give birth, it is remarkable to see the foal almost immediately try to stand just after emerging. The pre-wiring to get a fast start asserts itself with hardly a moment to spare. Baby chimpanzees are, like human babies, very vulnerable and unable to do much for themselves for about a year. But just after being born, they are able to cling to their mother without having any example to follow. They are, in a sense, hardwired to cling, and the behavior automatically happens. We humans, on the other hand, are born with really only one noticeable capability, to observe. We cannot sit upright or cling or stand, but our powerful brains are doing something that, with time, proves significantly more beneficial than any of those abilities. We are the top dog learners on the planet, and our cerebral reign starts early. That's the good news. The not-so-good news is that our brain's fantastic ability to learn by imitation can become a handicap when we veer into the stratum of over-imitation. Added to that, a happy brain does not seem to have an especially effective on-off switch when it comes to imitation. When someone completely lacks the ability to regulate imitation, they suffer from a disorder known as ecopraxia. Their brain simply does not have an inhibiting factor to prevent imitation of others' actions. This disorder is readily found in those suffering from autism. The distinction between the self and the other appears to be blurred in those with ecopraxia, almost as if the brain cannot tell if it is looking at a reflection or another person. 
Most of us, of course, do not have ecopraxia, but our normal functioning brains are marginally handicapped nonetheless. What kids teach us about imitation? Psychology research on imitation suggests that when children are instructed to repeat an adult's behavior, they aren't doing so only to reach the goal. The behavior itself becomes as important as the goal. This may be because human children can be easily persuaded to believe what adults tell them even when it contradicts their own senses, or because our most potent hardwired learning strategy is imitation, even when such imitation seems illogical. A study titled The Hidden Structure of Overimitation in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences focused on that last point. Using a repeat-this-action method, researchers tried to gain a better understanding as to why children will repeat irrelevant adult actions, something even chimps aren't prone to do. Kids in the study were told to imitate an adult's actions to retrieve an object from a puzzle box that had a variety of strange gizmos attached, none of which were needed to get the object. Even when given explicit directions to simply retrieve the object, and it was obvious that only one action was needed to do so, the kids would imitate every action taken by adults, pointlessly pulling and pressing the gizmos before grabbing the prize just as the adults did. When the same test was conducted with chimps, they simply retrieved the object as instructed. Researchers concluded that this tendency is more than a human social dynamic in the making. It's a cognitive encoding process at the core of how we learn, and it comes at a cost. Children who observe an adult intentionally manipulating an object have a strong tendency to encode all of the adult's actions as meaningful. From the study, this automatic causal encoding process allows children to rapidly calibrate their causal beliefs about even the most opaque physical systems, but it also carries a cost. When some of the adult's purposeful actions are unnecessary, even transparently so, children are highly prone to misencoding them as significant. So this study suggests that the same encoding process that allows us to develop a sense of an action's significance also makes us prone, as children, to misencoding purposeless actions as causally significant. This effect is so potent that, once engaged, it's extremely difficult to break. What this means in the context of learning through practice is that humans begin life with a propensity to learn the wrong way, as well as the right way. Bad lessons are learned as readily as good ones, and we may not even know the difference. Now we will shift the discussion to applications of learning through practice, starting with the now infamous specter of expertise. What we hear about expertise and why it doesn't really matter. Much has been said in recent years about expertise and the time and effort requirements of attaining it, and there are several books out there that dive into the details more than I plan to here. We have heard about the 10,000-hour rule, that expertise requires at least 10,000 hours of practice. I won't spend any time challenging or affirming the rule. Suffice it to say that whatever the actual amount of time required to gain expertise, it is a substantial multi-year investment. Indeed, it may consume a massive portion of our lives. Clearly, though, time is not the only requirement. Years of one's life spent practicing the wrong things will not lead to expertise any more than spending the same amount of time watching television. Time is a basic prerequisite, but not a sufficient one in itself. Layered upon time are a slew of other ingredients, like focus, precision, discipline, and desire, to say nothing of effective teachers along the way. It also doesn't hurt to have a few breaks go your way as well. We will leave the discussion of expertise there because, in my view, it is more a topic du jour than it is a topic worth talking about. More basic to most of our lives is how to gain a level of mastery in the things we do, or would like to do, without burning ourselves out or giving up prematurely. And what I want to argue is that those two pitfalls are always very real possibilities for the happy brain, chiefly because we have to push against some stubborn inbuilt tendencies to get where we want to go. You don't know what you don't know. Anyone who has ever been hired into a position he is not qualified for is in touch with a horribly awkward sensation, one akin to feeling lost. What we thought we knew about how to perform in the position turns out to be wrong or incomplete. The things we need to know to do the job are not clear. The phrase over your head is appropriate, because truly what we don't know is threatening to engulf us. People who open restaurants for the first time are known to say that they had no idea what they were getting into. From the outside looking in, they saw only one thin slice of an enormous undertaking. When they started coming face to face with those facets of the business they did not even know existed, the reality that they were barely toddlers in a game of grown-ups started settling in. Of course, it is preferable to start somewhere rather than not start at all, and that's exactly what most of us do. But we are fooling ourselves to think we will saunter into a new role, job, trade, or any other position fully equipped with what we need to succeed. What we should be thinking, rather, is how to ramp up as quickly as possible to the needs of the position. 
That only happens through what expertise scholar K. Anders Eriksson calls deliberate practice. Practice designed to develop mastery in the specific areas required by whatever role or position we are targeting. Whether one puts in 10,000 hours or 50,000 hours, without deliberate practice, the effort will still fall short. This is a crucial point, because energy wasted on poorly directed practice is a drain on the brain. And the more time you spend in that mode without results to show for it, the greater the tendency to burn out and give up. To generalize or specialize, that is the question. Central to the topic of deliberate practice, or what I will simply call practicing for the purpose, is the question of whether general or specialized problem-solving strategies are more effective. It is an important question with implications for how skills are taught, most important, thinking. General problem-solving strategies are context-independent. For example, if Charlie the policeman is taught the general strategy for safely disarming criminals, then he should be able to apply it to a general range of situations in which he faces armed criminals. The general strategy, this argument goes, produces generally applicable problem-solving ability. On the other hand, with his general strategy for disarming criminals, Charlie may in fact be fairly effective unless and until he encounters a specific situation that trumps his general ability. He may, for example, be expert at taking away a criminal's handgun, but what happens if he encounters a criminal with another gun tucked in the back of his pants and a knife concealed in his sock? If Charlie never faced or trained for that situation, or one very much like it, he may be in for more than his problem-solving strategy can handle. A study published in the journal Cognitive Science backs up the argument for specialization, albeit with a less exciting example than disarming criminals. Expert chess players specialized in different openings were asked to recall positions and solve problems within and outside their area of specialization. All the players' general expertise was roughly at the same level. The results? Players performed significantly better in their area of specialization, but not only better. They actually played over their own heads at the level of chess players with much better general skills. In other words, specialization trumped general problem solving and elevated the player's level of play. This study suggests that when figuring out how to tackle a problem, knowledge derived from familiarity with that problem is more important than general problem solving strategies. The key is memory. We rely on memory of specific experiences to craft solutions to new problems. If you have expert general ability but lack context-specific memory, you're only as effective as general ability will allow. And if you're Charlie, that might not be good enough. Practice lessons from taxi drivers and burglars. London taxi drivers have to undertake years of intense training known as the knowledge to gain their operating license including learning the layout of over 25,000 of the city streets. A study by psychologist Catherine Woolett and her team investigated whether their expertise can be effectively generalized in new situations. The taxi drivers and a control group were first asked to watch videos of routes unfamiliar to them through a town in Ireland. They were then asked to take a test about the video that included sketching out routes, identifying landmarks, and estimating distances between places. The taxi drivers and the control subjects both did well on much of the test, but the taxi drivers did significantly better on identifying new routes. This result suggests that the taxi driver's mastery can be generalized to new and unknown areas. Their years of training and learning through deliberate practice prepare them to take on similar challenges even in places they do not know well or at all. Burglars, as it turns out, have much in common with taxi drivers, at least in the sense of developing mastery. Researchers interviewed 50 jailed burglars, all of whom had committed at least 20 burglaries in the last three years. Half had committed more than 100 burglaries. The researchers asked questions regarding what technique the burglars used to search inside houses. Over three-quarters of them described searching as relatively routine, and many of them used terms such as automatic and instinctive. The study also found that on average, it took an experienced burglar less than 20 minutes to identify everything in the house worth stealing and walk out with it. For the most part, burglar said, they didn't really have to think about what they were doing. Years of practice on similar houses with similar layouts and possessions enabled autopilot to take over while the burglars went to work. While not evidenced by terrific role models by any means, from a mastery standpoint, these results are uncomfortably enlightening. Parting thoughts. Coaches like to tell their players to work smart, and that is actually a fitting phrase to end this chapter. The happy brain is willing to work. But when we plow into a new endeavor without a sense of direction and purpose in our practice, negative results are sure to come, namely burnout, disillusionment, and eventually giving up. 
better to instill focus early on and seek out whatever assistance we need to make our practice purposeful and worthwhile. Part 6. Nothing so pure as action. Chapter 15. Mind the Gap. Action is character. F. Scott Fitzgerald, from Notes to an Unfinished Novel, The Love of the Last Tycoon. I'm standing near the deli counter at the supermarket. Close to me are five or six other people, and we are all eyeing the same quarry. Rotisserie chickens turning on a spit in the monster-sized oven against the far wall. The timer on the oven tells us that there are just over three minutes left before the chickens are ready. More people gather. I inch closer to the counter. The others do the same. I can feel a tension thickening in the atmosphere. My nerves are starting to peak. My heart is beating faster. I stop for a second and ask myself why I feel this way. All of us standing at the counter can see that there are more than enough chickens available for the crowd. Even if there weren't, we are in a grocery store full of food. No one is going to starve in this scenario. In addition, we are all adults capable of civilly dividing the chickens among us when they arrive. None of us will have to fight for our food or risk our lives against other predators to secure our family's sustenance. And yet, the tension persists. What I know for sure is that I cannot undo my brain's tendency to amp my energy level and alertness to ensure that I get the food I came for, a tendency that has been neurally hardwired for good reason and been shown to be valuable under certain conditions. What I can do is recognize what is happening, identify why the reaction is out of place for the circumstances, and relax. That simple example illustrates the two things that must happen for us to effectively address the problematic tendencies of a happy brain. Elevate awareness and take action. Awareness of why we are doing what we are doing is a crucial step toward action because it initiates a change in thinking. We have to pause to examine what's going on. And this is why science help is more useful than typical self-help. Gleaning evidence-based clues from cognitive science provides tools to bolster awareness and enable action. I'm certainly not arguing that they provide a foolproof roadmap for action, but my hope is that after hearing an audiobook like this one, you will have more usable knowledge to work with than you did before. The vital point to remember is that the gap between knowing and doing is ever-present until we commit to acting. For the rest of this chapter, I am going to offer a selection of knowledge clues drawn from research discussed throughout the book. Many of them build on discussions from earlier chapters. A few are new to this one. 1. Slow down. So many problems can be diffused by slowing down and carefully considering how to proceed in any given situation. In some instances, of course, there isn't time to slow down and we have to just react. But generally, we have more time than we allot ourselves to make decisions and draw conclusions. Putting on the mental brakes can stop you, for example, from reacting in anger to someone on the road, a situation that can rapidly escalate out of control. Slowing down provides time to consider how an issue has been framed and whether we really have considered all the relevant factors. Pausing for just a moment can allow you to challenge yourself about an action you are about to take that could have horrible consequences like responding to an email on your smartphone while driving instead of waiting until you can focus on the message you want to send, instead of parsing attention between the email and driving. Slowing down is, in short, fundamental to nearly every topic in this book. If more of us would just take a couple extra moments to think an action through, we would all be much better off. 2. Be aware of the influence your pre-existing beliefs are exerting on your current thinking. We are all biased thinkers. No one is a blank slate and therefore no one's perception is free from the influence of pre-existing beliefs. The question is, are we aware this is the case? Racists often justify their comments by saying, that's how I was raised. And that may be true. Childhood imprinting is a major source of pre-existing beliefs. And most are resistant to deconstruction. But forcing ourselves to be aware of this influence on a case-by-case -case basis can, with time, challenge the entire infrastructure of questionable belief. Cognitive psychology research reinforces this message again and again by showing that incremental change is a more effective way to go than attempting exhaustive change. Challenging ingrained patterns of thought takes work, time, and persistence. 3. Check your availability bias. As mentioned earlier in the audiobook, a happy brain tends to make judgments using the most accessible and available information. For example, People typically judge the incidence of crime as much higher than it actually is. The reason cited by psychology researchers is that the news media focuses on crime, thus increasing its availability and accessibility to the audience. The same thing happens when you expose yourself to one perspective and ignore others. 
The availability of that perspective about politics, for instance, leads to a bias that the chosen perspective is the correct one. If all the radio talk shows you listen to trumpet generally one perspective, we can safely predict how you will respond to different positions. Simply knowing this can be enough to challenge thinking, but frequently this bias is connected to related tendencies like confirmation bias and framing, discussed in Chapter 1, and substantial effort, along with more than a little humility, is needed to move in another direction. 4. Become savvy about framing. Earlier we spoke of the brain's tendency to sound alarms when focus moves outside the parameters of a perceptual frame. Perhaps while you were growing up, your parents and siblings told you and everyone else that you were the smart one in the family, while your brother was the athletic one. You didn't realize that years of ingesting these labels framed your self-perception. Without ever really challenging the point, you simply expected to be less athletic than your brother, and that influenced you to not participate in sports, but rather spend time being the smart kid who gets all A's. Said another way, you were complicit in keeping the not-athletic frame created by your family in place. Thinking differently of yourself just doesn't feel right. In fact, it makes you anxious and uncomfortable. Breaking a deeply internalized frame like this is extremely difficult. Just becoming aware that it exists is a major step. On a more day-to-day basis, we encounter dubious framing all the time. The way statistics are presented, or the way an argument is structured, for example. Developing the skill to deconstruct the frame allows us to see alternative explanations and can also keep us from getting scammed by the unscrupulous. 5. Engage others to help you keep accountable to your commitments. It is important not to confuse this statement with asking others to help you keep your commitments. The suggestion here is that when you make your commitments public with a select few friends and or family and ask them to check in with you on progress, you are giving yourself even more incentive to reach your goals assuming the opinions of those people matter to you. This suggestion builds from the realization that we are an interdependent species, not a wholly independent one. For most of us, asking others whom we respect to inject some accountability into our commitments can help produce better results. 6. Act on short-term rewards that will eventually yield long-term benefits. As we have discussed, the happy brain tends to focus on the short-term. That being the case, it's a good idea to consider what short-term goals we can accomplish that will eventually lead to accomplishing long-term goals. For instance, if you want to lose 30 pounds in six months, just in time for swimsuit season, what short-term goals can you associate with losing smaller increments of weight that will get you there? Maybe it's something as simple as rewarding yourself each week that you lose two pounds. The same thinking can be applied to any number of goals, like quitting smoking or improving performance at work. By breaking the overall goal into smaller, shorter-term parts, we can focus on incremental accomplishments instead of being overwhelmed by the enormity of the goal. 7. Make goals tangible and measurable. Continuing the discussion of goals, it helps to make them tangible, recalling that the happy brain is value and reward-oriented. Losing weight has an obvious, tangible, and measurable result. Benefits from quitting smoking may not be as obvious right away, but tracking how you felt before you quit and how you feel a few months later makes the goal tangible. This little trick is called feedback analysis. Simply taking a few notes on yourself, on your physical and mental well-being, for example, not to mention how much money you saved, and then revisiting those notes a few weeks or months later will provide tangible evidence of the goal's value. The ways in which this tool can be applied are limitless, provided that your pre- and post-assessments are honest and, to the best of your ability, unbiased. Eight. The hunt is more exciting than the capture. One of our brain's especially frustrating habits is to focus on getting a reward and then experience a feeling of loss once we get it. This cycle can spin us into a loop of wanting, getting, and regretting. Awareness that you are caught in the cycle is paramount. If you are bidding on items online and find yourself compelled to keep bidding up the price of an item beyond its value or what you intended to spend, force yourself to become aware that what you are doing is no longer in your best interest. The action part is harder because you have to walk away from the target. If you don't, you cannot expect merely thinking rationally to correct the problem, because it rarely ever does. We are master justifiers, and almost any rational reason given by ourselves or others for stopping an action can be dismantled in minutes or less. Action in this case is necessarily absolute. Stop and walk away. If the circumstances call for it, run. 9. Envision competing future narratives, but check your self-serving bias. We have seen that our brains have difficulty placing us in the future, 
which makes making sound decisions that impact the long term a hard thing to do. We have also discussed that memory has both looking back and looking forward dimensions. We tend to simulate the future by reconstructing the past, and the reconstruction is rarely accurate. What can we do? Envision competing narratives of the future, good and bad. At the same time, make sure that we aren't coloring those narratives with what psychologists call self-serving bias, which leads us to believe that our success will be due to our actions and any failures will result from other factors. For example, a student studies for an exam and is convinced that if he earns a high grade, it will be due to his intelligence and hard work. If he doesn't get a high grade, it will only be because the exam was poorly written or the instructor weighted the grades unfairly. The student's future narrative has only one dimension. Hard work and intelligence will result in a high grade. While it may seem odd to suggest envisioning failure in our own hands, it's not a bad grounding exercise to avoid this sort of one-dimensional thinking. Failure is a possibility and should be recognized as such even though we are obviously designing our actions for success. 10. Practice for the purpose. In business circles, the term strategic thinking is thrown around with abandon. It's a very general term that really only takes on meaning when applied to a specific situation. Strategic thinking in a marketing context is not the same as strategic thinking in a financing context. As a general proposition, the term is vague at best. As a specific application, it can be indispensable. Much the same is true of practice. Practicing to become faster has benefits, no doubt, but those benefits may not apply to every situation. Being fast in football is not necessarily the same as being fast at a track meet. In football, the application of fast likely includes knowing how to make sharp cuts while running, following routes, or avoiding being tackled. For a track runner, those skills are meaningless. Practicing for the purpose takes the best of general applicable skills and combines them with specific applications. Without the application, your preparation isn't even halfway complete. The caveat to remember is that it is also possible to over-specialize in which case your brain will strain to apply your learning to new situations. 11. Finish what you start. This suggestion is one in which leveraging a tendency of a happy brain works in our favor. Incompleteness represents instability to our brain. A basic illustration of this is the open circle experiment. Draw a circle on a piece of paper, but leave a small gap such that the circle is not all the way closed. Now stare at it for a couple minutes and notice what happens. Your brain wants to close the circle. For some people, the urge to close it is so strong that they'll eventually pick up the pencil and draw it closed. The same dynamic can be applied to stop procrastination from burning you. The trick is simply to start whatever project is in front of you. Just start anywhere. Psychologists call this the Zygnarik effect, named for the Russian psychologist who first documented the finding that when someone is faced with an overwhelming goal and is procrastinating as a result, getting started anywhere will launch motivation to finish what was started. When you start a project, even if you begin with the smallest, simplest part, you begin drawing the circle. Then move on to another part, draw more of the circle, and another, more circle, and so forth. The one prerequisite for the Zygnarik effect working is that you are motivated to complete the project in the first place. 12. Ask. Don't tell yourself. Self-motivation isn't easy, but a few subtle tweaks can make it easier and more productive. Psychology research suggests that asking yourself if you can accomplish a goal is more effective than telling yourself you will. You'll recall the comparison between the little engine that could telling himself, I think I can, I think I can, and Bob the Builder, whose mantra is, can we fix it? Yes, we can. As it turns out, Bob's approach is more productive from a motivational standpoint. 13. Form useful habits. Psychology research tells us that the average amount of time necessary to reach maximum automaticity a jargony term for habit, is 66 days. But when you are trying to develop a healthy habit, it's likely that it will take at least 80 days for it to become automatic. The more complex the habit, the longer it takes to form. An exercise regimen, for example, will take most people at least one and a half times longer than more basic endeavors like changing eating or drinking habits, which still take a long time. You can afford to miss a day here or there, but the more cumulative days you miss, the more habit formation is disrupted. The crucial point to remember is that creating useful habits is as important as discontinuing bad ones and worth the effort. 14. How you want others to see you changes your first impression. We discussed in Chapter 9 that our brains interpret first impressions as value propositions. In addition, we are prone to judging the first impression someone gives us by the standard we've set for ourselves. So if we want to come across as gregarious and fun-loving, 
We are also evaluating others by that measure. If they fall short, it may be because they aren't measuring up to an artificially high standard. But what if we don't have a particular impression in mind when meeting someone new? The research suggests that we are still making a value assessment. And in part, this assessment is about trust. From the get-go, our brain is making calculations as to whether the person in front of us can deliver on a trust exchange or if something isn't quite adding up. 15. Try to remember, your memory just might be wrong. Memory is not a recording, it's a reconstruction. We are prone to confabulate pieces of actual memory with other information, and a happy brain assembles the parts into something we can easily mistake for flawless recollection. Most of us will not realize that our memory of an event lacks information that has been supplemented by our brains from other sources. This has huge implications for eyewitness testimony, and for you when you are arguing with your spouse about something you claim to remember perfectly. Better to swallow the fact now that perfect memory shares the same handicap of everything that is perfect. It isn't. 16. Habituation happens. It's a cruel fact of human existence that with enough time, we can become bored with just about anything. Whether it's a new car or a new dog, a great Indian dish or a great song, eventually the initial pleasure fades into something more mundane, which doesn't necessarily mean we come to dislike the thing in question but rather that we habituate to its once tantalizing allure and simply enjoy it less. Even sex, gasp, isn't immune. The challenge we face is overcoming variety amnesia, our tendency to forget that we've been exposed to a variety of great things, be they people, food, music, movies, home furnishings, or other, and instead focus our attention on the singular thing that no longer gives us the tingles. To shake ourselves free from this negative trap, We must dishabituate by forcing ourselves to remember the variety of things we've experienced. For example, let's say that you've become bored with a particular musical group that you once couldn't listen to enough. Research suggests that what you need to do is recall the variety of other songs from other musical groups that you've listened to since the last time you listened to your once favorite band. And by doing so, you'll revive appreciation for your fave. Psychology researchers call this little head trick a simulation of virtual variety which reduces satiation, the lessening of satisfaction over time, in a way similar to that of experiencing actual variety. 17. Imagine eating the treat to short-circuit food temptations. If you imagine looking at a tempting treat, your desire for it will increase. But research indicates that if you imagine eating the same treat, your desire will lessen. The reason is that to our brains, imagining an action and doing it are not too dissimilar. We can trick ourselves into feeling like we've already enjoyed the treat, leaving our brain with less reason to target the genuine article. 18. Empathy isn't blind. Remember the yawning chimps from Chapter 11? The gist of that research is simply that we empathize much more with those familiar to us, and this familiarity bias is demonstrated in something as basic as contagious yawning. It's also evidenced by contagious laughing and crying, among other behaviors. Our ability to empathize with others is an important one. But if you notice, it's far easier to empathize with someone you know than with a stranger. The reason is that our brains evolved to socially relate to a relatively small group. Some specialists in this area put that number at roughly 150 members. Beyond that, we draw more distinct lines and are selective about investing emotional energy. Unfortunately, this same tendency can make us callous to the plight of those who need help in other parts of the country and around the world. 19. Practice Metacognition Metacognition simply means thinking about thinking, and is one of the main distinctions between the human brain and that of other species. Our ability to stand high in a ladder above our normal thinking processes and evaluate why we are thinking as we are thinking is an evolutionary marvel. We have this ability because the most recently developed part of the human brain, the prefrontal cortex, enables self-reflective, abstract thought. We can think about ourselves as if we are not part of ourselves. Research on primate behavior indicates that even our closest cousins, the chimpanzees, lack this ability, although they possess some self-reflective abilities, like being able to identify themselves in a mirror instead of thinking the reflection is another chimp. The ability is a double-edged sword, because while it allows us to evaluate why we are thinking what we are thinking, it also puts us in touch with difficult existential questions that can easily become obsessions. For the purpose of this book, it is important to recognize metacognition as an essential part of nearly everything we have discussed. 20. Don't always trust common sense. The term common sense can be applied to just about anything you think is obvious, or at least should be to anyone with half a brain. 
The problem with this usage is that many things that initially seem obvious are not. The tip of the iceberg effect. Moreover, often when someone says that XYZ is just common sense, he either doesn't fully understand XYZ and its implications, or would prefer that you don't ask too many questions. In other words, it can be a diversionary tactic. After all, who wants to be the person who questions that which should be common sense? My advice? Be that person. 21. Not all contagions are physical. In our discussion of psychosocial contagions in Chapter 9, we reviewed a handful of well-researched contagions such as anxiety, blame, and happiness. Clearly, there are good and bad aspects of catching or transmitting psychosocial contagions. Most people I know wouldn't mind catching a little more happiness. The important point to remember is that awareness of the influence can prevent negative outcomes, particularly where fear, anxiety, blame, and anger are concerned. In a group setting, it is all too easy to be pulled into the viral spread of emotions that can, if left unchecked, lead to catastrophe. Consider retail store stampedes during the holidays, for example, that often result in people being trampled to death, or mob scenes at sporting events and concerts. These are all examples of psychosocial contagions gone awry, and anything we can do to halt their spread is worthwhile. 22. Feeling right is not the same as being right. One of the foibles we discussed in Chapter 1 has to do with how certainty feels. A happy brain interprets uncertainty as a threat and wants us to get back to right. But what we often overlook is that what we are really trying to recover is the feeling of being right because it is the emotional response to rightness that shuts off the alarms and puts us at ease. It's easy to confuse this feeling with the real thing, and all of us are culpable. The truth, however, is that the evidence may not align with the source of your certainty, and that's a difficult realization for any of us to acknowledge. 23. Know when to engage heuristic override. Heuristics are simple, efficient rules, either hardwired in our brains or learned, that kick in on occasion, especially when we're facing problems with incomplete information. Happy brains like heuristics because they stifle uncertainty. They can be advantageous tools, but they can also be misleading handicaps. For example, when we are trying to decide which route to take on a trip and have several options to pick from, it is beneficial to rely on a simple heuristic guideline that says, the most direct route with the shortest distance is usually best. But when we are struggling to determine whether to tell a friend that he is acting recklessly and know we are risking the friendship, or just try to support him through a rough time and possibly preserve the friendship, there is no basic heuristic that will illuminate the way. The decision is case-specific, and the choices both have pros and cons that must be weighed against each other, and even then the decision will be difficult. Our challenge is to know when heuristics are useful and when they are not, and when they will actually make a situation worse. If we can't use them to aid in the decision, it's time to engage heuristic override and move on to the tough work of struggling with ambiguity. 24. We are compelled to connect. The human brain evolved to identify patterns by connecting pieces of information in our environment. While this hardwired habit has been vital to our survival and generally serves us well, it also leads us to make something out of nothing. We routinely make connections between chance events and assign meaning to randomness. These are not tendencies we can simply discontinue, but becoming aware of our compulsion to connect puts us in a better position to check ourselves when our pattern-finding penchant goes over the top. This is no trivial issue. People spend enormous time and money investing themselves in complex belief systems built on little more than coincidental toothpicks. The key is to value our brain's remarkable capacity for pattern detection while exercising vigilance about how we apply this ability in our lives. 25. We crave agency. Seeking agency, as we discussed in Chapter 2, refers to our desire for a responsible party for the good and bad events we and others experience. If something horrible happens and there is no apparent agent behind it, our brain will search one out regardless. Statements like, everything happens for a reason, imply agency, because presumably someone or something has preordained the reason. More direct positions such as, this is part of God's plan, tag a divine personal agent as the cause, even if the rationale for why that agent would want such a thing to happen is inexplicable. One of the hardest things for us to accept is that many things happen without any form of agency. The thought of this alone is enough to put the happy brain on guard because it opens the door to uncertainty. 26. Doing anything at all is a goal in itself. We tend to think of goals as being specific, but research suggests that a broader goal of simply staying busy also inspires us. 
What this boils down to is that doing something is better than doing nothing, all else being equal. The something can be anything, no matter how trivial it seems to others. This finding echoes a quote from Mahatma Gandhi, Whatever you do will be insignificant, but it is very important that you do it. 27. We are not very good emotional forecasters. When we try to place ourselves in a future situation that is more emotionally charged than the one we are in now, we fall prey to intensity bias, a skewing of perspective that leads us to believe we can forecast how we would react under emotionally charged conditions. This is why it's very easy to say, if I had been in that situation, I would have. But unless we have been in the same or a similar situation before, we really have no credible basis for knowing how we would react. 28. Faster feedback is jet fuel for performance. Fear of disappointment is a powerful motivator. Combined with the fact that we are less prone to worry about outcomes in the distance, the timing of feedback becomes an important element in the motivational mix. When feedback is out in the distance, it feels less relevant and therefore less deserving of a happy brain's attention. But when feedback is immediate, we focus our attention on what's coming around the corner and consequently put more energy into our performance. 29. Our lie detection skills are on par with rolling dice. Dr. Paul Ekman has dedicated his career to understanding the verbal and nonverbal clues people give when lying and how effective we are in identifying liars. His conclusion is that most of us may as well just guess if someone is lying, because even when we try in earnest to identify liars, we do no better than chance. It's alarming to realize just how bad we are at catching liars, and it's equally alarming to know that trying to be empathetic can make us even worse lie detectors. Research suggests that mimicking another's behavior, one component of empathy, makes you even more susceptible to deception than you were already. That doesn't mean we should not be empathetic, but we should be careful about being too empathetic too quickly. 30. Make checklists and use them. Since memory is, as we discussed, more fallible than most of us realize, it helps to have memory props on hand to help out. Checklists are a simple but effective tool to keep holes in memory from wrecking your day or your life. You can read any number of books about using lists as part of a time management system. But my point in the audiobook you're listening to right now is simply that no matter what system you use, the basic principle of the list remains the same, to keep you from falling prey to the imperfection of memory. Make them and use them. 31. Counterfactual thinking is a dangerously valuable skill. All of us have a tendency to look back on a decision and think, if only I had chosen differently, I'd be better off now. We come to this determination by imagining that the facts of the decision could have been different than they really were. For example, you might think, if I had taken the job in New York five years ago, then I would have been able to network more effectively and my career would be more fulfilling now. Perhaps that statement is 100% accurate. Well, more likely, it's partly accurate and partly a fabrication. It lacks consideration of all the variables you had to consider at the time and the fact that you spent days digesting those variables to come up with an answer. The fact is, with the information you had, you decided not to take the job in New York, and the decision can't be reversed. We think counterfactually for a very good reason. Namely, it allows us to learn from our missteps and make better choices in the future. This is a deeply embedded survival skill of the happy brain, and we should feel fortunate that it is. But when this skill is misapplied and we start dwelling on counterfactual comparisons, the result is not going to be pleasant, ranging from generally dark emotions to serious depression. Our challenge is to know when to throw the red flag and stop ourselves before the dwelling begins. 32. Repetition is the mother of persuasion. Every election year, I dread the onslaught of political advertisements. I try my best to avoid them and can't wait until the end. But the one thing I do pay attention to is whether or not the messages repeated the most become major factors in the election. They almost always do. Does it matter if what one candidate is saying about the other is factual? Sometimes, but generally it does not. What matters most is that the message has been repeated enough to color public perception. And the really interesting part is that the public doesn't even have to be paying much attention. In fact, the less attention we invest in deciphering a message, the more likely we are to believe it. The more we focus on the message and deconstruct it, the more likely we are to be skeptical. More of the latter approach is desperately needed. 33. Metaphor is powerful medicine. Seasoned speechwriters know that the best way to convey a message is with metaphors the audience can grab and understand with little effort. Metaphors can make multifaceted concepts seem simple and vague ideas seem relevant. 
With very few words, they can change the way we think about difficult topics. Research suggests that when metaphors are used to frame a discussion, like whether crime should be viewed as a beast or a virus, referring back to chapter 10, the rest of the discussion will be viewed through the lens of the metaphor. Being mindful of how metaphors are used in what we read and hear puts us in a better position to evaluate what's really being said or not being said. 34. Your brain is not only in your head. The theory of embodied cognition, that our bodies are active participants in cognition, has been steadily gaining momentum. Research continues to show that the mind is influenced by the weight, size, texture, taste, temperature, and other attributes of physical objects. Experiencing weight in a physical sense, for example, influences our perception of weightiness in a perceptual sense. What this means is that influences on our thinking surround us all the time and we don't realize it. Though exactly why this happens is still not entirely clear. What is clear is that the mind, what our nervous system does, is never fully isolated from the world around us. Rather, it is constantly interacting with the environment, and this interaction is integral to how we think. 35. You don't know what you don't know. Obvious as this may sound, in practice, it's not so obvious at all. It's tempting to think that we can jump right into an occupation and perform just as competently as anyone else. Perhaps the others have been practicing their trade for years. But still we think, why waste all that time when I can just start doing it? The reason underlying this thinking is that we don't know what we don't know. Practice and experience aren't just preparation. They are part of a process of discovering what you could not possibly know as an outsider to whatever trade or profession you hope to become competent in. The phrase, taking your knocks, is a rough but accurate way to describe the process. 36. Cognitive fluency enables learning, but also propagandizing. When information is presented to us in an accessible, easy-to-digest way, our brain experiences fewer obstacles to processing it, even if the content is complex. Another way to say the same thing is that the more cognitive fluency information has, the easier it will find a home in our mind. Cognitive fluency is crucial to learning at all stages of life, but the same quality that makes it so important for learning also makes it a potent tool for persuaders of every sort, from advertisers to propagandists. The trick is to package the information in such a way that it links up with existing knowledge structures in your brain, a.k.a. schemata, referring back to Chapter 1. 37. Moral self-regulation is a seesaw performance. Life is a balancing act, and so is our sense of morality. Research suggests that when we view ourselves as morally deficient in one part of our lives, we search for moral actions that will balance out the scale. Maybe you know you should be recycling, but just never got around to gathering up your glass, paper, and plastics in time for the recycling truck. One day you happen to be walking through a hardware store and notice a rack of energy-efficient light bulbs, and you instantly decide to buy 20 of them and change out every bulb in your house. The moral deficiency, not recycling, is, in your view, balanced by a moral action installing energy-efficient bulbs. The problem is that the seesaw can also tip the other way. If we believe we are doing enough, morally speaking, then there's little reason to do more. The scale is already level. 38. To your brain, belief judgments look the same. The brain evolved, as we've noted a few times throughout this audiobook, to make sense of our environment and give us a better chance of surviving. Many of the applications of these broad adaptive skills seem to us very specific. The survival example I started this chapter with is a basic illustration. But research indicates that the brain does not distinguish between many of the things that seem obviously distinct. The brain's reward system does not distinguish between what we in moral parlance would call good and bad rewards. It responds to rewards the same way despite our moral positions. This is also true of belief judgments. Whether belief in the results of basic arithmetic or belief in God, the brain engages the judgment the same way. Our day-to-day -day experience of the belief, of course, is much different depending on the subject. But that is a function of the meaning we assign to beliefs, not of the beliefs themselves. 39. Make peace with probability. Whether we think someone has good luck or bad luck, in the end, all so-called luck comes down to probability. It's tempting to interpret the outcomes of probability in such a way that it seems something was meant to happen. But the truth is that winning the lottery or taking a direct hit from a hurricane are statistically explainable events, regardless of how pleasant or horrific they are to experience. This is tough to accept, particularly for the human brain that craves certainty. Knowing that probability underlies everything we do does not necessarily make the outcomes any easier to swallow. 
but there is satisfaction in accepting the truth as it is without a veneer of mystification. 40. Avoid the conjunction fallacy. Leah prepares meals and runs the kitchen at a high-end restaurant, and she also cares a great deal about women's issues. Which of the following statement about Leah is truer? 1. Leah is a chef. Or 2. Leah is a chef and a feminist. If you chose 2, ask yourself why. The reason is probably that someone who cares a great deal about women's issues is likely a feminist. But the only thing we really know for sure about Leah is that she prepares meals and runs the kitchen at a high-end restaurant, which means she is a chef. Although it's possible that she is also a feminist, we do not know that for certain. Therefore, the truer of the two options is one. Option two, which includes one, is a conjunct of one, which simply means that it overlaps one. Leah is a chef in both answers. When we think that a conjunct of a statement is truer than the statement itself, logicians say we have committed a conjunction fallacy. Logically speaking, a conjunct of a true statement can never be truer than the statement, even if it adds information that we think could potentially also be true. 41. Think twice before accepting nominal value. Our brain is easily tricked into focusing on nominal value, or what we could call face value, and ignoring actual value. Nobel Award-winning psychologist Daniel Kahneman calls this susceptibility to focus on face value the money illusion. If, for example, you are given a 2% raise in salary, but the rate of inflation has increased by 4%, you are actually in the hole by 2%. But that isn't how most of us see it. Instead, we focus on the dollar equivalent of a 2% raise, not the fact that the dollar amount is significantly less than the increase in cost of living. While it may be difficult or impossible to change the amount of your raise, it's a good idea to keep the face value versus real value lesson in mind whenever you are evaluating value particularly when someone is trying to convince you that the face value tells the whole story. 42. Doubt your Thomas. The human oxytocin-mediated attachment system, Thomas, is a powerful brain circuit that releases the neurochemical oxytocin when we are trusted and induces a desire to reciprocate the trust we have been shown, even with strangers. Having a healthy Thomas is good, because without it, we would find it difficult to extend trust to others. But it's also a handicap because the same system that enables trust makes us marks for con artists and criminals. Research indicates that about 2% of people are unconditional non-reciprocators. When trusted, they do not reciprocate with trustworthy actions. E.g., you trust someone enough to lend her money and she never returns it. What this means is that you will encounter people in your life who are good at engendering trust for the purpose of taking advantage of you. Your Thomas isn't always wrong, of course but it is wise to exercise vigilance just in case. 43. You might lose your cool, but don't lose perspective. Loss aversion, or simply fear of loss, is a basic part of being human. To the brain, loss is a threat, and we naturally take measures to avoid it. We cannot, however, avoid it indefinitely. One way to face loss is with the perspective of a stock trader. Traders accept the possibility of loss as part of the game, not the end of the game. What guides this thinking is a portfolio approach. Wins and losses will both happen, but it's the overall portfolio of outcomes that matters most. When you embrace a portfolio approach, you will be less inclined to dwell on individual losses because you know that they are small parts of a much bigger picture. 44. Be on the lookout for regret manipulation. In Chapter 8, we discussed how regret is sometimes used to manipulate decisions. If someone wants you to do A but you are more inclined to do B, then his job is to make you believe that doing B instead of A will result in regret. It's accurate to describe this argument as a manipulation of pre-regret, because you have not done anything yet to regret. The regret scenario is being painted for you as a worst possible outcome that you can avoid, if you choose, by making the right decision. At times, someone making you aware of impending regret is a good thing. If your friend is about to drive her car while drunk, you are doing her and others a great service by making her aware of what could happen and why the right decision is to give you the keys. And if she doesn't anyway, please take them. But when a salesperson at an electronics store is trying to sell you a product insurance plan by telling you how much you'll eventually regret not buying it, that's a manipulation. 45. Remember how chimps and children overcome impulsivity. Sometimes being impulsive is fine. Other times it leads to trouble. Chimps and human kids, we saw in Chapter 7, use a similar technique for overcoming impulsivity in the interest of getting a bigger reward later. 
By distracting themselves with toys, they're able to delay gratification longer and enjoy more candy than they would get if they took the first opportunity to grab it. Simple as that sounds, it's really a not-so-simple problem-solving strategy that human adults struggle with daily. But perhaps remembering that even a chimp can do it is inspiration enough to keep trying. 46. Words Direct Perception Here's an experiment to try out. Find a black marker in two paper bags. On one bag, write the word roses. On the other, write the words chili peppers. Now put rose petals into each of the bags and close them up. Find a few people willing to lend their sniffing power to your cause and ask them to sniff each bag, making sure that they can read the labels but not see the contents of the bags. Then, ask them to report on what they smell in each bag. That's a basic recreation of a study that investigated whether the name of an object will affect what it smells like to the participant. In the study, most people mistook the rose petals in the second bag as chili peppers, even though the contents of the bags were identical. 47. Modeling is as human as breathing. As discussed in Chapter 14, each of us is a born imitator. Our brains are tuned to observe and recreate what we see in others, and this, like all habits of a happy brain, is both good and bad. On the upside, imitation plays a crucial role in learning. The downside is that imitation can spill over healthy boundaries and do us and others a world of harm. Two lessons come to mind. First, be careful about whose modeling is influencing you. Your brain has a difficult time distinguishing between good and bad lessons and will learn them with equal efficiency. Second, be careful about how you model for others. If you are a parent or guardian to young children, this lesson is especially important because kids' aptitude for imitation is exceptionally strong. Even when you think they aren't paying attention, you may be unknowingly modeling a behavior for them that you'll later regret. 48. Loneliness and conflict are partners in the human brain. As we discussed in Chapter 5, neuroscience research has found a convincing neural correlation between the experience of loneliness and an attraction to human conflict. Loneliness, by this definition, has nothing to do with how many people are physically nearby and everything to do with feeling socially isolated. This research lends credence to the saying, misery loves company, because people who feel socially isolated may be predisposed to seek out conflict. Everyone who has worked in an office with other people can relate to the finding. 49. Escapism is not magic. While it is true that certain forms of escapism have an inherently compulsive quality, it's also true that plenty of people play video games, role-playing games, and participate in an endless list of other diversions without ever dancing too close to the compulsion pathway. Escapist diversions do not wield addictive magic over their patrons any more than mindless television makes their viewers stupid. Caution is warranted because we know that some people are more prone to compulsive behavior than others. And when they bring those tendencies to an immersive role-playing game, for instance, we shouldn't be surprised when two weeks later they're spending 10 hours a day playing it. The line between enjoyable diversion and compulsive behavior can be very thin and gray for some, yet well-defined for others. We simply do not know how many people fall into the predisposed to compulsive behavior category. So as we move into an ever more saturated era of intense, immersive e-media, it's worth thinking about possible outcomes without veering into alarmism. 50. Work in layers. If you must attempt to multitask, try at least to strategically layer your work such that you are not pairing two resource-intensive things at the same time. For example, trying to reply to an email on your smartphone while driving is an exceedingly bad idea. Both tasks require too much mental energy, and it is impossible to evenly parse attention between them. If you are speaking to someone on the phone while not driving, it may be possible to do something at the same time, like scan a magazine article, because in most cases, these tasks will not overpower each other. If you are attempting to truly concentrate on an article or book, then the situation changes and you are again imbalanced. Better yet, avoid multitasking altogether and instead try shift tasking, which means that you work through one task and then shift attention to another and then shift back after a while or to something else altogether, like a train switching tracks. Arguably. This is still not an especially efficient way to complete projects, but the pace of our lives seldom allows for blocks of uninterrupted time to get things done. Shifting between competing priorities may be the best we can manage until a rare windfall of time becomes available. Chapter 16. Shake Your Meaning Maker Our obligation is to give meaning to life, and in doing so, to overcome the passive, indifferent life. L.E. Wiesel 
essay on indifference. You will never be happy if you continue to search for what happiness consists of. You will never live if you are looking for the meaning of life. Albert Camus, Youthful Writings. In closing, I have three thoughts I would like to leave you with, albeit delivered somewhat indirectly. Stop horsing around. In a lesser-known section of Jonathan Swift's iconic tale, Gulliver's Travels, Lemuel Gulliver encounters a race of beings resembling strikingly handsome horses. The Winhams, a name meaning perfection of nature, are quintessentially rational, refined, and intelligent. And to Gulliver's beleaguered eyes, they are perfect. He views them in stark contrast to the Yahoos, a race of human-like creatures ruled by the Winhams that are emotional, dirty, and stupid. Later, when Gulliver returns to live among humans, he can't help but see those around him as merely yahoos with slightly higher social standards. He never recovers from the despair that this comparison brings, and he spends most of his time talking to the horses in his stable. If perfection were attainable and a minority of humans finally achieved it, then, like Gulliver, most of us would compare ourselves to those models of perfection and despair that we fall short. Our deficiencies and flaws would become glaring symbols of our imperfection. Most of those around us, the other imperfects, would seem faulty as well. Though with time, the imperfect strata of society might coalesce. Eventually, we would convince ourselves that the very fact that some humans have attained perfection means that many of us, given enough time and effort, can do so too. Because the factors that differentiate perfection from imperfection would be identifiable and correctable. Soon people would write books identifying the problems that must be corrected for one to become perfect and offer systems for doing exactly that. If you follow the formula, then you will be able to leave the common strata of imperfects and join the ranks of the perfect minority. I have a feeling that the sardonic Mr. Swift had something like this scenario in mind when he cast Gulliver into depression over humanity's flaws. We, of course, do not have any models of perfection to observe and compare ourselves to. But that doesn't stop us from comparing ourselves to an imagined ideal of perfection. An enormous portion of the media and entertainment industry is devoted to fostering this comparison and selling products to bridge the chasm between us imperfects and the flawless ideal. The number of systems for becoming the perfect you are legion. You only have to stroll through a bookstore or an e-book store online to find more of them than you'll care to count. Unfortunately for us, our brains are susceptible to these messages. That's frustrating. But because we are susceptible doesn't mean we have to fall for it. Our brain is the most advanced, imperfect wonder of nature on the planet, and perfection to any degree is not on the evolutionary docket. Better that we come to terms with our shortcomings, both hardwired and learned, and dance the awareness action two-step to live more fulfilled lives. Meaning, you ask? Typing the phrase meaning of life into Google turns up 6.1 million results. At least that's the number as I read this. It's clearly a topic we think about quite a lot. If you scour through the list, most of the pages have something to say about finding the meaning of life. A great deal of these pages have a spiritual flavor, and nearly an equal amount offer guidelines and formulas for finding the grail of meaning. A smaller number, though still significant, are dark meanderings about the meaninglessness of existence. I doubt there was ever a point in human history when meaning was not thought of as something to be found. We are the only existential animal the only being on this planet with a mind able to look upon itself and ask, why? If the answer to the question of meaning cannot be found within, we will search outside ourselves, and we have been doing just that for the larger part of our relatively short stay on Earth. The irony is that our brains evolved to make sense of our world, and they're rather good at meeting that challenge, but they routinely fail at making sense of us. I would argue, alongside Weisel and Camus, that the real problem is the question itself. Asking where meaning can be found is a diversion from the real challenge we humans face every day, to make meaning of our lives. This is a challenge only an existential animal can take on. It is our burden alone to answer questions about our world that go well beyond instinctual reaction and rudimentary learning. This is perhaps the greatest distinguishing feature of our minds, to make meaning of our experience and live out that meaning. Another way to state that last point is simply that this tremendous capacity for making meaning of our lives unrivaled in the natural world, guides our behavior. Cognito finito. Wrestling with the stubborn tendencies of the happy brain is at times frustrating, exhausting, and even infuriating. We often find ourselves thinking and acting in ways that do not serve our best interests, though exactly what those interests are is rarely clear in the moment. We are subject to an array of seen and unseen influences, 
And in our more desperate moments, it may seem as though our brains are conspiring with these influences against us. Living is, after all, messy business. And more often than not, it is ambiguity rather than clarity filling our mind space. The final word, however, is still ours. We are the meaning makers, enabled by a brain more advanced than anything else on the planet, a brain that has brought us quite far and will continue to push us forward. I hope this audiobook has provided you with a few more clues and suggestions for understanding that incredible organ and for making meaning in your life. That concludes the audiobook. Thank you for listening.